Prologue 23 Elint, The Year of Lightning Storms, 1374 DR Errol could not contain a smile. Five good skipping rocks filled his pocket, and a pouch of squirming bowl slugs hung at his belt. And there was no better bait for catching green gills than bowl slugs, especially fat bowl slugs like the ones he'd just caught. When the sun rose, he and Mother would take the path to Still Lake. Errol would skip some rocks, and they would catch a few fish, always a welcome addition to the supper table. It would be the best name day ever. Errol only wished Mother would have let Nem come along, too. Mother walked beside him, slowly, to accommodate Errol's awkward gait. As always, her right arm hovered near his back. "'I won't fall, Mother,' he said. She was always afraid he would stumble or fall, but he never did. He was awkward on his club foot, but not clumsy. "'Of course not, sweet dew.' Her arm dropped for three strides before drifting back to its usual position. A yawn snuck up on Errol. He had not been awake so long after moonrise in a long while. Sleepy? Mother asked him. Errol was sleepy, but did not want to say so to Mother. He did not want her to think him a wee. No, Mother, he fibbed. He turned his head as another yawn tried to betray him. Well, you should tell your yawns that, then, or they'll soon have your mouth filled with mosquitoes. And I know how much you like that. Errol winced, in part because Mother had caught him in the fib, and in part out of disgust. He knew exactly what a mouthful of insects tasted like. Once on a dare from Nem, he had run through a cloud of gnats with his mouth open. He'd spent a good long time gagging and spitting out gnat fragments, Nem had nearly split his sides laughing. Thinking back on it caused Errol to giggle. Mother smiled, too. Then a thought occurred to him. Hey, how did you know about that? She looked down at him and winked. Mothers know everything, Errol. How do you think I knew where to look for bowl slugs in the middle of the night? Errol frowned, his mind racing. She could not know everything, could she? What if she knew about Matron Olam's pie, or that time he and Nem had hidden in the peddler's wagon and ridden halfway to Ashford? He decided he should tell her the truth from then on, to be safe. Maybe I am a little sleepy, he acknowledged, but only a little. Mother smiled and tousled his hair. There's a good boy. Maybe you can sleep late tomorrow, before we go to the lake. Do you mean it, Mother? The next day was the last of the ten-day, and even though it was a day of rest in the village, Mother never let Errol sleep late. Usually she took him to hear hearthmistress Millam give a sermon about Yondala, and the hearthmistress said the same thing every time. The harvest would be better next year, the drought and wild weather could not last, the dragons had all gone back to sleep. Millam's voice always made Errol drowsy. It's your name day. Mother said, so if you like, you can sleep in. He knew what she wanted him to say, so he said it, though without much enthusiasm. No, Mother, we should go to Temple and hear the hearth mistress. We can go to the lake after that. Mother smiled and took his hand in hers. He did not resist. He still liked holding Mother's hand when they walked. If his friends had seen it, they would have laughed and called him a wee. But his friends were not around. It was just him, mother, the old wood, and the night. A full cellune floated in the sky, but her light fought its way through the forest canopy with difficulty. Errol was not usually afraid of the dark, but night in the tangled old wood was a little scary. He knew it was safe, though. Halflings had been hunting game and chopping timber in the old wood for generations. Look, mother. He grabbed her cloak and pointed up through an opening in the trees. A shooting star chased a glowing path across the sky. He watched it until it faded to a pale scar, then vanished. Did you see it? I saw it, Errol, Mother said, and she offered a brief prayer to Yondala. Errol remembered the previous autumn, the night that the whole rain of flaming stars had streaked from the sky. 
He'd heard from a peddler that the falling fire had destroyed villages and burned down forests and caused destructive waves and made the drought, but he doubted it. They had been beautiful, too. He wished with all his heart that he could find a piece of one of those falling stars. He imagined they were probably orange or maybe red, and carried around in his pocket with his skipping stones. But none of them had struck near his home. If one had, he and Nem could have found it and taken it out to look at it any time they wanted. That would have been wonderful, and Jace would have been so jealous. Thinking of his friends, Errol decided to ask Mother just one more time if Nem could accompany them to the lake on the morrow. He held his tongue for a time, thinking to wait for just the right moment. They picked their way through the trees and brush in silence. Quiet shrouded the wood. Even the insects were sleeping. Errol could hear himself breathing. He and his mother moved lightly through the undergrowth. Quiet and light was the halfling way, his mother always said. Errol could have sneaked up and touched the three brown hairs he saw nibbling on foliage near the base of a pine. He was hardly quick and graceful on his club foot, but he was quiet. Fighting another yawn, he suddenly longed for his bed. He asked, How much farther to the village, mother? Not far, Errol. The edge of the forest is just ahead. Errol was glad of it. He decided that time was right to ask about Nem. He clasped his mother's hand a bit more tightly and adopted his wee voice, the one that usually got him what he wanted. Mother, she looked down at him. May Nem? A sound from ahead of them rushed through the trees and bit off the rest of his words. As one, he and his mother crouched in the undergrowth and froze. Errol was glad they had relied on only the moon for light. What was that? Errol whispered. It sounded like a growl, but unlike any growl Errol had heard before. His heart beat fast. He reached into his pocket and clutched a skipping stone in his fist. Mother's grip on his hand tightened, and she shushed him. The sound had come from the forest's edge, from the direction of the village. Mother stared into the trees, her head cocked, worry lines creasing her forehead. She caught Errol looking at her and forced an insincere smile. Errol opened his mouth to speak, but she shook her head and put a finger to her lips for silence. That made him more nervous, but he held his tongue and nodded. They stood as still as shrubs. Time passed slowly, but when the sound did not repeat... Mother's grip on his hand loosened. She visibly relaxed. Errol took a sweaty hand from his skipping rock and let out a breath. He pulled Mother down by her cloak to his level, leaned in close and whispered, What made that sound, Mother? He imagined in his mind a passing bear or maybe a wolf. Two months earlier, a bear had killed Matron Isel and her dog. Errol had not seen her body, but he had heard enough from Nem that for a ten-day he'd had to sleep in Mother's bed with his feet touching hers. Sheriff Bowl said that the bear was just hungry, the same as the villagers, and that he would not return. I don't know, Sweet Dew, Mother answered. Let's be still for a bit longer to be sure it's gone. Errol nodded. An autumn wind rustled through the trees. Limbs rattled. Errol wished for the thousandth time that his father was still alive, that the red pox had never come to the village. Father would have come with them into the old wood. Father would have protected them from any old bear. He leaned against Mother. Her warmth and smell, like fresh bread, comforted him. She crouched and put her arms around him. A limb cracked sharply somewhere in the woods behind them. Both gave a start and looked about. Errol's heart raced anew. He saw nothing through the filtered moonlight but trees and undergrowth. Errol had heard that dwarves could see in the dark. He wished with all his might that halflings could. Mother was breathing fast, and Errol did not like it. He tried to swallow, but his mouth was dry. He clutched a handful of Mother's cloak and bit his lower lip. Another limb cracked behind them, in the dark. Mother put her mouth to Errol's ear. Quiet. We must hide. He nodded. He still saw nothing, but he knew something was out there. 
Mother was afraid. He could feel it. He started to shake, and Mother hugged him tighter. He was breathing as fast as she. It will be all right, Mother whispered to him, but he was not sure if she was really talking to him. She half stood out of the undergrowth and looked around the forest for a better hiding place. Errol wondered if maybe they should dash for the village or shout for help. Surely someone would hear them, maybe even Sheriff Bowl. Mama. He had not called her Mama since he was a wee, since father had died. Mama, shouldn't we? One of the village's dogs barked. Another joined in. Soon it sounded as if every dog in the village was barking. Errol looked to his mother for reassurance, but she was not looking at him. She was looking through the trees toward the village. A shout of alarm sounded, a man's voice, then another, and another. Before Errol could ask any questions, a woman's scream tore through the night. Errol did not recognize any of the voices, but he knew they were his neighbors, his friends. Growls answered the shouts. Lots of growls. Worse than before. They sounded like Errol's stomach after he ate too much rhubarb pie, only worse. A man's voice shouted for arms, and Errol thought it might have been Farmer Teal. There was fear in his voice, and the sound made Errol's skin turn goose flesh. Mother squeezed him so hard that he could hardly breathe. Errol's heart beat so fast it hurt his chest. His stomach fluttered. What's happening, Mama? We're staying right here, Errol, she whispered, no matter what. The growls turned to roars, and Mother paled. More shouts answered. The dogs barked themselves into a frenzy. Doors slammed. Wood cracked. Errol could not see it, but he knew the village was in tumult. What is it, Mama? What is it? I don't know, Errol. Cover your ears. Don't listen. But Errol could not help but listen, as the shouts turned more and more to screams. He heard a dog yelp in pain and go silent. A second dog did the same. A man screamed, then a woman. He thought he heard Sheriff Bull barking commands, and throughout all of it came the roars, the terrible roars. He buried his face in Mother's cloak. Mother picked him up, stood, and started back into the woods. Fear seized Errol. He did not want to go back into the woods. Where are we going? He said, too loud. From the trees behind them came another growl almost thoughtful. Saplings snapped, and the sounds came closer. Mother froze in her steps. Errol felt a tremor run through her body. Something was moving through the brush toward them, something big, snapping trees. No, she said, so low that she probably had not thought Errol would hear. Please, Yandala, not my boy, not my son. Terror rooted in Errol's chest. Whatever monsters were in the village, more of them were in the woods. He wrapped his legs around his mother's waist and buried his face in her neck. Tears filled his eyes. What do we do, Mama? He whispered through his tears. I want Papa. Where's Papa? The words made no sense, but they poured out anyway. We must hide, she said again, her voice a hiss. Yes, we will hide. She whirled a circle and fixed her eyes on a stand of pines near the edge of the forest off to the side of the village. A dead log lay near it, a good hiding place for them. Mother balanced his weight in her arms and ran. She sometimes struggled to carry him lately, but at the moment she bore him as easy as a babe. The creature behind them in the woods growled. Mother stumbled and Errol squealed in terror, but her grip on him never faltered. She kept her feet, crashing through low-hanging tree limbs and undergrowth, and fell to her knees under the pines near the log. They both turned to look behind them, breathing heavily. Errol saw nothing but trees and darkness. Perhaps the creature had not seen them. Another crash sounded from the trees, so loud that Errol thought the creature must not be more than a stone's throw away. More roars from the village. Errol covered his ears and squealed. Mother pried his hands away and pulled her mouth to his ear. She spoke in a whisper. I don't think it has seen us, Errol. Squeeze under the log and do not move like when you play hide-and-find with Nem. Her voice calmed him, and he nodded, though the screams from the village made him think of his friends. He was worried for Nem. With Mother's help, he hurriedly squirmed under the log. It was a tight fit, but the hills and hollows of the ground gave him space. The earth filled his nostrils with their loamy scent. Dry pine needles poked his flesh and made him itchy. 
Mother laid herself behind him like a pair of wooden spoons, sheltering him. She pulled armfuls of leaves and branches over them both. He could feel her breathing in his ear, feel her body trembling. He worried that she was not well hidden. Do not move, sweet dew, she whispered. No matter what happens, no matter what, not if you understand. He nodded and got a face full of pokey pine needles for his trouble. Mama loves you, Errol, more than anything. Papa did, too. Errol tilted his head to get a needle out of his ear and saw that a thin gap between the log and the ground offered a window through which he could see part of the village commons. He pressed his cheek into the ground so he could see better and wished immediately that he had not. His view was limited, but he caught a glimpse of long-limbed, lumbering creatures loping across the green, tearing at any halflings within reach. In the village torchlight, he saw flashes of claws, huge mouths full of teeth. He knew what they were, and the knowledge made him sick to his stomach. Trolls. There were trolls in the village, and there were more trolls behind them in the woods, hunting him and Mama. He knew what trolls did. He'd heard the stories. He knew they could smell as well as Farmer Teal's hounds. He and Mama would be caught. He knew they would be caught, and they would be eaten alive. Tears flowed anew, but Errol bore them in silence. He clenched his eyes shut and wished the horrible images away, but the sounds coming from the village, the screams, the roars, preyed on his imagination. He saw with his mind what he no longer saw with his eyes. Trolls killing and eating, claws and fangs dripping with the blood of friends and neighbors. He imagined Mama screaming. He heard a rush of motion behind them, the slow footfalls of something large prowling the undergrowth nearby. He heard heavy respiration. It was sniffing for them. A troll was sniffing for them. He felt Mother tense. Errol felt dizzy. His heart beat so hard and fast he thought it might jump out of his chest. His breath left him. He could not breathe. He could not breathe. Panicked, he squirmed and his body pressed against one of the branches Mother had used to cover him. It cracked. The troll near them went still. Mama's hand squeezed him. Both of them held their breath, more screams from the village, and a long, high-pitched wail of pain. Errol pressed his face into the dirt to muffle any more sounds, but that only made it harder to breathe. He wished so hard for his papa. He wished that he was one of the bull slugs so he could burrow into the ground under the tree where no troll could ever find him. He wished he could hide in the earth and never come out again. He promised Yondala that if she made him and Mama into worms, he would live in the ground and never bother anyone ever again. His mother gave him another squeeze. He felt her tears warming his ear. A limb broke right behind them. He heard sniffing, then a rumbling, curious grunt. The troll started tearing through the debris under the pines, and he knew with perfect clarity that he would die. Stay here, Mother whispered, and jumped to her feet. The troll roared. Errol immediately ignored her words and squirmed out from under the log. He stood, raining dirt and leaves and twigs. He was already on his feet before he thought about what he had done. Errol, no, Mother said, and he heard despair in her voice. A troll stood five paces from them. Though hunchbacked, it still looked as tall as a tree. Warty green skin with patches of coarse black hair wrapped a frame that looked to Errol to be composed solely of muscle, claws, and teeth. It looked at them and inhaled deeply, as if testing the air for their scent. It smiled, a mouthful of fangs, and a low rumble emerged from somewhere deep in its throat. Moonlight gleamed on the drool dripping from its lips. Errol wanted to scream, but no sound would come from his mouth. It just hung open, waiting to be filled by mosquitoes. He was frozen. The troll stared right at them. Its eyes were as black as the night. Mother held out her arms to shield Errol. Into the woods, Errol. Run. Run now. But Errol could not run. He could not move. The troll cocked its head at Mother's audacity. It flexed its claws and took a step toward them. Now, Errol, Mother ordered. She picked up a stick and brandished it at the troll. Here, creature. 
Errol was tempted to run, but only for a moment. He would not leave his mama. Papa would not leave her, and he was Papa's son. He grabbed a skipping stone from his pocket. The troll growled and took another step toward Mother. Errol hurled the stone and hit the troll squarely in the chest. It sounded like it had hit a log, and the huge creature barely flinched. Its eyes fixed on Errol, and it said something in a foul language and licked its lips. Mother exclaimed, No! Here, beast! She waved her makeshift club and tried to charge, but slipped and fell on her stomach. Errol did not think. He did what Papa would have done. He jumped in front of his prone mother, planted his club foot in the earth, and prepared to stand his ground. He took another stone from his pocket and prepared to throw. Leave us alone or I'll hit you again, he shouted. The troll bounded forward with terrifying speed, and Errol knew he had made a mistake. His arm went limp, his legs weakened, and the stone fell from his fist. He screamed in terror. Mother pulled him to the ground and threw herself over him. I love you, Errol. Errol hit the ground on his back and could not help but stare, eyes agog as the troll loomed over them. Claws, teeth, and a wall of green flesh filled his vision. The night grew darker. The troll stank like rancid meat. Sounds faded. Errol's vision blurred, and the darkness swirled. He was spinning. Spinning. The troll opened its mouth. The night clotted into a blackness deeper than pine pitch. The troll reached down for them, its claws as long as Errol's fingers. Shadows haloed the troll like black fire. The troll's mouth was so wide Errol thought it would swallow him whole. He saw its black tongue, its sharp teeth. He could not close his eyes. He wanted to, but he could not. A man appeared beside the troll, a dark man with a dark sword. Errol knew the man had come to carry him away to death. He realized that all of the hearth mistress's sermons had been a lie. Yondala had not come for him. There were no green fields. There was just a dark man with a dark sword. The troll took hold of Mother's arm and she screamed. The sword flashed and the troll lurched and released Mother. Errol screamed as the massive body of the creature fell to the ground. Fell to the ground. Fell to the ground. Errol blinked, confused. He stared wide-eyed at the body of the troll. This did not make sense. Wasn't he dead? Still lying atop him, Mother was crying racking sobs that shook her whole body. Black blood pumped from the stump of the troll's neck. Errol watched it soak the forest floor. The headless body still scrabbled at the ground near them, as though trying to reach them, or dig its own grave. Next to the body, the dark sword pierced the troll's severed head, pinning it to the forest floor. Pennons of shadow twirled around the blade. The troll's jaws gnashed futilely in an effort to reach the steel. Errol still did not understand. He blinked rapidly, unconvinced that he was seeing something real. He closed his eyes, held them shut, opened them. Everything remained as it was. Mother continued to cry. The troll continued to bleed. Errol forced his stare away from the troll's head. His gaze wandered up the blade of the sword to its hilt, then to the dusky shadow-enshrouded hand that held it and finally rested on the face of a tall, dark-haired human man. Errol met his eyes, and they flared yellow. Errol realized what had happened. The Shadow Man had saved them. Back away, the Shadow Man said in the halfling tongue, and he nodded at the twitching body of the troll. His voice was deep, and it scared Errol. Errol had never before met any big folk who spoke the language of halflings, but the shadow man did. Mother, still shaking and crying, was beginning to bleed from where the troll had grabbed her arm. She scooted backward and pulled Errol with her, away from the body of the troll. Blood soaked Errol's trousers, but it was the troll's blood. Or maybe Mama's. It was warm and sticky. He had not noticed it at first. Thank Yandala, Mother said through her tears. 
the words barely recognizable. Whoever you are, thank you, thank you. He's the shadow man, Errol tried to say, but the words did not come out. The shadow man did not answer mother, did not even look at her. He removed a small flask from his cloak and soaked the troll's body with the contents. Lamp oil, Errol knew the smell. The shadow man took a tinder twig, like the ones peddler sold in the village, from a belt pouch, ignited it on one of his boots, and tossed it on the troll. As flames engulfed the body, it thrashed in agony. The skewered head twitched and gnashed frenetically as the body burned. The shadow man held an open palm over the blaze. Darkness shrouded the fire and masked its light. At first, Errol did not understand why he did it. Then he remembered the other trolls. The shadow man did not want them to see the flames. The shadow man pulled his sword free to toss the troll's head into the fire. It gnashed as it burned. Then its eyes popped. The man, he was so tall, looked at Errol and Mother. Shadows wrapped him. Errol could not quite tell where the man ended and the night began. You're safe for now. I will do what I can for the village. He looked past them to Oakthorn, where screams, roars, and shouts of combat and slaughter continued. The shadows around his body alternately coiled and flared. You are the Shadow Man, Errol said, finally croaking the words out. The man regarded Errol with narrow eyes. The wind stirred his long hair. Mother drew Errol close. Thank you for saving us, good sir. Please help our folk. The Shadow Man ignored her. He had eyes only for Errol. What did you call me? His sword was as long as Errol was tall. Darkness poured from it like steam off the lake on winter mornings. He meant no offense, Mother said. Errol said, The Shadow Man. You don't like that name? That's what Nem said the peddler called you. Hunters have seen you, too, in the forest. Some say they spoke to you, but I thought it was all a tale. Nem said he heard you rode here on a shooting star. He said you came here to protect us because... Errol trailed off, suddenly nervous about continuing. He did not like the frown on the shadow man's face. The dark eyes, they weren't yellow anymore, bored into him. Because, the shadow man prompted. He meant no offense, good sir, mother said, her voice quavering. Please, leave us alone now. Errol summoned his courage and said, Nem said he heard you protect us because you had a friend who was a halfling and you could not protect him. The shadow man's face was frozen. Errol could not tell if he was angry or sad. The shadow man appeared next to him. Had he moved? Reaching to touch Errol's head, maybe to tossle his hair, but he stopped short. He studied Errol's face and said, Your friend has the right of it. My name is Erevis, Erevis Kale. He paused, then said, But I like Shadow Man, too. Mother audibly exhaled. The roars and shouts from the village drew the man's attention back to the slaughter. Without another word, he was gone. Errol twisted in his mother's grasp and looked about. He did not want to be left alone in the forest. He spotted the shadow man not far from them, crouching in the undergrowth, looking toward the village, and said the first thing that came to his mind. Tomorrow is my name day. Let the man go. Mother said to Errol, in the tone she usually reserved for telling him to do chores. He's going to help others. The shadow man turned so that Errol saw his face in profile. Darkness gathered around him. I do not want him to go, Errol blurted. I'm afraid. Errol did not see the shadow man move. The man looked back on Errol. The darkness blurred, and he was suddenly kneeling at Errol's side. Mother and Errol gasped. Everyone is afraid, the shadow man said, his tone soft. Ribbons of shadow leaped from his flesh and touched Errol with cold fingers. Even me. There's no shame in it. Do you really want me to stay here while the trolls attack your village? Errol understood the question. It was the same as when Mother had offered to let him sleep in the next day. He was supposed to say no. He struggled to find words. I was just... I was praying for Papa to come, and you came. I thought... 
he trailed off. He did not know what he had thought. The shadow man stared at him for a moment. Finally, he asked, What number name day is it? Eighth? Errol felt indignant that the shadow man had taken him for a wee. My tenth, he corrected, and his tone made the shadow man smile. You are small for your age, the shadow man said, but only in your body, not in your heart. What is your name? His name is Errol, mother answered. Errol frowned that she had stepped on his answer. The shadow man nodded. Errol is a good name. My friend's name was Jack, and he was a halfling like you. Not from this village, but from another like it. The screams from the village continued. Can you count, Errol? The shadow man asked. Errol nodded. To one hundred? Errol nodded again. The shadow man stood and looked down on them. When you reach one hundred, this will all be over. Those trolls will never bother you or your village again. Errol nodded, wide-eyed. The shadow man looked at Mother. This is nothing you'll want to see. Same for the boy. Trust me, and stay where you are. I'll save who I can. Mother just stared. The darkness around them began to deepen. Before it was too dark to see, Errol took a skipping stone from his pocket and tossed it to the shadow man. You might need it he said. The shadow man caught it, smiled, and slipped it in a pocket. I might at that. Your papa would be proud of you, Errol. The shadow man vanished as the darkness grew impenetrable. Errol held his hand before his face and saw nothing. His mother's arms were around him, though, so he felt safe enough. The shadow man's voice cut through the darkness. Start counting, Errol. Aloud. Errol did. One, two, three, four. By ten, he heard roars of surprise from the trolls. By fifteen, he heard the first of them die. Others followed quickly, at twenty, twenty-three, thirty-one. Roars of pain came one moment from Errol's left, then from his right, one moment nearby, the next farther away. He imagined the shadow man stepping out of the shadows, killing and disappearing, only to materialize across the village and slay again. By sixty, Errol stopped counting. The surviving trolls were trying to flee. He could tell by the way their terror-filled shrieks grew more and more distant. Mother held him throughout, rocking him, humming a lullaby. He thought perhaps she was more frightened than he was. It's all right, Mother, he said and patted her hand. He is here to save us. He felt his mother shake her head. No, sweet dew, not us. He's here to save himself. After a time, quiet settled over the woods. Then Errol heard a whooshing sound. The smell of smoke and burning flesh grew powerful. He and mother remained still, as the shadow man had told them. He heard no trolls, no combat, merely the moans of wounded villagers and soft crying of mourners, the barking of a few dogs. Shadow Man? Errol called. The darkness lifted. He blinked in the flickering orange light of a great bonfire that burned in the communal fire pit between the forest's edge and the village. Errol and his mother walked cautiously to the forest's edge, a pile of a dozen or more troll bodies, all of them dismembered and squirming, lay within the flames, Thick, stinking black smoke spiraled up from the corpses. The smell was foul and sickening. The shadow man was gone. The survivors from the village wandered slowly, dazed, confused. A few tended the wounded or knelt over fallen friends. Errol avoided looking too long at the dead. He would have cried, but he felt too numb to do anything more than stare. Some of the survivors walked cautiously toward the fire, Many held weapons, mostly pitchforks, but a few carried swords. Others leaned on their fellows, whether from wounds or fatigue, Errol could not tell. They murmured amongst themselves as they neared the pyre. Errol could see them pointing, explaining, trying to make sense of what had happened. Some prodded the burning troll corpses with their weapons. Sparks mushroomed into the air. Thunder rumbled in the distance. A storm was threatening. Errol doubted it would rain, though. It rarely did. 
None escaped, Errol heard someone say. Did you see him? said another. Who was it? What was it? Errol and his mother limped out of the woods toward the fire. Mother took Errol's hand firmly in her grasp. It was the Shadow Man, Errol called, and all eyes turned to him. The Shadow Man saved us, all of us. His name is Erevis Kale. We saw him. He talked to me. Errol spotted Nem in the village beyond, standing near his father, who held a woodsman's axe resting on one shoulder. Errol waved, relieved to see his friend. Nem returned the gesture and both forced smiles. The numbness left Errol abruptly, and he began to cry. So did Nem. The Shadow Man is a hero, said another, and everyone nodded. Where did he go, Errol? asked Matron Steet. Errol glanced around through his tears and could only shrug. Back into the shadows, Mother said. Errol gazed into the woods, into the dark. Come into the light, he whispered to Erevis Kale. Chapter 1 25 Elind The Year of Lightning Storms Black clouds roiled in the night sky. Lightning flashed, splitting the dark. Thunder rolled and boomed. Swells like mountains rose and fell on the sea. Rain fell in torrents. The mizzenmast of night's secret bent in the wind. The whole of the caravel creaked from the battering of the storm. Loose rigging and shredded sails snapped like whips in the gusts. But the dark pennon bearing the symbol of Shar and flying from high atop the mainmast held its ground against the storm. Rivelin smiled at that. The black circle bordered in violet looked like an eye. Shar's eye, guiding them to their goal. Rivelin stood on the lurching deck of Night's Secret and tried to keep his footing as the bow again rose skyward, crested a swell, and skidded down a mountain of water. The crew, experienced hands all, gripped lifelines nervously as they lurched across the slippery deck to obey Captain Perrin's shouted commands. Rivelin knew they were close to Sakors. The augury he had cast whispered as much in his ear. The first part of his quest would soon reach its end. More than a year earlier, a cry had sounded across the weave and the shadow weave, the warp and weft of magic, and resounded across Faroon. Every spellcaster of power had heard it, though probably only a handful had understood the language, that of ancient Netheril. I am here, proclaimed a voice in Loris. Help me. Rivelin's father, the Most High Telamont Tanthul, had immediately deduced the origin of the plea, as had Rivelin himself. Its only possible origin was the Mithalar of Sakors, a sentient artifact created thousands of years earlier by one of Netheril's high arcanists, Zoland the Maker. The revelation that a second Mithalar had survived Netheril's fall had sent a ripple of excitement through the rulers of Shade Enclave. Divinations had been cast, auguries consulted. Eventually, Rivalin's brother Brennus, a prodigy in the use of divinations, had located the site of the Mithalar. Rivalin and Brennus had been dispatched to find it, and they were nearly upon it. Rivalin reached into a pocket of his rain-soaked cloak and removed a worn platinum coin. The octagonal currency had been known in ancient Netheril as a Thurin. Time had rounded its corners and worn the stampings, twin lightning bolts crossed over a mountain on the obverse, a date on the reverse, almost into illegibility. The coin had been minted in Sakors long ago, when the city had flown in the sky on an inverted mountaintop, like all the other floating cities of Netheril, save Shade Enclave, Sakors had plummeted to earth when Karsis the Mad had attempted to achieve godhood. His meddlings temporarily unraveled the weave, and the empire of Netheril had died in a reign of falling metropolises. Shade Enclave had survived only because the dark goddess Shar had helped Rivalin's father shunt the city into the Plain of Shadow. Shade Enclave had abided there for centuries, had absorbed the darkness of the plain, and had only recently returned to Faroon. Rivelin squinted against the rain and watched the coin, waiting. 
He nodded with satisfaction when his eyes, attuned to see dreamers by merely looking for them, saw a soft red glow emanate from the center of the platinum piece. The spell on the Thurin was of negligible power, little more than a magical mint mark designed to prevent counterfeiting, but its appearance indicated that they were nearing Sakor's Mythaler. The quasi magic in the coin had been common in ancient Netheril, but was nearly unknown in Ferun's present era. The coin derived its power from a Mythaler, and the Mythalers of the Empire had done far more than fly cities through the sky. They allowed spellcasters to create magical items in the Mythalers' presence without physically or psychically taxing the caster. The physical and mental drains of spellcasting, ordinarily natural boundaries that limited a spellcaster's ability to forge magical items, were thus overcome by the presence of a mythaler. The quasi-magic went quiescent if items were taken out of proximity to the mythaler, but that had not stopped a profusion of quasi-magical items from rapidly transforming society in the Empire. Rivelin remembered those days well. Magic had permeated almost every facet of society and culture. The ancient Netherese had used magic and magical items for even the most mundane tasks, from street cleaning and waste disposal to flavoring food or carving a joint of beef. The presence of such vast quantities of magic had served only to make the Empire's fall all the more spectacular when the weave unraveled and magic failed. But before the fall, Zoland of Sakors had improved on the Mithler's design. He had infused his enclave's Mithler with a rudimentary sentience. The self-aware artifact called itself the Source, and unlike all other Mithlers, its sentience allowed it to direct or withhold its magical power as instructed. Instead of powering all items in its proximity, it could focus all its power on a single item, on none, or on many. The development of a sentient Mithler had caused a stir among the arcanists of the Empire, but the fall had ended any attempts to duplicate Zolan's feat. Sakor's Mithler was unique, and Rivelin wanted it. He peered through the storm and across the churning sea for Secret's twin, New Moon. The darkness did not hamper his vision. Rivelin was a creature of darkness, bonded to it, and saw through it as if it were day. But the rain obscured his surroundings. He spotted the caravel two long bow shots to starboard, bobbing on the swells like a toy. Both Moon and Secret would have been lost to the storm but for the water elementals Rivelin had bound to his service. The living waves surged through the turbulent ocean alongside both ships, riding them when they listed, shielding them from swells that would have swamped them. Rivelin's younger brother, Brennus, stood beside him, clutching one of the many hemp lifelines that webbed the deck. Shadows crawled over Brennus's exposed skin, betraying his nervousness. Like Rivelin, like all the twelve princes of Shade Enclave, Brennus was a shade. He usually traveled in the company of two homunculi, but the storm terrified the little constructs. They cowered below decks. The storm is sent by the Kraken. Brennus said, and he lurched as the ship slid down another swell. His shining eyes, the color of polished steel, glittered in the darkness. It's not natural. We must be close. Rivelin held up the Sakoran coin for Brennus to see. Not close. We're here. Abruptly, the storm abated. The rain, thunder, and lightning ceased. Secret and moon floated on a quietly rolling sea. The clouds parted to reveal a starry night sky. The soaked crew of Secret was too exhausted to do much more than give a hoarse cheer. Captain Perrin issued orders to assess the damage to the masts, sails, and rigging, and to get a head count. The men snapped, too. Rivelin and Brennus used minor magics to dry their clothing and gear. "'How fare you?' a sailor on Secret shouted across the water to New Moon, his voice carried easily over the calming sea. Wet, but no worse, came the shouted answer. All hands accounted for. Rivelin's augury was nearly at its end, but before expiring, it revealed to him an approaching danger. 
He secured the Thurin in his pocket. It's coming, he said to Brennus. Now? Rivelin nodded. Ready yourself and the crew, Captain Perrin, Rivelin shouted to the captain. Something comes. The brothers shadow stepped from mid deck to the rail, covering the distance in a single stride. There they scanned the sea while the crew heeded Rivelin's warning and took up crossbows and belaying pins. My princes? the captain called from the stern castle. Rivelin did not reply, but gripped the medallion of Shar he wore on a chain around his throat and stared at the water. Brennus held a duskwood wand in his hand. Shadows leaked from their flesh and cloaked them both. I see nothing, Brennus said. Wait, Rivelin cautioned. They waited. Waited. Then saw it. About midway between the two caravels, a soft red glow rose up from the depths and stained the sea crimson. It grew brighter, like a rising sun, spreading through the water like pooling blood. The crew saw it, too. They shouted, pointed, rushed to the rail, not knowing what they would soon see. Rivlin had said nothing about the creature, fearing he would not have been able to secure a crew. The glow, Brennus said. Must be from the Mithler, Rivelin finished. Brennus nodded. It bears the Mithler with it? Rivelin nodded and frowned. Caution would be necessary in defeating the Kraken. They could not risk damaging the Mithler with poorly chosen spells. Brennus turned to Rivelin, a question in his eyes. Strange that the Source has not contacted us, is it not? We know it to be sentient. We are close enough. It should have contacted us. It called to us before. Rivelin nodded and said nothing. He'd had the same thought, but did not want to give his concerns a voice. Brennus tapped his wand on the rail, demonstrating enough anxiety for both of them. Perhaps an attack has weakened it or destroyed its mind. Perhaps it is now too weak to suit our purposes. Perhaps, Rivelin pointed a finger at his brother. Shadows poured from his flesh, betraying his agitation. Enough, brother. We will know soon. Speculation is pointless. Brennus looked chastened. Of course. The red glow grew brighter. What is it, my princes? The captain asked. What comes? The crew's curiosity was giving way to alarm. They eyed the brothers and the sea nervously. All were Sharans, and all would die for Rivelin, but that did nothing to quell their fear. They would have been more frightened had they known the truth. We capture it, if possible, Rivelin said. Brennus looked at him sidelong. That will be quite a capture, brother. Rivelin allowed himself a tight smile before he drew on the shadow weave and incanted a series of arcane stanzas. Brennus watched for a moment, noting the spell Rivelin was casting, then put aside his wand and mirrored Rivelin's efforts. Their voices merged, arcane power gathered, and both moved their hands through an intricate set of gestures. The magic of their spell gave substance to the darkness, and a net of shadows formed on the surface of the water, backlit by the red glow of the mithler. The lines of the net's mesh were as thick as a man's arm. The brothers poured power into the spell until the net of shadows reached across the water, nearly touching both night's secret and new moon. The water between the ships looked not unlike an enormous chessboard. That must be quite a fish, one of the crewmen jested. No one laughed. Rivelin and Brennus held the magic of the shadow net taut, waiting. The glow grew brighter. Now, Rivelin said. He and Brennus released the pent-up magic of the spell, and the giant net shot downward at the kraken, closing as it went. The net was powerful enough to scoop up everything in the sea between the ships to a depth of a hundred fathoms, killing most everything it touched and trapping and weakening the kraken. A rush of bubbles rose to the surface as if the sea were boiling. Hundreds of dead fish bobbed upward, their lives extinguished by the enervating touch of the net. A shriek, like nothing Rivelin had ever heard, carried up from the depths and out of the sea. As one, the crew of Night's Secret backed away from the rail. Sailors exchanged alarmed glances. "'Steady, Jax!' shouted the captain. 
We've a sound ship under our feet and two princes of shade aboard. Steady. We have him, Brennis said and leaned over the railing. Rivelin was uncertain. The red glow flared as the kraken broke free of the net, shot upward, and breached the sea. A glistening, dun-colored mountain of flesh exploded out of the water. Spray flew as high as a bow shot into the sky. Tentacles, as tall as towers, squirmed into the air and blotted out the stars. The tatters of the net of shadows clung to the massive limbs and dissipated into nothingness. The crew of Night's Secret shouted in terror. Crossbows twanged, but the bolts were too small to affect the kraken. The roiling sea set the ship to rocking, nearly tossing Brennus overboard. Rivelin grabbed his cloak and jerked him backward. Brennus steadied himself on the gunwale and cursed. At your station, Sea Jacks, Captain Perrin shouted. At your stations, harpooners to starboard. The tentacles retreated under the sea, and the head of the kraken, sleek despite its enormousness, broke the surface. Rivelin saw what he had never expected to see outside of Shade Enclave. A Netherese Mithler. Another shriek from the Kraken split the night. The glowing crystalline shard of the Mithler, as big as a mature oak, stuck out of the Kraken's head like an enormous unicorn's horn. The creature's flesh had grown over to enclose the huge crystal. One of the Kraken's huge eyes, partially visible above the waterline, fixed on New Moon and the great creature dived under the surface. The Mithler's glow highlighted the kraken's form in silhouette. Its massive size surprised even Rivelin. With a single undulation of its body, the kraken darted like an arrow shot toward New Moon. The panicked shouts of the crew carried over the water. Brennus began a series of complex gestures and incanted the words to a spell to blast the kraken with dark energy. Rivelin took hold of his brother's hands and interrupted the spell. No, you could damage the Mithler. Brennus's eyes flared. Those are worshippers of Shar, brother, men serving us. I know. But Rivelin also knew that he could not risk the Mithler. He needed it. Shar needed it. The Kraken plowed into New Moon without slowing. The ship, a three-masted caravel from the Pirate Isles, disintegrated in a cacophony of cracking wood, roiling water, screaming men, and the shriek of the kraken. The creature dived under again, circling below the floating debris. Flailing men and hunks of broken ship dotted the sea's surface, lit from below by the light of the mithler. The kraken's silhouette glided under the men. They screamed in terror. The crew of Night's Secret watched it all in fearful, silent awe. My princes, shouted Captain Perrin, the fear evident in his tone. No ship on the sea can outrun that beast. We are not running, Captain, answered Rivelin over his shoulder. Two harpooners hurried to the rail. Rivelin eyed the powerfully built men bearing iron pikes tipped with sharpened hooks. Rivelin waved them back. Harpoons would not harm the kraken, nor would most of his spells, at least not before the creature could destroy the ship. He would have to try something else. The Kraken swam under New Moon's surviving crew and jerked several of the men under the waves. They left behind only ripples. They did not even have time to scream. The Kraken abandoned its sport with New Moon survivors and turned toward Night's Secret. The wide eyes of Night's Secret's crew darted back and forth between the onrushing Kraken and the two Princes of Shade. Rivelin felt Brennus's gaze on him, too. See to the rescue of Moon's survivors, Rivelin said. At least a dozen men are still in the water. Use the elementals. Brennus cocked his head in puzzlement. What do you intend? To end this, Rivelin answered, taking his holy symbol in hand. Brennus grabbed him by the wrist. Shadows coiled around them both. This is not a time to test your faith, Rivelin. A stronger shadow net might hold it still. Rivelin removed his brother's hand from his arm. He had made a lifelong habit of testing of his faith, and Char had rewarded him for it. He saw no reason to change his practice. No net will stop it, Brennus, but faith will. Watch. With that, Rivelin spoke an arcane word and empowered himself to fly. He stepped off the deck and streaked toward the kraken. The dorsal hump of the creature's body rose above the surface, so large it could have been an island. 
The glowing mithiler spike rose from the sea like a standard and led its charge. Rivelin felt the weight of the enormous creature's gaze, but answered with his own. The kraken's body pulsed, churning the sea behind it, and accelerated toward him. It shrieked from an unseen beak. Rivelin pulled up, hovering just above the surface of the sea. He recited a prayer to the Lady of Loss and felt her presence near him, frigid and calm. He took comfort. He was her instrument and would not fail. Drawing on the shadow weave, Shar's shadow weave, he spoke the arcane stanza from one of his most powerful charms. He completed the spell as water and tentacles exploded out of the sea and reached for him. Rivelin's magic reached into the mind of the kraken, established a link between man and beast. The spell pitted Rivelin's will against that of the kraken. Stop, Rivelin said and the spell sent his voice careening through the corridors of the kraken's brain. The creature's mind and comprehension were as immense as its body. The kraken had lived centuries, spent decades in contact with the sentient mithiler, learning, growing, knowing. Its mind was keen, incredibly powerful, but it was no match for Rivalin Tan Thul had learned spellcraft at the sides of the most powerful arcanists Toril had ever known, had survived the horrors of the Plain of Shadow for centuries, had battled the primordial Malogrum on their home plane, had melded his physical body with the stuff of shadow, had served and continued to serve as high priest to one of the most powerful goddesses in the multiverse. The Kraken's mind quailed before Rivalin. The huge creature submitted and stopped, Rivelin hung in the air, surrounded on all sides by tentacles as thick as wine vats. He could have reached out and touched them. They smelled of fish and sea. Suckers dotted the limbs, each of them as large as a war shield. Lower your limbs and be still, Rivelin ordered. The tentacles sank into the sea and the kraken held its position below him. Rivelin reached into the kraken's mind and learned its name. Sesimith. Behind him, the crew of Knight's Secret cheered and praised Shar. A cloud passed before Salgune, obscuring its light. Rivelin knew it to be a sign of his goddess's approval. He looked over the sea to the survivors of New Moon and saw the water elements scooping them up in turn, bearing them toward Knight's Secret. More than half the crew of New Moon had been lost to the Kraken. Rivelin felt pangs of regret. They had been loyal servants. He flew along the kraken's body until he reached its head. There he studied the mithiler. The flesh of the kraken's head grew along much of its length, and the open wound and folds of rubbery skin out of which the crystal protruded looked swollen and inflamed. Removing it from the creature would be difficult and painful for the kraken, but probably not fatal. That was well. Rivelin was certain he could find a use for the enspelled creature. Rivelin found the swirling whorls of color within the artifact's crystalline depths seductive, hypnotic. He lowered himself and placed a hand on it. The shadows around his body swirled about him defensively. The kraken spasmed as though startled. Be still, Rivelin commanded the creature, and it was. You are the source, he projected to the mithiler. Do you understand me? No response. He frowned. He had neither the time nor the resources to spend repairing another mithiler. The arcanists of Shade Enclave had only recently repaired the damage Mistress Chosen had done to his own city's mithiler. Brennus, powered by his own spell of flying, flew out to him. The two brothers hung in the night air over the subdued kraken, in the light of the mithiler, while the crew of Knight's Secret took aboard New Moon's survivors. Brennus eyed the kraken and shook his head. Shar favors you indeed, brother. Forgive me for doubting. Rivelin waved away the apology and ran his fingertips over the mithiler. His touch left fading streaks of shadow on the glowing crystal. I tried to contact it and received no response. It does not appear damaged. What can you see? Brennus cast a series of divinations. With each spell, his expression showed increasing puzzlement. 
Riven knew his brother could study a subject for ten days at a time. Speak, Brennis. What is it? Brennis shook his head. I'm not certain. The Mithler is weakened, though it appears to hold enough power for our purpose, but... But? But I cannot elicit even a superficial response from the sentience. For the moment, it's as inert as any other Mithler. Revelin frowned. Has its mind been destroyed? Brennish shook his head. No, the intelligence still exists. My spells detect the mind, but it is torpid. He looked down on the Mithler in puzzlement, as if hibernating. He looked at Rivelin. To heal, perhaps? Can we awaken it? Brennis shrugged. Rivelin offered his disappointment to the Lady of Loss as sacrifice. Even if the Mithler sentience was forever lost, the crystal might still be used. It can serve our purpose asleep or awake. Brennis nodded absently, still puzzling over the Mithler. I am going below, Rivelin said. Brennis cocked an eyebrow and looked at his brother in astonishment. Below? Now? Rivelin nodded and removed the ancient saccharine coin from his pocket. Thousands more were probably scattered on the sea floor. If he found a quality specimen, perhaps he would add it to his collection. Seeing the coin, Brennis jested, I do not think the Kraken will charge you a fee for transport. Rivelin smiled and said, I want to see the ruins. Brennis grew solemn, nodded. Rivelin lowered himself onto the Kraken's head. Sesameth's flesh was rubbery, cold, and slick, but Rivelin sat on his knees and kept his balance. He took his holy symbol in hand and offered an imprecation to Shar. Magic coursed through him, and the tingle in his chest told him the spell had taken effect. He could breathe water. He followed with the arcane words to another spell, and when he felt the magic charge his hands, he spun shadows from the air and shaped them with his fingers into a short rope and a barbed piton as long as his forearm. By the time he was done, both were as solid as if they were real. What are you doing? Brennis asked. But he must have guessed, for he floated backward a few paces. Remain still, Rivelin ordered Sesameth, and he drove the shadow spike deep into the kraken's flesh. The gargantuan creature seemed not to notice. Rivelin looped the rope of shadows through the piton's eye and held both ends in his hands. Brennis shook his head and smiled. His fangs, a royal affectation, glinted in the starlight. Descend to the ruins. Rivelin said to Sesameth. The Kraken immediately dived under the surface and shot downward like a bolt from a crossbow. The terrific speed almost stripped Rivelin from his perch, but his great strength, enhanced by the darkness, allowed him to keep his hold on the shadow rope. He expelled air from his lungs and inhaled to fill them with water. The ever-present shadows around him held the cold and pressure of the depths at bay. Led downward by the soft red glow of the Mithler, the Kraken dived for the bottom of the inner sea toward a city that had last been in the light of the sun over two thousand years earlier. The silence and isolation underwater surprised Rivelin. Sediment clouded the sea, probably churned when the Kraken had left the bottom. It was like moving through mist. Rivelin could see only a short distance in front of him despite the light of the Mithler. After a time, the kraken leveled off, partly rolled its body, and began to wheel a slow circle. Rivelin clutched the rope, leaned over, and looked down. The ruins of Sakors materialized out of the misty murk like a specter. The destruction shocked Rivelin. The inverted mountaintop upon which the flying city had stood had come to rest on its side, the position made the once horizontal plateau into a vertical cliff. Caves in the cliff suggested the activity of creatures, but Rivelin saw no life. Perhaps whatever creatures had lived there had moved on or died. The sideways landing had dumped the city off the plateau. Thousands of buildings lay in a heap on the sea floor at the base of the artificial cliff. Rivelin recognized the outlines of some of the structures. The shattered dome of the Temple of Koza, 
the once tall spire of Zolan's tower. Rivelin wondered what Zolan's final thoughts might have been as his city fell into the sea. He wondered what the source's thoughts must have been. He shook his head and remembered a day thousands of years earlier when he had walked the streets of Sakors, when he had taken counsel with Zoland himself. Sakors had not been as grand as Shade Enclave, but it had been a beautiful city nevertheless, and it would be again. Rivelin thanked Shar for sparing Shade Enclave the fate of Sakors. He promised her that he would resurrect the sunken city. He would bring it up from the bottom and back into the air, just as Shade Enclave had emerged from the shadows to fly again in Ferun's sky. Through the mental connection of his spell, Rivelin willed the Kraken to move closer. He longed to examine the mountaintop in more detail. The powerful magic that had first severed the top of the mountain from its root appeared also to have preserved it nearly intact. Despite the impact and the passing of years, this bade well. The shadow var of Shade Enclave could repair a damaged Mithalar, could use magic to rebuild a city in a month, but Mistress Denial, an edict issued by the goddess of magic in response to Carsus's folly, an edict that prohibited the casting of certain powerful spells once common in ancient Netheril, made it difficult and costly for even the Most High to cast the spell necessary to remove the top of a mountain and use it as a base for a floating city. Mistra's denial meant that the Empire could never be fully replicated, but a new netheral could rise. The raising of Sakors would be its harbinger. Rivelin decided that he had seen enough. He took the thern from his pocket and dropped it into the depths. It reflected the red light of the Mithalar as it sank, tumbling to the ruins. He would recover his coin when he recovered the city. He took one last look behind him, committed the ruins to memory, and commanded the Kraken to surface. He found Brennus waiting for him, still hovering over the sea. Rivelin was still able to use his spell to fly, so he leaped off the Kraken's back and recited a minor magic that dried his clothing and gear. What did you see? Brennus asked. The destruction of the city is complete, Rivelin answered. But the mountaintop is intact. You should see it, Brennus. The spire of Zolan's tower is discernible, as is the temple of Koza. Koza? That is a name I have not heard in a long time, Brennus smiled slightly. But no, I do not want to see it until it joins Shade Enclave in Ferun's sky. Rivelin nodded and smiled feeling satisfied. The first task set to him by Shar and his father was almost complete. We should inform the Most High that we have been successful, Brennus said. Agreed. Brennus put a hand on Rivelin's shoulder. And I have some thoughts about how to awaken the Mithler sentience. Days later, far removed from Sakors and the Inner Sea, Rivelin sought his father, the Most High Telamont Tanthul. Striding into his father's parlor, pennons of shadow formed spontaneously in the caliginous air and clung to his high-collared silk shirt and linen breeches. Rivelin had become so accustomed to the touch of the shadows over the centuries that he scarcely noticed them anymore. Shadows saturated Shade Enclave, just as the inner sea saturated Sakors. Dim lights provided the only illumination in the rich duskwood paneled chamber. A thick gray rug decorated with an azure spiral motif covered the floor. Plush chairs and two clawfoot divans provided seating. Books and scrolls covered most of the walls in the circular chamber. The Most High's mammoth darkwood desk sat centermost, itself covered in scrolls and tomes. Rivelin's father read voraciously everything he could find. Rivelin knew that the Most High had made a secret arrangement with the Keeper of Tomes, the master of Ferun's greatest library, Candlekeep. The Most High had provided the Keeper with some rare tomes from ancient Netheril, written in the original Lorus. In return, the Keeper allowed the Most High, through his agents of course, or in disguise, full access to Candlekeep's collection. 
Rivalin spotted his father on the far side of the parlor, standing before a magical wall map of Faroon. Rivalin saw no sign of Hadrun, his father's counselor and Rivalin's chief rival for his father's ear. Central Faroon, said the Most High, and the magical map changed perspective, expanding to show the details of the heartlands of Faroon, Cormir, Sembia, and the Dale Lands. Rivalin prepared to announce himself, but the Most High said, You and Brennus have found Sakors. Its Mithler is ours. Rivalin no longer bothered to ask how his father knew what he knew. Yes, Most High. The Most High turned to face him. His knowing platinum-colored eyes stared out of a narrow, expressionless face. Rivalin had inherited his father's sharp nose and imperial being. His father's royal cloak, originally violet, was so dark as to be almost black. As much shadow stuff as flesh, Telamont seemed to float rather than stand. The outline of his body blurred with the darkness in the room. Shadows swirled constantly around him, longer and thicker than those that circled Rivelin. The shadow stuff had not yet so consumed Rivelin, but it would. Well done, Rivelin. The Most High's praise was hard won. Rivelin enjoyed the moment. Telemont moved past Rivelin to the darkwood desk and removed the crystal stopper from a bottle of night wine. He poured two glasses and gave one to Rivelin. Rivelin held it, but did not drink. He never did. The Mithalar is undamaged? his father asked. Rivelin swirled the night wine, inhaled its piquant aroma. Structurally, it is undamaged, and its magic appears intact, if somewhat weakened. But the sentience within is unconscious. At this point, it is nothing more than a slightly weakened ordinary mithaler. The Most High sipped his drink and frowned. The sentience in the mithaler would be a formidable weapon to add to our arsenal. Awaken it, Rivelin. Easier spoken than accomplished, Father. Brennus has learned the name of someone we believe may be able to awaken it. I wanted only your permission to proceed. Who is this person you seek? A mind mage who travels the Dragon Coast. He is of no political consequence and will be missed by no one. A mind mage? Unusual in this age. This will not distract you from other matters? What other matters? Rivelin asked. Telemont smiled enigmatically. You have my permission, Rivelin. He clasped his hands behind his back and floated back to the wall map. Rivelin followed, thoughtful. We should proceed with the raising and reconstruction of Sakors, the Most High said. Your brothers Eder and Clara Burnus should lead the effort while you and Brennus pursue this mind mage. As you wish, Most High. Eder and Clara Burnus are to use all resources at our disposal. I want the city rebuilt within a month. Yes, Most High. A month would be an ambitious timeline, but with magic and slave labor, especially that of the Krinth, a strong but dull race born of slaves and shadow demons, it could be done. Rivelin stood at his father's shoulder and studied the map. It showed Sembia centermost, roads, cities, towns, temples, all clearly marked. Rivelin had long advocated moving against Sembia, a rich realm with fertile upcountry farmland and several southern ports. Rivelin had discussed the plan with his father at length, had planted the roots of Sembia's overthrow long ago, even before Shade Enclave had returned from the Plain of Shadow. Rivelin controlled cells of Sharans in almost all of Sembia's major cities. The Most High said, The heartlands are ripe, Rivelin. The rage of dragons has weakened them. Drought has weakened them. The rain of fire has weakened them. Their internal political squabbles and this elven return have weakened them. We must not let them rot on the vine. Most High, Rivelin asked, not daring to hope. Telemont continued, We have spent over a year scrabbling in the dirt, looking for trinkets from the Empire while we sought alliances with the child kings who now rule Faroon. Wasted efforts, I think. Do you agree? 
Rivalin licked his lips and carefully worded his reply. We have recovered what magic there is to recover from the ruins of the Empire, Father. That time is past, and our attempts at diplomacy have been met with scorn and mistrust. Cormir and Avareska still blame us for the depredations of the Farim. The elves that have returned to Cormanthor gather strength while we speak. The time for diplomacy, too, seems past. The Most High gestured at the map, indicating all of Faroon with a wave of his arm. Faroon is covered by petty realms ruled by petty kings, little better than the Rengarth tribesmen who once peopled the lands under the flying cities of the Empire. Even the elves have degenerated into barbarism. What have any of them accomplished since the fall? The Empire of Netheril gave them the pinnacle of magic, arts, and science, and they preserved none of it. His father faced him, his platinum eyes aglow. His voice softened. What is now Sembia once was called Arnathoi by the elves. Did you know that, Revelin? It was all rolling forest and grassy meadows. I did, Most High. Rivalin's collection included a coin of magically preserved polished wood from Arnathoi. He knew the elven realm's history. The Most High pointed to upcountry Sembia, not far from Derlin. A wisp of shadow spiraled from his fingertip and kissed the map. I walked a meadow there with Alishar long ago. A stream divided it in two. Gold slips covered the banks. Your mother loved how the flowers looked in the sun. Uncomfortable, Rivelin said nothing. His father seldom waxed sentimental, and the subject of Rivelin's mother, Alishar, always made him squirm. Rivelin had murdered her, after all. Telamont exhaled a cloud of darkness. Let the saccharine Mithalar be the last artifact of old Netheril that we seek— Trying to resurrect the old empire is a fool's task. Instead, we will build a new one. Do you agree? You know my thoughts on this, Most High. You have prepared the way in Sembia, yes? All is ready, Most High. Proceed, then. A thrill went through Rivelin, and he saw Shar's will made manifest in the news. Shar favors your course, Father. The Most High's eyes narrowed. She has given you signs? Rivelin's hand went to a holy symbol around his neck. Yes. Ever since Variants recovered the leaves of one night, the lady has been generous with her favor. Variants Amatic was Rivelin's underpriestess and archivist, second only to Rivelin in Shar's hierarchy in Shade Enclave. Over a year and a half earlier, she had recovered a lost book long sought by Shar's faithful. The Leaves of One Night. Rivelin purported to have locked it away in the temple's vault. In truth, he bore it with him always. The book revealed Char's one moment of weakness. Most of the faithful believed that the moment had passed long ago. Rivelin knew that it had not yet occurred. But that was a secret he kept to himself. Telamont said, If Char has spoken to you clearly, Rivelin, Inform me of her words. You know I should not, Rivelin answered. The lady's secrets are for the ears of her high priest. Forgive me, but that is the way of her faith, father, of your faith. The Most High's eyes flared. I am the Most High, Rivelin, and your father. Rivelin did not quail. I am her high priest and servant. You are also a servant of the Most High said a voice from behind them, Hadrun's sibilant reptilian voice. Rivelin turned to see Telamont's chief counselor rise from one of the parlor's chairs, dripping shadows. He clutched his ever-present dark staff in his hand. Rivelin had not noticed him upon entering. He wondered if Hadrun had been in the room the entire time. Hadrun continued, your loyalty is to the Most High first, Rivelin Tanthul, to Shade Enclave second, and to your goddess only third, or so it should be. Rivelin glared. A false choice, Hadrun. The interests of all three are aligned. Hadrun smiled. 
I wonder what would happen should they become misaligned. What would you do, Prince? Rivalin held Hadrun's gaze. I would never allow them to become misaligned. So you say, Hadrun said, and waved a hand dismissively. Enough, Hadrun, Telemont commanded. Rivalin, enough. Both men stared at one another but bowed before the Most High's anger. Rivalin's father went on. We must respect my son's religious zeal. He answers to what he believes to be a higher calling. Isn't that so, Rivalin? Shar has called you to a greater purpose, has she not? Rivalin stared at Hadrun and nodded. And Hadrun seeks only to serve me and this city. As do I, Rivalin said tightly. Telemont nodded and shadows flowed from him. The time has come to build a new empire of Netheril. See it done, Rivalin. Find this mind mage first, if you must, but see it done. As you wish, Most High. Rivalin gave Hadrun a final look and turned to leave. As he walked from the parlor, he realized that he had been standing in the room at the very moment when a new Netherese empire had been conceived. He gave Shar praise and thanks. Now he had one man to kill and another to capture. Chapter 2 29 Elint, The Year of Lightning Storms Rivelin and Brennus stood in the doorway of a scrying chamber in Brennus's mansion. Shadows cloaked the room, cloaked the brothers. Rivelin had decided to do the killing before the capturing. A domed ceiling of dusky quartz capped the scrying chamber, and the starlight that crept timidly through did little to dispel the murk. No moonlight marred the darkness. Selyun was new, in hiding, as if she knew what was to come. Rivelin brushed his fingers over the enameled black disc that served as his holy symbol. He wished the lady's eyes to be upon him, so he pronounced a bit of her liturgy into the room. In the darkness of night we hear the whisper of the void. Heed its words, answered Brennus. Rivelin heard only partial sincerity in his brother's rote response, but did not let it bother him. While the Most High and all of the Princes of Shade worshipped Shar, only Rivelin served the Lady of Loss. His father and his brothers craved worldly gain, for themselves and for their city. For them, Shar's worship was a means to that end. Rivelin, on the other hand, craved gain for the world, by returning it to the peace of Shar's nothingness. For him, Shar's worship was the end. None of them fully understood that, but none of them needed to. Few men were called to true faith. Rivelin's father and most of his brothers were powerful wizards. Several were even more powerful than Rivelin, but they were only wizards. Their understanding was therefore limited. Rivelin was more. He was born archwizard and priest, a thurge. Among the twelve princes of Shade Enclave, he was unique. Among all men, he was unique. Rivelin had received Shar's calling as a young man, when Netheril still had ruled much of Faroon. To prove his faith, Shar had required him to arrange the murder of his own mother, Alishar, and Rivelin had done it. The death of Alishar had sunk the Most High into despair, and that, in turn, had led him to Shar, the Lady of Loss. Through the ensuing years, Telemont had turned all of Shade Enclave to the worship of Shar. Rivelin had taken the dark rites and become first her priest, then her high priest. As a reward for her service, Shar had gifted the Tanthuls with special knowledge, how to bind their essence with shadow stuff. She had taught them of the secret weft of magic, the shadow weave, and had helped Shade Enclave avoid the otherwise complete destruction wrought on Netheril by Carsus's folly. She had given Rivelin still more. She had whispered to him his own secret, 
Rivalin would bring about the destruction of the world. She had birthed a plan then that would only see fruition 2,000 years later. Rivalin still marveled at the depth of Char's planning, at her patience. He did not regard the murder of his mother as a betrayal of his father. Alishar's death had served a more important purpose than her life. All was according to Char's plans. Come, Brennus said, and gestured him from the doorway into the chamber. The brothers crossed the smooth floor of the scrying room. The shadows gave way before them to reveal a massive cube of tarnished silver, half again as tall as Rivalin, Brennus's scrying cube. Dim images played across one of the four vertical surfaces. Brennus's two homunculi sat cross-legged on the floor, their backs to the brothers, watching the images displayed on the cube. The tiny humanoid creatures, each constructed by Brennus, absently fiddled with their toes while they watched intently. When they noticed Brennus, one nudged the other and both jumped nimbly to their feet. Toothless smiles opened under flat noses. Both had droopy eyes, the same steely color as Brennus's. Their gray skin creased like old leather as they bowed. To Rivalin, they looked like unfinished clay sculptures. One of the homunculi croaked, The master arrives. We have observed the images as you commanded. There is nothing of interest to report. Well done, Brennus said. The homunculi preened at his phrase. They asked, Up, up. Brennus smiled and extended an arm downward. The homunculi grinned and gripped his shirt sleeve to clamber up his arm, then took station on either shoulder. From there, they eyed Rivalin through narrowed eyes. I do not understand your fascination with constructs, Rivalin said, studying the creatures. His brother was also adept at crafting golems. The homunculi stuck their tongues out at him. No more than I understand your fascination with numismatics, Brennus answered. Coins are bits of history, Brennus. Countless realms rose and fell during our two thousand year absence from Faerun. Collecting the coins of those failed kingdoms reminds me of the fragility of empire. A useful lesson as we craft another. Crafting constructs reminds me of the fragility and delicateness of life, Brennus retorted. A useful lesson as we take those of others. He grinned and his fangs gleamed. You see, we are similarly motivated, Rivalin. The homunculi giggled. Rivalin smiled and tilted his head to concede the point. He studied the images that the homunculi had been watching. Brennus waved his hand before the device and the images cleared and brightened. The homunculi clapped. In one of the images, two women sat in solemn council across an ornate wooden table. A blue tapestry featuring a purple dragon hung on the wall behind them. The younger of the two, an attractive woman with blonde hair, gestured intensely as she spoke. The other, a dark-haired, dark-eyed woman with a serious countenance, remained still and listened, sometimes offering an observation. The regent of Cormir and Lady Calidni, one of the homunculi observed. Rivalin nodded and turned to the other image. A man with long gray hair and a thick beard sat in a padded chair, studying a thick tome in an expansive library. Smoke spiraled toward the ceiling from an ornate dragon-headed pipe set on the desk before him. Elminster of Shadowdale, the other homunculus said. Rivalin recognized Mistress Chosen. He faced his brother. Impressive. No doubt the Most High is pleased. Brennus smiled distantly. Perhaps not as much as you think. The Steel Regent and Kaladni incessantly discuss and debate the plots and counterplots of her nobility. They are convinced, correctly, that some of the rebellious nobles are allied with us, but they do not know which. Other than that, we have learned little of value. As for Elminster, the image is a fake. He thinks to deceive us by feeding us an illusory image. A fake, a fake, a fake! one of the homunculi chanted. Rivlin raised his eyebrows and more closely examined the image of Elminster. Are you certain? The detail is extraordinary. Even as he watched, 
The false Elminster leaned back in his chair, took up his pipe, and studied the ceiling, as if pondering a point he had read in the tome before him. Care lines creased his face, though his eyes looked as young as a man in his prime. I am certain, Brennus answered. The illusion is a spell tag. It is designed to attract divinations, twist the magic, and turn them back on the caster, allowing Elminster to scry those who would scry him. I prevented that, of course. Brennus eyed the image with open admiration. Still, it is extraordinary work. He is clever, and his spellcraft formidable. I have been unable to pierce his defensive wards. Yet you continue to scry the illusion. Why? Rivalin asked. It amuses me to do so, and I hope to turn his own spell against him. It must reach back to the real man somehow. I simply have not figured out the method, but I will. Rivalin had no doubt. Few could match Brennus's skill with divinations. Brennus gestured at the cube, and the images of Elminster and Alucer went dim. Bye-bye, said one of the homunculi. Shall we proceed? Brennus asked. Rivalin nodded. Brennus asked, The Most High is aware of your plan? Only you and our father are aware of my plan, Rivalin answered, deliberately leaving out any mention of Hadrun. And the Most High wishes it to remain just so until events progress further. The two took positions before one of the blank faces of the scrying cube. Spectacles of black tarnish marred the silver face. Brennus held up his hand, and the homunculi mimicked his gesture. Streams of shadow leaked from his flesh. He spoke an arcane word, and the tarnish on the cube face began to swirl and eddy. What do you hope to see? Brennus asked, as the magic intensified. Shar teaches that hope is an indulgence for the weak, Rivalin answered. Of course, Brennus answered with a half-smile. Rivalin said, Therefore, let us not hope. Instead, let us expect. And what I expect to see is opportunity. Consider it yet another test of faith. Brennus smiled at that. The swirling cube face took on depth, dimension. Rivalin felt as though he were looking into a hole that never ended. He felt nauseated, as he always did when scrying, and had to look away for a moment. Brennus extended both arms and pronounced the name of the overmaster of Sembia. Kendrick Selkirk. Rivalin looked back to see colors spinning on the cube face as the magic of the device sought its target, found him, and wormed its way through a number of wards against observation. The colors slowed, expanded, and an image began to take shape. The homunculi clapped with glee. Rivalin put a hand to his holy symbol as the image cleared. With his other hand, he took from his pocket one of the coins from his collection that he had pocketed for the occasion, a five-pointed Sembian five-star, stamped in 1371 Dale Reckoning, to commemorate Overmaster Selkirk's ascendance to power. He flipped it over his knuckles, a nervous habit, and waited. The face of the scrying cube showed a balding, bearded man asleep in an ornate bed. Dyed silk sheets covered his tall frame. The soft glow of embers provided the only light. He was alone. Rivalin smiled and ran his tongue over his left fang. Another test passed. He slipped the five-star back in his pocket. Sembia would need another five-star designed and stamped for 1374 to commemorate the beginning of a new overmaster's reign. Opportunity indeed, Brennus said. He is alone. Rivalin concentrated to engage the magic finding in his eyes, then examined the overmaster through the viewing cube. His enhanced perception showed him magical auras as fields of glowing color. Two protective dreamers warded the Overmaster, probably emanating from the two magical rings he wore. But neither would protect him against what Rivalin planned to do. Rivalin also saw the glowing lines of a spell of alarm that warded the Overmaster's chambers. He frowned, even though he had expected a magical alarm. It could be defeated by dispelling it, which Rivalin did not wish to do, 
or by speaking the password, which Rivalin did not know. The wards are easily dispelled, said Brennus, who had his own ability to see magic. Dispelling them will not serve my purpose, Rivalin answered, but he had another idea. Maintain the image. Brennus did as Rivalin bade him, asking no further questions. Rivalin lowered himself to a sitting position on the floor, drew on Char's shadow weave, and spoke a series of arcane words. As he cast, he stared at the sleeping overmaster, let the image sink into his brain, and completed the spell by speaking aloud Kendrick Selkirk's name. Instantly, his consciousness separated from his body and streaked through the scrying cube at dizzying speed until it reached the Overmaster's chambers. There, it oozed into the Overmaster's mind and infected his dreams. The phantasm allowed Rivalin to adopt a guise pleasing to the Overmaster in his dream to use that guise to cause the Overmaster to do what Rivalin requested upon waking. Rivalin did not see Selkirk's dreams, nor did he know what guise the spell adopted for him. Instead, his mind hovered around the edges of the dreams until the spell captured the Overmaster's attention. Rivalin felt the connection open. He projected a compulsion through the spell and into Selkirk's dream. Upon waking, speak aloud the password of the alarm spell that wards your chambers. Otherwise, all will be lost. The spell allowed no more, so Rivalin pulled himself out of the Overmaster's sleep. In a fraction of a breath, his mind returned to his body. He opened his eyes to find himself once more in the scrying chamber. And now? Brennus asked. And now we wait until he awakens and speaks the password. Then I will kill him. Brennus nodded. Do you wish me to accompany you? Rivalin shook his head. He was Shar's servant. He would do her will, and he would do it alone. This is a task set by Shar for me alone, he answered. Brennus accepted his statement with a nod. None of the other twelve princes disputed Rivalin on matters of religion. Even the Most High accorded great respect to Rivalin's views when it came to Shar's faith. My gratitude, however, for the offer, Rivalin added. The homunculi grinned, as did Brennus. They spent the next few hours watching the scrying cube, waiting. Rivalin used the time to pray, to rehearse his plan, to toy with the Sembian coin. He had already committed to memory the many spells he would need, including several that he had memorized so they could be cast with only a thought. He stirs, Brennus announced. Rivalin tensed, placed the coin back into his pocket. The overmaster rolled over in his bed. His eyes opened, he blinked, and he sat up, a glazed look on his face. Machinations, he announced. Rivalin knew that the puzzled frown on Selkirk's face would soon change to worried alarm, so he wasted no time. He spoke aloud the single arcane word that would transport him bodily across Faroon. The magic whisked him into the bedchamber of the Overmaster of Sembia. Machinations, he said as he appeared, preventing the magical alarm from functioning. He followed this immediately with one of the spells triggered only by his thoughts. The magic took effect, and silence cloaked the room. No sound could be made or heard within the chamber. Selkirk saw him and recoiled. His mouth opened, but his shout made no sound. His eyes went wide, and he lunged for an exquisitely carved night table beside his bed. Rivalin triggered a second spell, and a swirl of magical shadows went forth from his outstretched hand. The dark tangle struck the Overmaster, expanded, and wrapped his arms, torso, and legs in chains of shadow. Selkirk struggled futilely against the bindings, but managed only to fall off the bed to the floor. The Sembian's labored breathing, though silent, was visible even through the shadowy chains. Rivalin stepped through shadow space, covering the length of the chamber in a single stride, and knelt at the Overmaster's side. The acrid smell of fear rose from the Sembian's body. Words spilled out of his mouth, desperate words, to judge from his expression. Probably he was offering Rivalin wealth, station, trying to make a bargain. Rivalin had come to expect as much from Sembians. 
but even if Rivelin could have heard the words, he would not have cared what the overmaster had to say. Rivelin had not come to bargain. He had come to kill. He put his hand gently on Selkirk's brow. The man's body went rigid, and he shook his head over and over again. Rivelin would have respected him more had he shown defiance. With a thought, Rivelin tapped the shadow weave and triggered a powerful necromancy spell. The Overmaster might have been powerful enough to resist the spell, so Rivelin poured his power into the casting to make his fate certain and quick. The Shade had no desire to prolong the Sembian suffering. Energy flowed out of Rivelin's hand and into the Overmaster's body. It drove an arcane spike into the Sembian's heart. Selkirk arched his back, grimaced in pain, convulsed for a few moments, and died. His eyes stared upward. Foamy spittle glistened in his beard. Rivelin dispelled the bindings on the Overmaster's corpse, and they vanished. Using the strength granted him by the darkness, he lifted the body into the bed and covered it neatly with the sheet. Wondering what Selkirk had been lunging for, Rivelin examined the night table. A glass vial stood near an oil lamp and a small pile of coins. The vial's contents glowed with a faint magical aura. Within it was a clear liquid. Rivelin tilted the bottle and saw the liquid grew cloudy. He smiled. The potion would have turned the Overmaster into mist, allowing him to escape the room, probably through a tiny bolt hole. It was a simple but prudent bedside elixir for a head of state. Rivelin placed the vial where he had found it and eyed the coins, tempted. One of the five stars was dated 1374 Dale Reckoning, the year Overmaster Selkirk had died. The Overmaster's profile was featured on the obverse. Rivelin could not resist. He pocketed the coin. In his pocket, he had a five-star minted in the year of Overmaster Selkirk's ascendance and a five-star minted in the year of his death. Coins are history, he thought. He waved his hand to dispel the magical silence, placing his hands over the Overmaster's nose and mouth. He softly uttered the words to a powerful spell that served the metaphysical tie between the Sembian's body and his soul. There would be no resurrection for Kendrick Selkirk. He evaluated the room to ensure that nothing betrayed his presence, then took some time to cast several masking spells that would make his presence undetectable. Under the best of circumstances, Weave users had difficulty detecting spells cast through the Shadow Weave. Riven's masking spells made it nigh impossible. His plan was almost complete. He had but one final spell to cast. He stepped before the limestone hearth that filled nearly half of one wall of the chamber. The night embers glowed red. Crossed sabers and a shield featuring a coat of arms, a silver raven on a blue field, hung over the mantle. Rivelin turned his back to the fire, and the light from the embers stretched his shadow out before him on the carpeted floor. He held his holy symbol in his hand and intoned a prayer to Shar. As the spell progressed, it drew off some of his essence. He gasped as part of him drained away and funneled it into his shadow, giving it rudimentary life. The moment the shadow animated, it began to squirm free from the floor. Rivelin took it by the armpits. It felt slippery in his grasp as if coated in oil and helped draw it forth. He turned it and held it before him like a cloak. It had no weight and looked into its face. A duller version of his own golden eyes looked back at him. He smiled. His shadow self was as much a construct as his brother's homunculi. You know what you are to do, Rivelin whispered. I am you, the shadow self hissed. Then do it. Rivelin released the shadow and it floated to the overmaster. It hovered over the bed for a moment, leering, then stretched itself into little more than a ribbon and wormed its way into the Sembian's body through one of the nostrils. When it was gone, Rivelin cast another concealment spell on the body and surveyed the chamber one final time. The Chamberlain would find the Overmaster dead in his bed of a failed heart. 
his personal wards and the alarm spell still intact. Perfunctory divinations would be cast, but would reveal nothing. Resurrection would fail, if tried, and the customary attempts to speak with the dead would reveal only what Rivelin wished. Satisfied, he thanked Shar, drew the shadows about him, and rode them in an instant back to Brennus's scrying room. The homunculi greeted his return with applause. Well done, Brennus said. Rivelin did not acknowledge the praise. Events would move quickly. He needed to contact Eliral. The Lord Seagraph entered her dream, dwarfed her consciousness. The proximity of the Divine One hollowed out Eliral, reduced her to an empty rind of flesh. Her dream self trembled with awed anticipation. It had been two decades since she had last felt the oblivion of the Lord Seagraph's presence. Then she had been a mere adolescent, the daughter of a Sembian noble family. The Lord Seagraph had entered her dreams for the seven consecutive nights of the new moon and ordered her on the last night to do Shar's will by murdering her parents and older brother in their sleep. Awed by the magisterial void of Volumvax, the Divine One, the Lord Seagraph, the voice and shadow of Shar, Elyril had obeyed. Her parents had been planning to murder her anyway. She knew that for certain. The memory of that blood-spattered winter night in Uktar still pleased her. The murders became her own secret, an event known only to Elyril, Volumvax, and Shar, and as a reward for the deed, Shar had granted her a secret name, Nightbringer. The murder had resulted in Elyril being fostered in the house of her aunt, the Countess Mirabetta Selkirk. Elyril assumed her fostering to be Shar's plan all along, so she wasted no time worming her way into the confidence of her aunt, a dark-hearted petty woman whose only virtue was unbridled ambition. Over the years, Elyril became the daughter Mirabetta wished she'd had, so much so that the Countess sent her own sons away from the capital and paid for Elyril's tutors. By the time Elyril reached womanhood, she had become the Countess's chief advisor and confidant. Elyril made it a point to dismiss all suitors, which only pleased her aunt further. I serve only the Countess Mirabetta, Elyril always told them. So positioned, Elyril had bided her time and waited for word from the Lord Seagraph to learn what Shar wanted next. The wait had been long, but it appeared to be over. Elyril let her dream mind careen into the cold, empty abyss of Volumvax's manifesting eminence. She tumbled downward, toward infinity, and the metaphorical fall went on for a time that felt like years. Her body smashed flat as her fall was arrested on a bleak gray landscape, as level and featureless as a board of slate. The abrupt stop elicited a gasp, but otherwise left her unharmed. Naked, small, and merely human, she rose to her knees and waited for her lord and intercessor to reveal himself fully. Within moments, a heaviness suffused the air, its presence more tactile than visible. An oiliness formed on Elyral skin, black, thick, and viscous. From her earlier experience, she knew it to be the precursor to the manifestation of Volumvax. She waited, eager, awed, shaking with anticipation. Slowly, like sweat squeezed from pores, darkness oozed from the slate of the dreamscape. She kept still as it formed an expanding pool at her feet. The touch of the shadow stuff elicited shivers. She sensed her physical body, still asleep in her bedchamber, trembling with the ecstasy and exquisite terror that accompanied contact with the divine. Her heart thumped like a war drum, her flesh tingled, and blood pulsed in her pelvis. She knew that she would awaken with the flushed skin and weak legs that always afflicted her after sexual release, but she did not care. She was in the presence of Volumvax, the highest servant of her goddess, himself a demigod, and she trembled. The shadow stuff rose up and began to take shape before her, solidifying, 
twisting itself into a form that Elyral's mind could not fully comprehend, whose dark bodies reached into the secret corners of the world, whose presence murdered light. Elyral averted her gaze and abased herself before her manifesting lord, pressing her forehead into the slate of the dreamscape. She knew that she was unworthy to look upon Volum Vax even in a dream. The Divine One was too beautiful in his darkness for a human to see unveiled. A palpable wave of bitterness went forth from the forming demigod and washed over Elyral. Primordial emotion pressed against her mind until she screamed. The sound died the moment the scream left her lips, absorbed by the nothingness around her. Terror and excitement drew her breath forth in gasps. After a timeless moment, she felt a presence before her body, so heavy, so substantial, that it surely must shroud the world. Elyral knew when Volum Vax's gaze fell upon her trembling form. She felt his eyes on her back like the stabs of twin spears. The weight drove her chest flat against the floor, and she lay there, pinioned by his might, impaled by his eyes. Drool dripped stupidly and unheeded from her lips as she mouthed the words to the supplication, I kneel before Shar's shadow, who shrouds the world in night. I kneel before Shar's shadow. Elyral knew that the Lord Seagraph would not speak in her dream. He never did. But she heard him nevertheless. She knew him nevertheless. She waited, her breath like a bellows. As one moment stretched into another, she tried to brace herself. Her fingers gouged grooves into the dreamscape. Her heart bounced in her chest. Her lungs rose and fell, rose and fell. I kneel before Shar's shadow, who shrouds the world in night. I kneel before Shar's shadow. Volumax touched her, the gentle caress of the demigod who would rule the world in Shar's name. An instant of excruciating pain racked her body. She convulsed and swallowed her scream only by biting down hard on her tongue and pressing her forehead into the ground. Back in her bed, Blood from her mouth joined the drool that already dampened her pillow. The pain passed quickly, replaced by indescribable pleasure. The touch of divine fingers exited such arousal in her already sensitized body that she experienced wave after wave of sexual release, one rapid, agonizing, ecstatic pulse after another. The wail elicited by that ecstasy was uncontrollable, even in the dream. She arched her back and groaned her pleasure into the nothingness. Volum Vax's fingers lingered on her flesh as he communicated his intent. His eyes burrowed through her back and into her soul to impress upon her his will, Shar's will. So says Shar, the Lady of Loss, through her instrument and shadow, the Lord Seagraph. Follow the Night Seer until the sign is given and the book is made whole. Then summon the storm to free the Divine One. This is to be a secret known only to we three. Elidral sagged, began to weep. She had waited for so long to be Shar's instrument. The time at last was at hand. Now see the Lady's vision for you, secret even from me. The Lord Seagraph removed his hand from Elidral, leaving her bereft, and the gray plain instantly fell away. She found herself alone, suspended within the nothingness. A lyral stomach rushed into her throat. Vertigo made her dizzy. Back in her bedchamber, she felt her body vomit its evening repast. Mountains, seas, rivers, and plains took shape far below her. Her nausea passed, and she recognized the landscape. She was floating as high as the clouds above an image of Faroon's heartland. She could see for leagues in all directions. The landscape stretched from the sandy wastes of Anorak and the Dale Lands in the north to the Dragon Coast in the south, from the jagged storm peaks that bordered Cormir on the west to Sembia and Raven's Bluff in the east. She recognized the dark lesions on the land as cities, Arabelle, Selgaunt, Ermlaspear, her own home of Ordulin. She waited. 
After a moment, a thin, purple-veined tendril of shadow formed in Anorak, within Shade Enclave, home of the Shar-worshipping Shadow Var, and their high priest, the Nightseer, Rivalin Tan Thul. The tendril expanded southward and east toward Sembia. At the same time, a second shadowy tendril, thick and blunt, but also lined with veins of purple, burst out of Ordulin and made its way west across Sembia. Elyral smiled to see Sembia caught in the vice of her goddess's will. She smiled even more to see one side of that vice originate in Ordulin, presumably with her. Summon the storm, the Lord Seagraph had commanded. The two fronts moved inexorably toward one another, swallowing the light, shrouding the land. Darkness devoured Sembia, and all of Faroon cowered. Elyral watched it all, satisfied that she would live to see Shar's final victory in Faroon, until a third tendril of darkness, narrower but deeper than the other two, arose in central Sembia and expanded rapidly outward in both directions to meet the onrushing shadows of Shar. This tendril bore no trace of Shar's holy purple. The competing fronts of shadow met and did battle. Elyral shouted in rage as darkness warred against darkness. Who would dare stand in the path of the shadow storm? How would... Without warning, the vision ceased, and Elyral was alone in the nether. She screamed her frustration into the void. Some time later, she awakened in her bed, sweat-soaked, exhausted, and staring up at the beamed ceiling of her bedchamber in her aunt's mansion east of Ordulin. No, she said, and sat up, disturbing the vomit, blood, and drool that stained her silk sheets and pillow. Her tongue ached from where she had bitten it in her dream. She ignored the pain and the sloppy mess on the bed. Volum Vax's will throbbed at the forefront of her consciousness, and she whispered it aloud. Summon the storm to free the Divine One. She wanted to know more, needed to know more, but she knew she would learn nothing else. The Lord Seagraph and the Lady of Loss kept their secrets. Such was the nature of the faith. As a priestess of Shar, Elyral often had to act while ignorant of Shar's plans. Near the foot of her bed, she heard Kefal stir. The black mastiff climbed to his feet, stretched, and uttered a contented rumble from deep in his huge chest. The dog's shoulder stood even with the top of Elyral's bed, and his bloodshot brown eyes fixed on her. You thrashed about in your sleep, Kefal projected. Gray hairs dotted his massive jaws, and his bleary eyes showed their age. Elyral smiled in spite of her concerns. The dog spoke to no one but Elyral. It was their secret. Keffel had first spoken to her the night after she had murdered her parents. He had been a pup then, and his name had been Moors. Elyral had renamed him after her dead brother. She assumed his intelligence to be a gift granted by Shar. Over the intervening years, he had become a trusted confidant. Her aunt hated the dog— but allowed Elyral to keep him in her room anyway. Keffel whirled around to nibble at an itch in his hindquarters. The Lord Seagraph spoke to me, she said to him, and offered no further explanation. She would not share even with Keffel the intimacies of her relationship with Volumvax. Keffel continued biting his itch and respectfully asked no further questions. Mindful of her soiled sheets, Elyral carefully pushed the silk from her legs and swung them off the huge bed. Her head felt as if it were stuffed with rags. Her temples pounded. She cradled her brow in her hands. Thank you, my lord, she said to Volum Vax, wincing at the pain in her tongue and head. It is my humble pleasure to serve. Keffel abandoned his itch and devoured some of the darkness in the room. Elyral smiled. Keffel always hungered for shadows. The mastiff sank back to the floor with a grunt. A tingle under her scalp told her that the Nightseer was trying to contact her through the magical silver and amethyst ring she wore. She looked down, saw the amethyst set into her ring sparkle as its magic linked to the shadow weave. The connection opened. 
You have received a sign, Dark Sister, Rivalin said, and it was not a question. Elirol's breath caught. Volumvax had commanded her to keep the sign a secret. How could Rivalin have known? He could not know of Elirol's relationship with Volumvax, could he? Elirol could not answer the Nightseer for a moment. Finally, she responded, Yes, Prince Rivalin, I have received a sign. I believe the cycle of shadows is beginning. A long pause passed before Rivalin answered, No, Dark Sister, the cycle was begun long ago, thousands of years before your birth. Know that the Overmaster is dead. Elirol gave a start. Dead? When? This night, he appears to have died in his sleep. Elirol giggled. She had never fancied her aunt's cousin. All will suspect murder, she projected. And most would suspect her aunt. And they will have their murderer, Rivalin answered. Resurrections will fail, and none but a user of the Shadow Weave will be able to learn the true cause of death. Speaking with the spirit of the dead will reveal a name. The name of he who we wish known as the killer. Be certain that it occurs in public, before the High Council if possible. Prepare your aunt to take power. Prepare yourself to steer her as I and the lady direct. Elirol's aunt had been positioning herself for over a decade to challenge Kendrick for power. With Elirol's aid, Mirabetta had bribed or extorted alliances from fully half of Sembia's High Council. She would be among the leading candidates to replace the dead Overmaster. That should not be difficult to arrange. That is what I expected, Rivalin said, and Elirol thought she heard a smile in the tone. Night shroud you, Nightseer, and you, Dark Sister. A gentle hum in Elirol's ear indicated that the magic of the sending ring had gone quiescent. Rivalin was gone. Elirol sat on the edge of her bed for a moment, letting the import of the night's events settle on her. She had been directly contacted by the two most powerful servants of her goddess. She must indeed be Shar's instrument. Now she needed only to await the sign, and for the book to be made whole. But what book? She did not know. For the moment, it was Shar's secret. She touched the disc she wore on a chain around her neck. Years earlier, she had paid a wizard to make the black and purple disc permanently invisible, then used it in a ceremony sacrificing him to Shar. No one but Elira, Volumvax, and Shar knew of the symbol. Its existence was their secret. So, too, was the fact that the holy symbol stored the souls of those Elira had killed, including her parents. Elirol's headache reminded her that divine visions did not come without a physical price. She stood, and her legs, weakened from sexual release and the exhaustion that accompanied contact with the Lord Seagraph, wobbled under her. She touched a fingertip to her tongue, looked at the blood, clasped the invisible holy symbol that hung from her neck, and whispered a healing prayer to Shar. The wound in her tongue closed. The pain in her head subsided. She noticed a chill in the room. Embers glowed in the huge stone hearth that dominated her bedchamber. But they offered scant warmth to her body, covered as it was only in a thin night shift. She crossed the chamber, stirred the embers with a poker, and added a log. She caught Keffel leering at her out of the corner of her eye. She knew her lithe body pleased the dog, Flames rose from the stirred embers and caught quickly, sending flickers across the room. The wood crackled. She walked to the night table and rang a small, magical brass bell. Her personal servants, all magically attuned to the bell and others like it, heard its ring no matter where they were or what they were doing. After ringing, she began a mental count. She had adopted her aunt's rule that servants had a twenty count to attend her after the ring, no longer, or they would be flogged. Before she reached ten, she heard the sound of feet rushing down the hall, the tinkling of bells, and a hesitant knock on her door. Enter, she commanded. The door opened. 
Daylight from the hall outside cascaded into the room. She blinked in it. She had not realized that the sun was well into its daily course. Close that door, she snapped. Keffel growled at the sudden light. A skinny adolescent boy hurried in, eyes on the floor, and closed the door behind him. The room returned to darkness. The youth wore the black tunic, belled head wrap, and calf-length trousers that Mirabetta required of all the servants. Bony legs and arms jutted from the clothes, the limbs like those of a scarecrow. Eliral did not know his name and did not care. Probably the boy was the result of one of the sexual unions that Mirabetta had arranged between her servants. Her aunt joyed breeding the staff, selling some to slavers, some to fighting rings, some to brothels, and keeping those who pleased her. She had done so for decades. Mistress, the boy mumbled, you summoned me? The boy's eyes never left her bare feet. Keffel stood up and the boy gulped. The mastiff cocked his head and eyed the boy as he might a piece of meat. My sheets and bed pillow require laundering, Eliral said. She reached for the tiny iron snuff box she kept in the drawer of her night table. Yes, mistress, replied the boy. He stepped to the bed, keeping as much of it between him and Keffel as possible, and began to gather the sheets. Eliral popped the snuff box with her thumb. The piquant bitter aroma of dried and powdered mind dust filled her nostrils. The drug was a poor substitute for Volum Vax's touch, but she found it pleasing nevertheless. She'd once heard from an apothecary that prolonged mind dust use drove its users mad. Eliral found the notion absurd. She'd been using the powdered leaf for nearly a decade and showed no ill effects. She took a pinch between her fingers, brought it to her nose, and inhaled sharply. The drug danced over the back of her throat, tickled her senses. She felt the effects almost instantaneously. Her head went light. She heard a melody in the crackling of the fire, and the hairs on her arms stood on end, tingled in the air. She caught the servant boy watching her from the corner of his eye as he leaned over her bed and pulled in the sheets and pillow. He bunched the bedding into a ball, bowed, Eliral heard a poem in the tinkling of the head wrap's bells, and prepared to leave. Eliral held out the snuff box and purred, Do you wish to try some? He froze for a moment, shook his head, and refused to look at her. I wish you to try some, she said. Come here. He lifted his eyes to hers for only a moment before restoring his gaze to her feet. She could smell the fear in his sweat, and it intoxicated her nearly as much as the mind dust. She took another pinch from the box, inhaled it, and laughed aloud. Come, she ordered, this instant. He took a slow step toward her, another, and she glided the rest of the distance to him. Her shift clung to her as she moved and showed her body to best effect. The boy trembled, uncertainty and fear writ clear on his troubled brow. You are a pretty boy, she said. Still looking at the floor, the boy said, The mistress is gracious, but I should see to these sheets immediately, lest the stain become difficult to remove. Eliral smiled and clapped her hands. The boy was clever, more so than most. Mirabetta's breeding program had resulted in a fine specimen. You are articulate she said, and leaned in close to let her breath warm his cheek. Before he could frame an answer, she lightly ran a fingertip over his arm. Startled by her touch, the boy stumbled backward a step and nearly fell down. The bells on his rap tinkled loudly. Their melody told her to kill the boy. The youth scrambled to his feet, holding the bedding defensively between himself and Eliral. Vomit from the sheets smeared his clothing. Mistress, I... Keffel padded around the bed and the boy froze. Keffel sniffed around his legs. May I maul him? Keffel projected. Eliral considered it, but decided that she did not want blood in her chamber. She could chop him up and feed him to the dogs later. Devour his shadow, she answered. The mastiff seized the boy's shadow from the floor, shook it, and devoured it as it screamed. The boy never made a sound, never moved. 
Keffel finished his repast and let out a satisfied grunt. He sank to the floor beside the boy. What is your name? Eliral asked the slave at last, keeping her voice level. She liked to know the names of those she would sacrifice to Shar. Mard, mistress, the boy said, and she could hear the beginnings of tears in his voice. Mard, she said. She let the word hang between them for a long, delicious moment before deciding to end the game. Mard, do not get your tears on my sheets. Be gone from me. Alert one of the kennel boys that Keffel requires a walk. Mard stared at her for a moment, as if unsure what she had said. This instant, she ordered. Thank you, mistress, he said, and fled the room. She watched him go, thinking how pleasant it would be to hear him scream as he died. Keffel belched, sated on shadows. In the darkened chambers of his mansion in Shade Enclave, Rivelin stared at his coin collection and let the ache in his temples subside. He always found mental contact with Elyral uncomfortable. Her mind dust madness polluted the connection and made his head throb, and it had grown worse over the years. Still, she was a useful tool to him as he prepared to bring his plan to fruition. The Most High wanted a new Netherese empire. His goddess wanted the Shadow Storm. Rivelin knew that the two goals were compatible. He would use the one to bring about the other, and a Sembian civil war would be the means. Over the centuries, Rivelin had spent much intellectual energy finding ways to make the requirements of his faith compatible with his duty to his city, his people, and his father. So far, he had been successful, but Hadrun's words had made him worry that the day would arrive when he would not. Rivelin did not know the entirety of the lady's plan. Such was the nature of Shar's faith. Through the years, Shar had revealed to Rivelin only bits at a time, but Rivelin had faith that she would reveal to him what he needed to know when he needed to know it, and that she would reward his successes. While he dared not hope to be Shar's chosen, after experiencing firsthand the power of Mistress Chosen, he had allowed himself to consider the possibility. He dismissed such thoughts as unproductive and continued with his sendings. He activated the magic of his sending ring and thought of another of his Sembian agents, the Sharan Dark Brother in Selgaunt. The familiar tingle of the magic tickled his scalp. He sensed the channel opening. Prince Rivelin, answered the Dark Brother, an heir to a wealthy Sembian family. Rivelin knew him to be an effective servant for the lady, posing as a rich dilettante. Is all prepared? Rivelin asked. As well as it can be. Construction proceeds apace. None suspect the truth. See that it is complete within the next three months, Rivelin said. There will be still more for you to do afterward. The night shroud you, Nightseer. And you, Rivelin answered and terminated the magical connection. Rivelin went on to contact the leaders of each Sharan cell in Sembium, over two dozen of them. Each wore a sending ring paired to his master ring, though none knew the other powers of the rings. To each he gave a variation of the same message. Be prepared, the shadow storm is brewing. None asked him questions, for they all knew they would receive no answers. Prior to Rivelin's involvement, the Sharan cells in the Heartlands had operated independently, mostly ignorant of each other. But after Variants at Rivelin's command had recovered the leaves of one night, Shar had revealed to him the identities of the leaders of the cells. One by one, he and Variants had contacted the cells and brought them all under his leadership, until finally Rivelin commanded the grandest conspiracy in Faroon, a small army of Sharans lurked beneath the veneer of Sembian society, eating away at the core. His sendings complete, Rivelin relaxed by sipping tea and examining his coin collection. He stored his coins in a large case of magically hardened glass, each piece placed in a black velvet setting. He had an Electrum Falcon from the year of Cormier's founding, 
100-year-old gold bell bolts from Chisenta, a cursed copper fandar from Am that caused the bearer's business decisions to go poorly, a magical platinum kalashite killark that returned to its spender thrice, and a host of other coins, both magical and mundane, from all across Faroon, from almost all eras of its history. He looked to the empty place in his collection, where he had kept his saccharine thurin. The hole in his collection reminded him of the magnitude of his tasks. He had many holes to fill in the coming years. He finished his tea and turned his mind to the first of his holes, the problem of awakening the sentience in Sakor's mythaler. He would need Brennus's divinations to find the mind mage. Chapter 3 Thirty Elint, The Year of Lightning Storms The sight of the oak brought a smile to Magadan's face. He had passed the soaring old tree many times in his journeys to and from Star Mantle, though it had been almost a year since he had last seen it. It looked almost exactly as he remembered it, a lone soldier standing sentry over an expanse of knee-high whip grass. Other trees dotted the plain here and there, but none were as large as the oak. He was their general. Magadan ignored the chatter from the camp behind him and ran his fingertips over the tree's bowl. The deep ridges of the bark and the size of the bowl put the tree's age somewhere between seventy and eighty winters. A grand old man. A few tumors bulged here and there from the trunk, and the crotch showed a ragged scar from a recent lightning strike, but Magadan thought the tree hail. The world had thrown another year at it, and there it stood. Magadan figured there was a lesson in that. Too bad he had not learned it sooner. Magadan had not had the oak's strength. The last year had broken him. Or bent me, at least, he murmured. The oak's leaves were changing from green to autumn red. They looked beautiful even at night, especially at night, framed against the starry sky and glinting in the silver moonlight of the newly risen crescent of Salyun and her tears. Magadan flattened his palm against the oak. He had missed the tree, or he had missed the part of his life it represented. But he was reclaiming that part of his life, reclaiming himself. Droppings at the base of the tree caught his eye. He knelt to examine them and recognized raccoon pellets. He stood smiling. Things were coming back to him. He had not forgotten his wood lore. A soft skitter sounded up in the tree. Magadan looked up and found two pairs of masked eyes peeking down at him, a mother raccoon and one of her young. He would not have seen the creatures but for the night vision granted him by his fiendish blood. "'You've picked a good home, mother,' he said to the larger raccoon. Mother and baby cocked their heads to the side, chittered, and ducked back into their hidden den. Magadan patted the tree's trunk. "'Can you bear some more company, old man?' I promise you will find me an easy guest. The oak kept its own counsel, so Magadan unslung his pack, stuffed full with gear as always, and sat with his back against the trunk facing the camp. The campfire was going strong, and merchants and men-at-arms sat around it on barrels, crates, and logs, talking, drinking, laughing. Magadan stretched out his legs, interlaced his fingers behind his neck, and blew out a sigh. The oak felt good at his back. His friend Nestor had once said, There's not steadier than an old oak. Magadan knew it to be true, and he knew there was much to be said for steadiness. He hoisted his water skin in remembrance of Nestor and took a long drink. Thinking of Nestor and his death brought back a wash of memories, some good, of Erebus, Riven and Jack, and some bad, of the sojourner, the slods, the weave tap, and the source. Recalling the source made him squirm. He cleared his throat and tried to forget what it had shown him, what he had known, what he had been, for those few moments of contact. But memories were stubborn things. 
He unclenched his hands from behind his neck and held them before his face. A tremor shook them, softly at first, but growing stronger. He knew what was coming. He stuffed his hands in his pockets and waited. He had seen the same shaking in mind-dust addicts who had gone too long without their snuff. The need came on him, the hunger. A tick caused his right eye to twitch. The source had given him so much knowledge, so much power. He could have done such good with it. He should find it, go to it, and bond with it once more. No, he said, and shook his head. Even if he had surrendered to his need, he could not have gone to it. The source lay at the bottom of the inner sea, sticking out of the head of a creature as large as a city. Magadan recognized what was happening and fought, as he did every day, to keep hold of himself. His mental addiction to the source had caused him to lose himself once. An entire year of his life had vanished into a haze. He would not allow it to happen again. He took a deep, shaky breath, felt the oak at his back, the breeze on his face, and the clean air in his lungs. He had heard the laughter of the caravaneers and rode out the pull. After a time, it passed, more quickly than the day before. He was beating it. The realization strengthened him further. Another chitter came from above. He looked up to find not two, but a row of six faces staring down at him, presumably the mother and all of her young. He could not help but smile at their wide-eyed, curious expressions, one of the young climbed over another, and the mutter chittered at them. Very well, he said. I'll be on my way, but only after I eat. The raccoons continued to stare at him with bright eyes through their masks. Magadan pulled a half wheel of cheese and two mostly brown apples from a leather bag in his backpack. He habitually ate alone, separating himself from the caravaneers. He did not quite feel up to companionship, he thought the men of the caravan decent fellows, but he needed meditation more than company. Or so he told himself. The raccoons chittered at him in irritation. He took another bite of apple. You don't frighten me, he said to them with a smile. I have seen angry eyes behind a mask before. He took another bite of apple and noticed the black clawed nails that had once been his normal fingernails. He sank them into the apple to hide them. Inexplicably, his contact with the source had changed not only his mind, but also his body, somehow stirring the blood of the archdevil father that polluted his veins. As his mental powers had expanded, his body had come to more closely resemble that of his diabolical sire, as had his proclivities. Soon after his separation from the source, the nightmares had begun. The nine hells haunted his dreams. When he slept, he saw souls burning, writhing, screaming in pits of fire while leering devils looked on. The visions had grown worse over time. He felt as if they were moving toward some climax that would drive him mad. For months, he had feared sleep. He had grown desperate had sublimated his desire for the source and his need to escape the dreams by turning first to drink, and when that did not stupefy him adequately, to drugs. He had lost himself for months. The dreams had not stopped, his need for the source had not stopped, but he had been so dulled that they had bothered him less. He scarcely remembered those days. He did remember that during the all-too-rare moments of clear-headedness, he had considered reaching out with his mind to Erebus or Riven, his friends, but had lacked the courage. His stupor had not dulled his shame over what he had become. He had not wanted his friends to know of it. Besides, each of them had their own burdens to carry. The visions of the hells had eventually left his dreams and invaded his waking hours. He'd hallucinated immolations on the city streets at midday, heard his father's voice in the call of street vendors, seen devils in the darkness of every alley. He was falling into madness, but could not stop the descent. Blood of my blood, his father assured him in a voice smoother than calashite velvet. 
I can end all this and give you what you want, what you need. Magadan had never been sure if the voice had been real or imagined, but he had been tempted. He awoke one night in a dust den, his shirt stained with blood, someone else's. He'd known then that he had to do something to save himself or he would die, in spirit, if not in body. Ironically, the Source, by expanding his mental powers, had given him the tool he needed. He used it, performing a kind of psychic chirurgery on his own mind, walling off most of the dark, addicted portions of his consciousness from the rest. He likened it to cutting off a gangrenous limb, but that was more like splintering himself. He'd had to divide himself to save the whole. He could not cut off all of the addiction or all of the dark impulses, but he had severed most of them from his core. And it worked. Mostly. He still dreamed of the hells. His body told him that he had not slept well in months, but his conscious mind did not remember. That was the important thing. He worried what kind of rot was occurring within him, unnoticed behind the mental wall, but he figured a man half-saved was better than a man wholly damned. A loud round of laughter from the merchants shook Magadan from his ponderings. One of the merchants, a brown-haired man with a pot belly and receding hairline, stood up and called over to him. Magadan thought he remembered his name was Grathen. Woodsmen, we've a wager here. We all know that you never doff that hat. Even when you sleep, one of the men-at-arms shouted. Grathen nodded. Even when you sleep, I say you've something even more peculiar than your eyes under it. Magadan's eyes, colorless but for the pupils, often drew comment. He had explained them to the merchants as a defect of birth, and he supposed it was, coming as it did from his fiendish blood. Most called them asp eyes because they looked like single pips on the dice, an unlucky roll. A scar or some such, perhaps, Grathen said. Or maybe a balder head than Grathen's shouted another of the merchants, bringing the rest to hoarse laughter. That'd be bald indeed. A scar'd be better. Grathen waited for the laughter to die down, then gestured at a young merchant who sat near him. Tark here says you wear it out of superstition for luck or some such. Which is it? There are twenty silver falcons to the man with the right of it. Magadan pushed his floppy, wide-brimmed hat back on his head though he took care to keep it over his horns. This hat? None other, said the merchant. Magadan decided to amuse himself by telling them the truth. I wear it to hide the devil horns sticking from my brow, or some such, and that makes you both as wrong as an orc in a dwarf hold, so you can add the twenty falcons to my fee. The merchants and men-at-arms loosed raucous guffaws. How's you by the danglies there, Grathen? Grathen laughed along with the rest, even toasted Magadan with his tankard. When the group quieted, he said, Done, sir. Such some to you, or some such. Magadan appreciated the turn of phrase. He tipped his hat in salute. But the added fee only if you share a drink with us, called Tark, who had a much more commanding voice than his willowy frame suggested. You abstain with such fortitude that Noss here, he jerked a thumb at a burly man-at-arms near him, claims you're an ascetic ill maderite monk in disguise. Noss's face wrinkled with puzzlement, and he slurred through his beard. Huh? Ascetic? What is that, a drunkard? More laughter. A drink, sir, seconded Grathen, and the others around the fire nodded and murmured agreement. Come join us. Our journey is almost done, and custom demands we share a drink with our guide while still on the road. Noss filled a tankard with ale and held it up for Magadan. Magadan rehearsed an excuse in his head, prepared to offer it, but surprised himself by changing his mind. It was custom around the southern shores of the inner sea to drink with the guide while on the road, and more than that, he suddenly wanted company more than privacy. He adjusted his hat, collected his bow and pack, and rose to his feet. To the raccoons, he said, I'm away, mother. To the merchants, he said, 
I can put your minds at ease that I am no ascetic, good sirs, not by a wide margin. I've had everything from home-brewed swill and star mantle to fire wine in Westgate. But these days I have sworn off spirits. The merchants booed and hissed, but all held their smiles. You still must shed that hat, someone called. Yes, the hat! Yes! Magadan realized that his hat had become the focus of too much attention, albeit intended as jest. He had to do something to defuse the matter, or one of the men would grab it off his head as a fireside prank. And if the caravaneers learned that he was a fiend spawn, the smiles and camaraderie would vanish as quickly as they had appeared. He had seen it happen before when someone discovered his horns, or the birthmark that marred his bicep. As he approached the fire, he summoned some of his mental energy, used it to extend his consciousness, and lightly reached into the minds of the dozen caravaneers around the fire. None showed any sign of noticing. He took a subtle hold of their visual perception, pulled off his hat, and modified what they all witnessed. Instead of horns, he caused each of them to see only a smooth brow and his long, dark hair. Not even bald, one of them shouted. You see, he said, and fixed the hat back on his head. He released his hold on the caravaneer's senses and offered a lie. Neither scar nor bald head. I wear the hat because it belonged to a close comrade who fell to Knowles while we were on the road together. So when I'm on the road, I rarely take it off. Well enough? The men understood that. Well enough most said in more subdued tones, and all nodded. Two even raised a drink in a salute. Others cursed the knolls. Magadan drew tight the drawstring on the hat and took a seat by the fire. As the jests, tales, and insults flew, he held his conversational ground as well as any. For the first time in almost a year, he truly felt like his old self. He was pleased to see that his hands remained steady throughout the evening, even when his thoughts returned to the source, as they continually did. The pull was weakening, albeit slowly. As Grathen and another merchant debated the intricacies of Sembian contract law, Magadan's mind drifted back to a night long ago on the Plain of Shadows, when he and Erebus had shared a conversation across a campfire, not banter or debate, but honest words between men. Magadan had admitted his lineage to Erebus, and Erebus had admitted his fears to Magadan. Neither had judged the other. They'd become friends that night. Later events had only strengthened the bond. Magadan missed Erebus and Riven, missed them both more than he missed the source, more than he had missed the oak. He realized all of a sudden that he had been foolish to isolate himself. His friends had not judged him for being born of a devil, and they would not have judged him for his addiction to the source. He had lost himself all the more easily for not having his friends around him. He resolved to find them as soon as the caravan reached Star Mantle. His mind made up, he allowed himself to enjoy the camaraderie around the campfire. After a few hours, the drink took its toll on the caravaneers. By the time Selyun passed her zenith, the merchants and men-at-arms had begun to wander to their wagons for sleep. A few, including Tark, nodded off where they sat. Grathen stood. I'm off to sleep. Good eve to you, Magadan said. We'll reach Star Mantle in a few days. Grathen nodded and started off, but turned back to Magadan. He came close and said in a low tone, Woodsman, I've seen worse than your horns. Magadan was too shocked even to stammer a denial. He felt himself flush. His mind raced. Before he could frame a reply, Grathen went on, If a man keeps his word and cares for his own, I don't care what his appearance may be or his bloodline. There are some here you could have trusted, and we could have managed the rest. Magadan looked around to see if any of the few remaining caravaneers were watching or listening. All were sleeping, or nearly so. Magadan looked up at Grathen. 
I hear your words, he said softly, studying the merchant's jowly face, and appreciate them. But how? The merchant smiled and touched his silver cloak clasp. This shields me from whatever trick you used on the rest. A valuable gewgaw for a merchant, no? I picked it up from a red wizard in Derlin. Grathen sat down beside him. Magadan stared at him and asked, What now? Now? Nothing. You've naught to fear from me. If you wish the horns and whatever else is secret, a secret it shall remain, and I'll ask no more questions. I meet all sorts in my travels, and here's what I know. All men keep a coffer full of secrets in their souls. It's what makes us men. You are no exception to that. But I will tell you this. You must open up that coffer and show the contents to another sometimes, or it rots in you. Magadan heard wisdom in his words. He extended his hand and said, You have my gratitude, Grathen. And you have my respect, the merchant answered, clasping Magadan's hand. That cannot be an easy load to cart. Easier sometimes than others. Or some such, Grathen said with a grin. Or some such, Magadan answered with a nod and smile. Good eve to you, woodsman. Grathen said, and patted Magadan's shoulder. Remember to take off your hat sometimes. He rose and walked toward the wagons. Magadan stared into the dying fire, thoughtful, playing with the drawstring of his hat. He reminded himself that he should not always assume the worst of men. He had grown so accustomed to thinking so little of himself that he automatically thought little of others. The realization lightened his mood he resolved again to contact Erevis and Riven. Sudden motion near the oak drew his eye. The mother raccoon and her young scrambled up the tree. The young climbed awkwardly, but fear lent them speed. Frowning, Magadan scanned the area near the tree for a predator, but saw nothing unusual out to the limits of his night vision. A cloud bank swallowed the crescent of Salyun, and the drone of insects immediately went quiet. The horses and train mules, tied to the wagons, snorted and pawed at the ground. The temperature dropped noticeably. A tingle tickled Magadan's exposed flesh. He felt magic in the air. The few snoring men around the fire stirred restlessly and waved a hand in the air, as if fending off nightmares. Magadan's heart began to thump. For a moment, he feared that he had fallen asleep, that Grathen's words had been a dream, that the walls he had built in his mind had crumbled, and that he would soon hear his father see the men around the fire burst into flame. His hands started to tremble, but he steeled himself, told himself that it was no dream. He took up his bow, rose to his feet, and with difficulty knocked an arrow. The familiar movement steadied him. He turned in a circle and looked out on the plain, but saw nothing to alarm him. Just rolling grass, the old oak, and a few other scattered trees. He stepped around the fire and nudged Tark, who was sleeping. Up, he ordered. And the rest, be quick and quiet, something comes. Tark did not move. Neither did anyone else. Up, Magadan said, and knead him hard. Tark fell off his barrel. But neither he nor any of the other caravaneers around the fire stirred. Magadan cursed. Tark and the other men had been inspelled. He weighed whether to raise the alarm and tip off the attackers that he knew of their presence. He decided there was no other way. Is anyone awake? he shouted at the wagons. Grathen! His shouts agitated the pack animals further, but no one in the caravan answered his call. He was alone. Perhaps his mental abilities had spared him the effect of whatever spell had rendered the rest of the men unconscious. He licked his lips, swallowed, and focused his mind on his arrow tip, charging it with mental energy. Power filled it, and it shone red. It would pierce plate armor. Magadan scoured the terrain with his eyes. He controlled his breathing, steadied his hands, and held his calm. He drew on his mental power, transformed energy into a physical force, and surrounded himself in a translucent barrier that would deflect incoming projectiles. 
Wrapped in the power of his own mind, he turned a slow circle and sought a target. Father, he shouted, nervous as the word left his mouth. Show yourself. A sound like rushing wind filled his ears, though there was no wind. He scanned the night for the source but saw nothing. The sound grew louder, louder, until, at the limits of his dark vision, a mass of squirming tendrils seeped into view. As thick around as the oak, as black as ink, they wormed sickeningly over the terrain. Their motion reminded him of the kraken's tentacles, of the grotesque limbs of the dark weaver that he had faced on the plain of shadows. The tentacles brought a fog of darkness in their wake. Two pinpoint pairs of light formed in the darkness above the tentacles. One pair the cold gray of old iron, the other pair a dull gold. Eyes. The rushing sound grew still louder, as loud as a cyclone. Magadan thought his eardrums would burst. The horses and mules panicked. Two snapped their lines and sped off into the night. Who are you? Magadan shouted, his voice barely audible over the roar. The tendrils drew closer. So did the eyes. Show yourselves! No response. So Magadan loosed an arrow at one pair of eyes. The missile streaked from his bow, leaving a red trail of energy in its wake. When it hit the darkness, it vanished with no visible effect. Screaming, Magadan fired another arrow, another. The rushing sound ate his battle cries. The darkness ate his arrows. The rush reached a crescendo so loud Magadan felt his head would explode. How could the caravaneers sleep through it? It was like a pair of knives driven into his eardrums. He dropped his bow and clamped his hands over his ears. He screamed in pain, but the roar swallowed the sound. Without warning, the roar ceased. But for his gasps, silence ruled the night. Magadan's ears rang, his temples throbbed. He looked up and saw that the tendrils were gone, the eyes were gone. He was alone. He looked at his palms to see if there was any blood, saw none. He almost collapsed with relief. Tark, he nudged the young merchant. Tark! Still no response. A rustle from above drew his gaze. He looked up and what he saw stole both strength and breath. His hands fell to his sides. Gods, he mouthed. The night took him. Elirul wore a false face that of a solicitous young niece and trusted political adviser to Lady Mirabetta Selkirk, and stood beside her aunt next to the bed of the dead overmaster. They had traveled by common coach rather than carriage across the streets of Ordulan, and both wore heavy, plain, hooded cloaks. After hearing what the messenger had to say, they had not wanted their passage noted. The city was in enough turmoil. All of Sembia was in turmoil. Kendrick Selkirk the Tall lay cold, pale, and very dead between his sheets. The overmaster's balding, gray-haired chamberlain, Minnen, stood in the doorway behind El Iral and her aunt, wringing his aged, spotted hands. Beside him stood the bearded housemage, Sakin, arms crossed over his ample belly, chapped lips pressed hard together. The circles under his eyes looked as if they had been drawn with charcoal, Seeing the dead overmaster for herself, Elirul felt an uncontrollable urge to smile. She masked her mirth with a hand before her mouth and a feigned cough. I have sent for priests of Tyr, Countess, Minin said to Mirabetta, to certify the death and prepare the body. Mirabetta nodded. Well done, Minin. You have sent word to Selkirk's family? Kendrick Selkirk's immediate family consisted of only his two sons, Miklos and Kavel. His wife had been dead almost a year. Minin fiddled with the flare at the end of his shirt sleeve. I have dispatched messengers, but contacting Miklos or Kavel is always difficult, as is their wont. They are away from Ordulin. No one seems to know their current location. That is why I hurried a messenger to your estate, Countess. You are the Overmaster's cousin, 
his only family in Ordulin. Despite your... He cleared his throat and looked embarrassed. Political differences. You must speak for the Overmaster's needs until his sons arrive. Mirabetta and Elyral shared a glance, and Elyral could read her aunt's mind. If the Overmaster's sons arrive. No doubt it amused Mirabetta that Kendrick Selkirk's body and estate were in her charge, if only temporarily. Most of Ordulin saw Mirabetta as a respectful rival of Kendrick. El Iral knew better. Mirabetta had thought her cousin little more than a weakling and dolt whose incompetence had led Sembia in the direction of disaster. Probably Mirabetta would have killed him herself if she had thought she could have avoided suspicion. The Countess ambled around the chamber, eyeing the rugs, the sideboard, the swords and shield over the large fireplace. That was well conceived, Minnen. Kendrick and I disagreed on political matters, but he was ever my beloved cousin. Minnen wisely held his tongue. Should we examine the body, Aunt? Elyral suggested, an idea born of a desire to provide political cover for her aunt, and a desire to touch something dead. The old chamberlain looked appalled. Why, mistress? Before Elyral could answer... Sakin unfolded his arms and said to Mirabetta, There is no sign of violence, Countess. The wards on the room were intact, and my preliminary divinations have detected nothing untoward. The mage looked pointedly at Elyral. There is no reason to examine the Overmaster's body. A skilled assassin would leave no sign, Elyral said to the room. Minin frowned. The mistress seems to know much of the quiet arts. Elyra smiled politely to hide her hatred. Minin looked to Mirabetta. None passed this door last night, Countess. Of that I am certain. Mirabetta looked from Elyra to Minin. And I am certain of no such thing. As my niece observed, a skilled assassin would leave no sign, magical or otherwise. Elyra was pleased. Mirabetta's political instincts, honed through years of maneuvering in Sembia's capital, were as sharp as ever. The Countess did not know that Selkirk had been murdered, but she did know that she had not been involved in the murder, if murder it was. She therefore realized that she would be best served politically by insisting on a zealous and thorough investigation. She could only gain from it whether she found a murderer or determined that Overmaster Selkirk had died of natural causes. Elyra knew the truth, of course, and the secret she held made her smile. My cousin was as healthy as a cart ox, Mirabetta said. I saw him just two days ago. He showed no signs of illness. Yet are we to believe that he just died in his sleep? Men die, said Sakin with a shrug. And men are murdered. Mirabetta said with a dismissive wave of her hand. I will determine which occurred here. Without waiting for permission, Elyral bent over the overmaster's corpse, pried open his mouth, and examined his gums. Finding nothing, as she knew she would not, for the nightseer would not use poison, she peeled back his eyelids and studied the eyes. Then she lifted his arms and looked in his armpits. Mistress, the chamberlain said, appalled. Elyra let the overmaster's arm drop to the bed and spoke a lie. I have heard of poisons that discolor the skin for only a short time before all signs vanish. I do not want evidence to go unnoticed. Poison? Minin exclaimed. Sakin nodded thoughtfully. I too have heard of such poisons. As have I, Mirabetta said. Overruled, the chamberlain quieted. Elyral went through the motions of thoroughly examining the body. Touching the cold, dry flesh of the corpse aroused her, but she kept her face expressionless. Attuned as she was to the shadow weave and char, she felt the squirming, dark thing hidden within the corpse. I can find nothing, she said to her aunt, but that means nothing. Who else knows of this, Minin? Mirabetta asked. Minin answered, the messengers I dispatched, but they are all trusted men. The priests of Tyr, by now, no others. Keep it so for now, 
Mirabetta ordered. Do not let the household staff leave the grounds. All are to be questioned under spell by the priests, including both of you. Both reddened, but both nodded. Perhaps he did die in his sleep, Mirabetta said, and Illyral could see in her aunt's expression that she hoped it was otherwise. We will know soon enough. A resurrection should be attempted. I will pay for it, of course. Illyral could tell from the marked lack of enthusiasm in her aunt's tone that she begrudged the idea. She made it only to maintain appearances. No doubt she hoped the resurrection would fail, as they sometimes did. Elyral, of course, knew the resurrection would fail. Rivelin had assured her of as much. Minin said, That is most gracious, Countess, but... Speak, Minin, Mirabetta ordered. Minin nodded. I am aware of the contents of Lord Selkirk's testament, Countess. He specifically forbids any attempt to resurrect him after his death. As you know, he was a faithful follower of Tyr. He regarded his end as his end. For a moment, Mirabetta said nothing. She looked at Illyral, and Illyral felt certain that her aunt would not be able to contain a smile. But she did somehow, and returned her gaze to Minin. I understand, Minin. Thank you. Then I shall pay all costs of the investigation into his death. That is the least I can do for my cousin. The Countess, I am certain the High Council would appropriate. He was my cousin, and I will pay, Mirabetta said cutting off discussion. More positioning, Elyral knew. Of course, Countess, Minin said. Mirabetta turned to Elyral, and Elyral saw the pleasure in her aunt's expression. The wrinkles around the Countess's eyes looked less pronounced than usual. I will await the arrival of the priests with Minin and Sakin, Mirabetta said to Elyral. Return to our estate, send out messengers under seal, the High Council is to meet in emergency session as soon as possible. A successor must be chosen. Elyral started to go, but turned and said, May I offer a suggestion, Aunt? Mirabetta nodded, and Elyral spoke the Nightseer's wishes. A ruler is dead. The stability of the state during the transition is paramount. All suspicions must be laid to rest. My cousin cannot be resurrected true, but... Would it not be prudent to put questions to his body about the circumstances surrounding his death, and to do so before the High Council? Necromancy, Minin murmured. Sakin raised his eyebrows thoughtfully and nodded. There is precedent. Four hundred years ago, Overmaster Jalarbis was murdered by a mob. The questioning of his body by priests in the presence of the members of the High Council helped locate the murderer. Elyral could have hugged the fat house mage, though his words were probably unnecessary. Mirabetta would have seen the political benefit of a magical inquiry before the council. It would publicly exonerate her of any involvement and solidify her guise as a concerned cousin. Her aunt wore false faces almost as well as a Sharon. Your idea has merit, Mirabetta said. I will think about this. My cousin's wishes must be considered. Does this testament speak of such matters, Minin? Minin did not look her in the eye. It does not, Countess. Again, Mirabetta managed not to smile. Off now, Elyral, she said. As she walked to the door, Elyral noticed Sakin's ragged shadow on the floor. She could tell from looking at it that the mage would be dead within a year. I have a secret, she whispered to him, grinning, and exited the chamber. Some time later, perhaps days, Magadan could not tell, he opened his eyes to darkness. He did not feel a blindfold against his face. Ordinarily, the fiend's blood in his veins allowed him to see through darkness. But not this time. A magical shroud, then. The moist air slicked his skin. He was seated, and bindings as cold as ice held him at his wrists, ankles, and waist. He could hardly move. He remembered little. His mind felt sluggish. He tried to summon a small amount of mental energy and transform it into light, 
but the attempt fizzled. Something was suppressing his abilities as a mind mage. He is awake, said a voice. The suppression cloud is working. Then we go, said another. Before Magadan could ponder what the words meant, he felt the sudden rush of motion and the dizziness that often accompanied magical travel. It reminded him of the times Erebus had moved them between worlds by drawing shadows about them. When all stopped, he was still in darkness. A smell reached through the ink. Salt. Sea salt. He heard the telltale creak of a ship at sea, felt the slow roll of the waves. A twinge of nervousness ran through him. The smell of the sea reminded him of things he would have rather forgotten. Show yourself, he demanded, and tried not to betray his nervousness. His dry throat made his voice croak. The second voice answered, calm and cold. Soon, mind mage, the magical shroud is a necessary precaution to prevent the use of your mental powers. Be assured, however, that we can see you. Magadan struggled against the bindings at his wrists and ankles to no avail. We? Who are you? Magadan asked. Where are we? My name is Rivalin Tanthul, the voice said from Magadan's right. The name meant nothing to Magadan. Rivalin went on, and this time his voice was behind Magadan. He must have been circling him. Your name is Magadan Kest, and you hail from Starmantle. You are a fiend spawn and a mind mage. A year ago, you had contact with something that belongs to my people. Magadan did not understand. Your people? I do not know what you mean. Then he understood. A knot formed in his throat. Rivalin drew the knot tighter. We are Netherese, Magadan fiend spawn, he said. Fear took root in Magadan's stomach. The source was Netherese. Where are we? Magadan said, but he had already begun to suspect. We are on a ship on the inner sea, Rivalin said, above Sakors, above the source. Magadan was sweating. Why have you brought me here? I will not do anything for you. You will, Rivalin answered calmly, because I will make you. I am sorry, but I must. He paused, then said, The source. It hurt you? Magadan shook his head. The source had not hurt him. It had given him everything he could have wanted, or at least made him think that he had everything he wanted. And that was the problem. Once that feeling was gone, he had nearly killed himself trying to find a substitute for it. Another voice asked, How did you come to speak our language, mind mage? The question surprised Magadan. He did not realize that he had been speaking Loros. He had learned it from... Did the source teach you our tongue? The voice asked. How intriguing. What else did you learn from it? Magadan reminded himself of Sesameth the Kraken and how it had been snared in the source, made content to spend its life in useless indolence, reliving a history that was not its own. Magadan wanted no part of it. He struggled against the bonds, grunting, but they did not budge. The bonds are composed of shadow stuff, Magadan, Rivalin said. You cannot break them. You will only exhaust yourself. Magadan ignored Rivalin and struggled nevertheless. He had worked so long to regain himself. He would not lose himself again. He would not. As Rivalin had promised, he soon exhausted himself. The magic in the bonds sapped his energy. Gasping, he slouched in his chair. He prayed that the Kraken would surface from Sakors and destroy the ship, kill them all. I cannot help you, he said. I will not. Rivalin said, The source is torporous, Magadan. How did that happen? Did you do something to it? asked the second voice. Magadan almost laughed, as if he could do something to the source. The second voice said, It was attacked. You were here when it happened. I have determined that much. Answer my question. If you lie to me, I will know. Magadan closed his eyes, tried to convince himself he was dreaming, lost in a drug haze in some smoky basement den in Starmantle. 
Speak, commanded Rivelin. He was not dreaming. Not attacked, he said. Tapped. An artifact tapped it, drew on its power to serve the wizard who created the Reign of Fire. A wizard created the Reign of Fire? The second voice said, astonishment in his tone. Magadan nodded. Yes, he was from somewhere else. He used the power in the source to empower his spell. Remarkable, the second voice said. Magadan realized that he had said too much. He did not want his captors to know of the tower on the way rock. Riven might still be there. The wizard is dead, he added. I saw his body broken and burned to ash by the sun. The artifact he used to tap the source is also destroyed. He is speaking truth, the second voice said, presumably to Rivelin. Silence followed for a time, as if his two captors were silently conferring. Finally, Rivelin said, We need you to awaken the source, Magadin. Only a mind mage can do it. Only you can do it. Magadin closed his eyes and shook his head. I am sorry, then, Rivelin said, and incanted the words to a spell. Magadin gripped the arms of the chair, braced himself to resist whatever spell Rivelin would cast. Help us, Magadin, Rivelin said. There was magic in Rivelin's voice, power. Magadin could feel it pulling at his will. He fought it. No, you must. Awaken it for us, Magadin. Magadin gritted his teeth while Rivelin's bidding wormed its way into his mind. He strained against his bonds, felt them give slightly. His heart pounded hard in his chest. It will kill me, he shouted. Careful, brother, cautioned the second voice. You must do it nevertheless, commanded Rivelin. Awake it for us, Magadin. Magadin flailed like a mad thing against his bonds. Rivelin's spell reverberated through his mind, the words like hammer blows. Rivelin's voice soaked his will. Magadin was weakening. The words rang in his ears, sank under his skin. He felt himself losing, thinking of how much easier it would be if he simply submitted. No! No! Almost, said the second voice. You wish to do it said Rivelin. I can see it in your eyes. Surrender to it, Magadin. End the pain. Rivelin's words sounded so much like those spoken by Magadin's archdevil father in his dreams that they shook Magadin to his core. He gritted his teeth so hard he bit his tongue. The sharp flash of pain and the taste of blood brought him an instant of clarity, of freedom. A sliver of mental energy slipped through the power-dampening shroud and made itself available to him. Magadan grabbed onto it like a lifeline and did the only thing he could think of to save himself. Vermilion light haloed his head, penetrating even the ink of the shroud. His captors shouted. He felt hands upon him. Magadan grinned even as the pain came. He felt as if he were breaking apart. He screamed as he splintered. Chapter 4 10 Marpanoth, The Year of Lightning Storms Kale dreamed of Magadan, though his friend's voice sounded like Errol's, the halfling boy whom Kale had saved almost two ten days earlier. Kale watched, frozen, as Magadan slipped into a dark void, screaming for help. Kale forced himself from his paralysis. Shadow stepped to the edge of the void, dived for Magadan's outstretched hand, and barely caught it. He seized a firm grip, then saw that Magadan's fingernails had turned to black claws, and that his eyes, ordinarily colorless but for the black pupils, were golden. Startled, he lost his grip. Magadan disappeared into the shadows, screaming. Kale shouted after him, Mask! Mask! But there was no answer. Magadan was gone. The roll of distant thunder woke him. He lay on his back in bed, heart racing, and stared up at the log crossbeams of the cottage, barely visible in the dark. The dream had set his heart to racing. He had called Magadan by the name of his god. The realization unsettled him. 
Mags? He projected tentatively. As a mind mage, Magadan had easily contacted Kale through dreams before. No response. Just a dream, then. He exhaled slowly and calmed himself. The deep of night surrounded him. He found comfort in the darkness. A distant lightning flash lit the room and pasted shadows on the walls. Kale sensed every one of them, knew every one of them for the instant of their existence. Midnight was near, he knew. The Chosen of Mask always knew when the Shadow Lord's holy hour approached. He had been asleep only an hour, perhaps two. He had not even bothered to change his clothing before getting into bed. The stink of another night's travels, another night's killings, clung to his clothes. Vara lay beside him, warm, soft, human. Her even breathing steadied his jumbled mind. He often lay awake through the night and listened to her breathe, watched the rise and fall of her breast. Since his transformation into a shade, he needed less and less sleep. But he always needed warmth. He always needed someone near him to remind him that he was still human, at least in part. He drew the night about him and moved his body instantly across the room into the darkness near the shuttered window. Vara stirred slightly at his sudden absence but did not awaken. Thunder rumbled again in the distance, the deep-chested growl of a beast. A storm was coming, a big one. It had been a long while since they had seen rain. In silence, Kale lifted the latch on the window shutters and gently pushed them open. Moonlight spilled into the cottage, its touch nettled Kale's flesh. Tendrils of darkness swirled protectively across his skin. A cloud bank loomed in the distance, bearing toward the cottage, devouring the stars as it came. Lightning split the sky, and its afterglow limbed the clouds with a purple cast. Kale thought it ominous. Thunder quickly followed, and Kale fancied the thunder had a voice. Everything dies, it rumbled. He searched the sky for Selyun and found her hanging low in a half circle over the top of the forest, trailing the glowing cascade of her tears. Kale could not look at the tears without thinking of Jack. Just about a year ago, he had seen the most powerful wizard he'd ever known pull one of the tears from the outer darkness and use it to eclipse the sun. In the end, the wizard's reasons for doing so had been small ones, human ones, though the wizard had been far from human. Kale almost admired him for his reasons, but the admiration had not kept Kale from killing him, because the wizard's small reasons had led to the death of Kale's best friend. Thunder rolled, soft, threatening, and mocking. Everything dies. The memory of those days darkened Kale's already somber mood. The night answered his emotions and the air around him swirled with black tendrils. Behind him, Vara turned in her sleep. I still blame you, he whispered to Mask. When he looked back on the events involving the wizard, Kale saw the Shadow Lord's manipulation in all of it. Through his scheming, Mask had managed to steal an entire temple of Cyric. The whole plot had been little more than divine burglary, petty theft, and it had cost Kale his humanity and Jack his life. Kale could not forgive Mask for exacting so high a price. Before Jack had died, Kale promised his friend that he would try to be a hero. He had saved Errol and the halfling village, had done similar deeds throughout upcountry Sembia for months. But it did not feel like enough. He did not feel like himself. He missed his friends, missed something he could not articulate. He looked out on the dark forest meadow. An elm of middling size dominated the oval expanse of low browning grass. Patches of wild flowers, mostly purple snaps, daisies, and ladies' slipper, dotted the meadow. Vara had tried transplanting the wild flowers into a more orderly arrangement, but the flowers she moved invariably died. Despite the strange weather and lack of rain, 
Vara had managed to grow a thriving vegetable garden of cabbages, turnips, carrots, and beans. At Kale's request, she also grew pipeweed. Large stones from the nearby stream walled the vegetable garden to keep the rabbits at bay. The garden did not produce enough to live on, but Vara supplemented their needs with monthly trips to a nearby village, though she had been returning with less and less of late. A table and two chairs sat under the elm. Kale had made them from forest deadwood. Not bad work. Vara loved to sit in the shade of the tree and watch the flowers in the sun. She had come out of the darkness of Skullport and made the forest cottage and sun-drenched meadow in upcountry Sembia her home. Kale thought her amazing for that. Kale had bought the cottage and its land from the heirs of a dead woodsman. The place belonged to him, but more and more he knew it wasn't his home. He remembered words Jack had spoken once. For men like us, friends are home. Kale missed his friends. The time he'd spent in the cottage had been a welcome respite, but a temporary one. Something was coming for him, coming for him as certain as the storm. He was not sure how he would tell Vara. He looked back on her sleeping form and wondered if she already knew. Their relationship was unusual. They had lived together a year, but Kale knew little about her past and made a point not to ask. She, in turn, respected his privacy in the same way. They shared a home, a bed, their bodies from time to time, but little else. Kale cared for her deeply, and she cared for him. But he knew he could not stay with her much longer. He ticked the moments away as midnight drew closer. When Mask's holy hour was imminent, he let the shadows in the meadow steal into his mind and willed himself into the darkness under the elm near the two chairs. Always keen of ear, and even sharper of ear in darkness, Kale heard the fauna stalking in the woods, the chirp of crickets, the soft coo of the nightjar that nested on the ground under the scrub, the rush of the wind through the forest. He moved the chair so he could watch the storm approach over the woods, he reached into his pocket and took out the smooth oval stone that Errol had given him. Shadow man, he said, and smiled. He treasured this stone. The clouds ate more of the sky. Thunder rumbled its promise. Kale ran his thumb over the smooth stone, thoughtful. He heard the hiss of approaching rain. The wind set the trees to swaying. Lightning cut the sky. Thunder boomed. He wondered if it would wake Vara. After so much time living underground, she still had not grown accustomed to thunderstorms. He reached into another pocket and retrieved Jack's ivory bowled pipe, the pipe Kale had taken from his dead friend as a token of remembrance. He took out a small leather pouch of pipe weed, grown in Vara's garden, and filled the pipe's bowl. He tamped, struck a tinder twig, and lit. Midnight arrived. Kale felt it as a charge in his bones. Rain came with it. A year ago, Kale would have spent the next hour in prayer, asking Mask to imprint his mind with the power to cast spells. But not anymore. Kale had not prayed to Mask or cast a spell since Jack's death. He had created his own ritual for the midnight hour. He took a draw on the pipe and exhaled a cloud of smoke. He watched the sky dance between the raindrops and stream off into the night sky. The elm shielded him from the worst of the rain, but he welcomed the downpour. It washed the stink of his travels from him. It lasted only a short time. The rain never lingered. Kale spent the next hours in his chair, listening to the wind and communing not with his God, but with his past. I do not belong to you any more, he said to Mask, and neither does the night. It belonged to the Shadow Man. I awaken in a perfectly square room. A soft red glow suffuses the air, providing light. I see no sign of Rivel and Tanthul, and I no longer smell the sea. My bonds are gone. Have I escaped? 
I remember shouting, a flash of green, but little else. My mind feels as thick as mud. I know I tried to do something to escape, but I cannot remember. How long have I been here? The room looks vaguely familiar to me, but I cannot place it. I have been here before, though, I am sure of that. The room reminds me of a prison cell. There are no windows and only a single iron-bound door. Looking at the door, I feel certain that I am supposed to do something, but I cannot remember. The lapse troubles me. I sit on the floor, and the smooth cobblestone feels cool through my clothes. My body aches, as if I've been in combat, or beaten. Have I been tortured? I have none of my gear or weapons. I wear only a loose wool tunic, breeches, and boots. Even my hat is gone, and I never take off my hat. I reach up to feel my exposed horns. They are gone. Startled, I run my hands over my brow. I feel nothing but smooth skin. Has Rivelin removed my horns and healed the wounds? I hold out my arms to examine the rest of my body. The birthmark on my bicep, the sword ensheathed in flames, the brand of my father, is also gone. How is that possible? I tried for years to efface that brand, scarring my skin in the process. Even the scars are gone. So, too, is the patch of scales in the small of my back. I feel only smooth skin, human skin. My heart races. Someone has stripped my fiendish blood from me. This is not possible, I say. You have come at last, says a voice behind me. I scramble to my feet and whirl around. I see no one else in the room. The voice sounds familiar, though, almost up here, on the wall. I look up and my head swims with dizziness. For a moment I cannot focus my eyes. I wobble on my feet, hold out my arms for balance. The feeling passes, and I notice a thin horizontal line in the stone, more than three-quarters of the way up the wall. If it were not so high, it would be a feeding slit. I move slowly to the wall, wary for a trick. Who are you? I ask. I keep my voice low for no reason I can articulate. Come up so you can see me. I will show you. The request turns my skin cold. Tell me who you are, I demand. In a moment. Come up first. I need help. Help? The word sends a thrill through me. I cannot deny someone who needs help. I study the slit. I might be able to jump up and get my fingers in it, then pull myself up. I don't know if I can make it. You can, says the voice with certainty. Do it now. Without thinking, I jump up and catch the edge of the slit with both hands. I scrabble my boots against the wall for leverage and heave myself up with a grunt. When I can peer through the opening, I find myself staring at another pair of eyes exactly like mine. Black pupils, no color. I gasp, startled, and lose my grip. I fall back to the floor in a heap. The impact knocks the breath from me. I am sorry, says the voice. I should have prepared you. Are you all right? I climb to my feet, eyeing the slit, stammering. Y your eyes are like mine. How can that be? No, says the voice. Your eyes are different. I saw them. They are green. I reel. Green? I am still groggy from the escape, or from the torture, or whatever has happened to me. This does not make sense. How can my eyes be green? Are you still there? asks the voice. I nod, though the speaker cannot see me. Are you a prisoner here? I ask. Where are we? Who are you? And why do you look like... like I should look? The speaker sighs as if a precocious child. Listen carefully. What I am about to say will alarm you. Are you prepared? I'm sweating, and I don't know why. My skin turns goose flesh. 
Yes, I lie. The voice says, There is no here, and you are not a prisoner. Chapter 5 10 Marpanoth, The Year of Lightning Storms Word of the emergency session of Sembia's High Council spread through Ordulan like a plague. Rumors ran rampant, most of them hurriedly planted by this or that member of the council. Hushed voices in taverns spoke of the Overmaster's demise and the coming power struggle among the council members. At Mirabetta's behest, Elyral had hired several trusted rumor mongers to suggest that Overmaster Selkirk had been murdered and that the nobles in service to Endrin Korinthal of Sayerb had been complicit. The Countess was portrayed as an indefatigable pursuer of the murderers. The High Speaker of the Council delayed the emergency session for more than a ten-day to allow time for the twenty-one members of the High Council to prepare and receive instructions. Mirabetta and Elyral, though impatient to grab power, used the time to good effect. They exhausted Ordulan's messengers by sending queries to fellow members of the High Council, trying to determine where each stood on who should be elected the next Overmaster. Mirabetta met face to face with seven of her colleagues. Some were coy, but for the most part, the office seemed destined for either Mirabetta or Endrin Korinthal. Elyral marveled at the loyalty Endrin commanded. Sayerb was a trade town of little significance, but Endrin Korinthal was the second most powerful member of the High Council. She did not understand how he'd managed it. Meanwhile, the Overmaster's body was sent in magical stasis to the Tower of the Scales, the small shrine dedicated to his patron god, Tyr. The state funeral was scheduled for a ten day later, a sufficient time to allow outlying nobles to travel to Ordulan to give honor to the dead. The Tyrans forbade anyone from seeing the body until the questioning before the High Council, and not even Mirabetta dared gainsay them. Sembia's High Council was at least summoned to session. The elaborate gong tower of the High House of the Wonderful Wheel, Gon's Temple, sounded the ceremonial summons. The privilege to sound the summons rotated among the faiths of the city every decade and was determined by lot. Assisted by their coach driver, Elyral and Mirabetta stepped from their lacquered carriage into the shadow of the great council hall of Sembia. Both wore elaborate, high-waisted satin gowns, the current custom of noble women in the capital, though both had selected subdued colors in order to appear respectful to the overmaster's death. They also wore small enchanted knives on thigh sheaths. Mirabetta, who ordinarily glittered like a dragon's hoard, had limited her jewelry to a black pearl necklace and matching earrings. Elyral knew both the necklace and the earrings to hold powerful, protective, and communicative magics. For her part, Elyral wore jewelry that featured amethysts set into antique silver. The purple of the gems and the black of the tarnished metal were Shar's holy colors, Elyral's secret homage to her goddess. Elyral also wore her invisible holy symbol on a neck chain under her gown. The stately council hall, a pentagonal affair, sat amid a tree-dotted municipal district in the center of the capital. Autumn had turned the maple leaves blood red. The gated grounds of the Tower of the City Guard and the impenetrable walls of the Sembian Mint, called the Guarded Gate, flanked the great hall to either side. A pair of limestone golems, chiseled to look like oversized Sembian guardsmen in archaic armor, stood to either side of the mint's eponymous metal gate. The polished limestone façade of the great hall and its five towers gleamed almost white in the setting sun. The glass dome of the central rotunda, known by all to be enchanted with the durability of steel, glittered in the sunlight. Flags flying the Sembian raven and silver flapped from the tower tops. Black pennons hung below the flags to mark Kendrick Selkirk's passing. Pairs of uniformed city guardsmen, standing at attention and holding halberds at arms, flanked the various entrances to the hall. All wore black armbands on the left biceps, 
also in honor of Kendrick. They appeared as miniature versions of the golems guarding the mint. Each tower of the hall opened into a wide corridor, which featured several side chambers and halls, and each of the five corridors intersected at the rotunda of the High Council. She had always thought the whole thing looked something like a giant five-star, with the rotunda as the hub, the five towers as points, and the corridors as legs. The carriages of the council members ringed the hall, and several hundred armed and armored guards milled among them. All wore the heraldry of one or another member of the High Council. Ordinary citizens were being routed away from the municipal district, but Sembian custom allowed each council member an armed escort of up to twenty guards, though this right had been rarely exercised in the past. Elyral noted the various tabards and recognized that the guards had drifted into two large groups, reflecting the anticipated schism in the High Council. The soldiers serving the members loyal to Endrin Korinthal of Sayerb massed to the eastern side of the building along the wide way, while those in service to the nobles loyal to Mirabetta massed on the west, on Norgrim's ride. Mirabetta had sent her force to the hall in the mid-afternoon, and they moved among those on Norgrim's ride. The two groups eyed each other. Steel and hostility filled the streets. Things could turn bloody quickly, Elyral said to her aunt. Mirabetta nodded, and the coachman pretended not to hear. A force of perhaps seventy city guards was spread throughout the street around the council hall and kept the nobles' escorts at a distance. Unlike the sentries posted at the hall's doors, Dressed in customary ceremonial garb, those in the street bore steel shields, wore chain hauberks under blue tabards, and carried heavy maces. Elyral did not see Wraithsburr, the tall, grizzled captain of the guard. The captain, it seemed, was wise enough not to wade too deeply into political waters. The men loyal to Mirabetta cheered upon her appearance, at the urging of Mirabetta's own twenty men, and Elyral's aunt smiled in response. Anything more would have been undignified. The men loyal to Endrin scowled, and a few even booed. Mirabetta only held her smile. The pair of guardsmen at the nearest doorway of the hall left their posts and marched down the flagstone walkway to Illyral and Mirabetta. Countess, the middle-aged, bearded guardsman said, snapping to attention, you are the final member to arrive. By order of the High Speaker, we shall escort you to the doors. The Great Hall has been cleared. None have been allowed within save the members and their Wolmaners. Elyral blinked in surprise. She had not heard the archaic term Wolmaner in many years. Most used the term Vigilman or Wallman instead. The custom dated back centuries when leaders were allowed only one trusted aide, their Wallman, in sensitive meetings. Wallmen were originally warriors who served as bodyguards, but as political maneuvering became more important than force of arms, the position shifted to be filled by political advisers like Elyral. The High Council invoked the Wallman rule only when a session was politically charged or involved confidential matters. My niece is my Wallman, Mirabetta answered. Lead on. The guardsmen nodded, flanked Elyral and Mirabetta, and escorted them up the walkway through the ring of guards. The two guardsmen resumed their stations at the doors, and Mirabetta and Elyra left them behind as they entered the council hall. Mirabetta quickened her stride. Elyra hurried to keep pace. Despite the countess's advancing age, she had seen well over fifty winters, a few less than twice Elyra's twenty-seven. She remained a trim woman, and her walking speed, when she had a purpose in mind, approached a jog. Their footsteps echoed off the walls of the tower's entry hall. Elyral had never before seen it empty. Usually petitioners, merchants, and minor nobles thronged the building, trying to catch the ear of this or that member of the High Council. They continued into the long-soaring hall of monuments. Towering statues carved from marble quarried in distant yawn lined the hall. The sculptures depicted every overmaster of Sembia since the founding of the realm. Plaques on the bases displayed their names. Magically colored lighting accented the statues to good effect. 
The exaggerated heroic proportions of the sculptures made Elyral think of Volumvax. She licked her lips and looked for him in the statue's shadows. Mirabetta did not look at any of the statues save the last, that of her dead cousin. There she stopped. The statue had been completed only two months earlier. Kendrick Selkirk had served as overmaster for just over three years, long enough to get his image carved in stone before dying, but too brief to accomplish anything of note. There are no overmistresses in this hall, Elyral observed, watering the seed of Mirabetta's ambition. There will be, Mirabetta said. From the far side of the hall in the direction of the rotunda came a man's voice. Gloating ill becomes you, Countess. Elyral and Mirabetta turned to see Endrin Corinthal walking toward them. The tall nobleman wore a long, ermine-trimmed blue jacket over a collared silk shirt and black breeches. Thick gray hair topped a craggy, careworn face. His overlarge nose had been broken at least once, and his beard and mustache only partially hid a ragged scar that marked his left cheek. A rapier hung from his belt, and by all accounts he knew how to use it. Mirabetta affected a smile though the hardness never left her eyes. And snide comments ill become you, Endrin, who are already so ill becomed. Endrin chuckled as he crossed the hall. He bowed before Mirabetta. It is unfortunate, Countess, that you have never turned that sharp intellect to the public good. Quite the contrary, Endrin. I have done exactly that for my entire life, and I plan to continue doing so as overmistress. Endrin's eyes narrowed at Mirabetta's naked statement of ambition, but he managed a polite nod. We shall see, he said, and turned to Elyral and bowed. Mistress Elyral, you're as lovely as ever. It is a pity you remain unmarried. Elyral curtsied, wondering as she did how Endrin's screams might sound if she offered him to Shar. It is a pity your own wife is dead, Elyral said, all innocence. Endrin started an angry retort, but a man stepped out of the rotunda and called down the hall. Father, the high speaker is calling for order. The younger Corinthal stood a head taller than his father. He displayed a stronger jaw, thicker frame, shorter beard, and no gray hair. But his eyes and nose looked so much like Endrin that he could not be missed as the nobleman's son. He wore a heavy blade at his belt, its pommel was a stylized rose, and a holy symbol on a necklace around his throat. Another rose, symbol of Lathander, the Morning Lord. Elyral hated him instantly. This newcomer's soul shone like the sun. She refused to look at his shadow as he approached them. My son, Endrin said. Abelar Corinthal. Mirabetta smiled and held out her hand, which Abelar took. He could be none other, Mirabetta said. A pleasure, young sir. I understand you were an adventurer in your youth. Elyral smiled at the contempt her aunt managed to load onto the word adventurer. A folly of my younger days, Countess. I serve Serb and my father now. And Lathander... Elyral said, and could not quite keep the venom from her tone. Abelar regarded her curiously. Indeed, I call the Morning Lord patron. Mirabetta gestured at Elyral. My niece and wallman, Elyral Hraven. Abelar's brown-eyed gaze made Elyral uncomfortable. She feared that he saw through her, that he knew her secrets. Mistress Elyral, Abelar said, inclining his head, I have heard your name before. Elyral could not bring herself to curtsy or speak, though she did force a half-smile. She touched her invisible holy symbol and resolved to kill Abelar at the first opportunity. Abelar regarded her so intently that she wanted to scream, Stop looking at me! Endrin saved her by speaking. Duty summons us, Countess. He gestured for Mirabetta and Elyral to precede him and his son into the rotunda. 
They did, although Eliral disliked having the Lath and Darien dog her steps. She looked back at him frequently and changed direction as she walked to keep her shadow from falling on him. He answered with the expressionless, knowing gaze that Eliral already despised and feared. Her awkward gait eventually elicited a rebuke from her aunt. With nothing else to do, she bit her lip and endured the Lathandarian's presence. The gilded doors of the circular chamber stood open. The low murmur of conversation floated from within. Ordinarily, city guards would have been posted at the doors. We shall see you inside, Endrin said. Father and son stopped short of entering. Mirabetta and Eliral walked through the doors and entered the chamber. Five pairs of doors opened into the room, and statues of notable council members from the past flanked each doorway. A grouping of polished wooden tables ringed the raised speaker's dais, which occupied the center of the chamber. The dais was furnished only by an ornate wooden lectern. Glow balls lit the chamber brightly. Blue and silver pennons hung from the walls. Members of the High Council sat at tables and milled about. The High Speaker, Durnham Lossett, stood on the Speaker's dais, his ceremonial baton in hand. The members' respective wallmen lined the outer edge of the room, away from the tables but near their patrons and patronesses. All eyes turned at Eliral and Mirabetta's entrance. Half of the assembled members, those loyal to Mirabetta, stood and applauded at her appearance. Mirabetta smiled politely. She gestured for Eliral to take her place along the wall while she greeted her colleagues and found her seat at one of the tables. A moment later, Endrin and Abelar Corinthal entered from a doorway opposite the one Mirabetta had used. The symbolism was lost on no one. Again, half the assembled council stood and applauded. Endrin accepted their plaudits with a raised hand and took his place at a table, smiling insincerely at Mirabetta. Abelar took his station along the wall directly across the chamber from Eliral. Eliral felt the young Corinthal's eyes on her, but she refused to give him the satisfaction of eye contact. The high speaker raised his ivory baton for silence, and a hush fell. A quorum being present, this emergency session of the High Council is called to order. Tension hung thick in the air. Eliral saw it on the faces of the assembled council members. She noticed that almost all of the members and wallmen bore blades, unusual for a session of the High Council. Word has come that Kendrick Selkirk has died in office, Lossett said, obeying the formalities. The realm is without a leader. It is therefore this council's obligation to select a successor from among its members— the dais is open for nominations. Several members of the High Council stood to be recognized, though not Endrin or Mirabetta. Custom demanded that candidates for Overmaster not speak on their own behalf. The High Speaker pointed his baton at Zarin Turb of Selgaunt and recognized him. Eliral knew Turb to be a supporter of Endrin. Turb straightened his long black coat and smoothed his full mustache before stepping from behind his table. He maneuvered his corpulent frame through the circle of tables and stepped atop the dais. The high speaker surrendered his place and his baton. I will not waste time with pontification, Turb said, bouncing the high speaker's baton on his palm. The state is without a head, and without a head the body will die. Now, more than ever in our past, Sembia needs wise leadership, honorable leadership. He looked pointedly at Mirabetta as he said the last, and several members stirred in their seats. We all know who among us can best provide that. It is therefore my honor to formally nominate Endrin Corinthal for the office of Overmaster of Sembia. The hall remained silent as Endrin remained still. Turb stepped down from the dais and returned the baton to the high speaker. As Turb took his seat, Lossett stepped atop the dais and said, Endrin Corinthal is nominated to the office of Overmaster. 
a voice vote to second the nomination. Half the assembly shouted loudly enough to make Eliral wince. Aye. The nomination is formally entered, said Lossett, and he banged his baton on the lectern. Are there any other nominees to be put forth? Three council members stood, all of them loyal to Mirabetta. And the high speaker recognized the stately elderly Grafin Distief of Erlumspear, who stepped to the dais. Grafin's slow pace and clear diction lent his words gravity. Sambia has endured many hardships recently, and there are many more to come. The rain of fire and continuing drought have brought poor harvests in the upcountry and wildfires in the west. The dragon rage brought ruin in the north. The people crowd into the cities, now havens for disease. The winter will prove difficult for the realm. He took a deep breath, and it turned to a cough. When it had passed, he continued, And yet there is more for us to endure. We know that the elves have returned to Cormanthir and propose to retake what they think to be theirs. With our aid, they have defeated the Daemon Fae. But who knows now where their ambitions will end? Cormir, meanwhile, is ruled by an unseasoned girl queen whose nobles rebel in all but name. Now, more than ever, he looked at fat Zarin Turb pointedly, stability is needed, steadiness, political wisdom. Kendrick Selkirk provided such, and so too will the cousin who shares his name and blood. I feel it is my duty, therefore, to nominate the Countess Mirabetta Selkirk to the office of Overmistress of Sambia. The High Speaker called for a voice vote to second the nomination, and half the assembled members shouted, Aye. The nomination is formally entered, the High Speaker said, and banged his baton on the lectern. Will there be any other nominees? The chamber was silent. The battle would fall between Mirabetta and Endrin. In accordance with custom, the high speaker said, we will proceed with the speaking. Who will advocate for these nominees? Almost everyone in the chamber except Mirabetta and Endrin stood to be recognized. Lossett selected one member, then another. Eliral heard at least two bells sound from the Great Hall's belfry while a procession of members rose and extolled the virtues of Mirabetta or Endrin. Not all members spoke, but enough did to reinforce what they already knew. The vote would be close. Throughout this speaking, Eliral kept her eyes on the doorways, waiting for the priests of Tyr to arrive with Kendrick's body. She knew her aunt had arranged for the body to be brought forth, and Eliral knew that Kendrick would name his murderer. She grew increasingly frustrated when the priests did not arrive. Mirabetta showed no sign of expectation or uneasiness. During a brief recess, the wallmen left their stations and hurried to their lords or ladies to give counsel and receive instructions. The vote will be close, Mirabetta said to Eliral. Inmin speaks not, nor Weirden. I have marked that. Eliral said. She cleared her throat. Aunt, when will the priests arrive with Kendrick's body? Mirabetta smiled and whispered, They are now just outside. I arranged for street traffic to delay them. Eliral could not hide her surprise. Why? Mirabetta tapped her magical earring. I wanted the arrival appropriately timed for dramatic effect. Watch, niece. The high speaker stepped to the dais and called the chamber back to order. Eliral and the rest of the wallmen retreated to their places. We will continue with the speaking, Lossid said. Before anyone else could stand, Mirabetta broke with custom and rose to be recognized. A surprised murmur ran through the assembly. The high speaker appeared momentarily discomfited by Mirabetta's unexpected action, but recovered himself. 
Countess Selkirk, you wish to speak? Mirabetta stepped out from behind her table and strode to the speaker's dais. She put her hands on the lectern and affected a look of dignified grief. These proceedings are premature. The overmaster was more to me than the head of state. He was my beloved cousin. The chamber erupted in shouts. Turb shouted above the tumult. His face reddened and his paunch shook as he spoke. This is most irregular, High Speaker. She must not advocate for herself. It is unheard of. The High Speaker shouted for order and the chamber gradually quieted. Before he could speak, Mirabetta stared ice at Turb. I do not wish to advocate for myself, Zarin Turb. In fact, I am withdrawing my nomination. She paused to let the surprised glances and gasps circle the room. Eliral noticed Weirden and Immin paying close attention. Mirabetta continued, Even if this council deems me fit to hold the office of Overmistress, I could not accept it until the questions surrounding the death of my cousin are answered. No one dared take issue with Mirabetta's words. Eliral smiled, understanding at last, as her aunt continued. I... She shook her head. No, not just I, but none of us can look to the future until we have answered fully the questions of the past. Rumors swirl through the capital. Can a new overmaster take office with such a cloud hanging over Ordulin, over Sembia? This matter must be put to rest fully and finally, and that should happen before the entire High Council. Let us put all rumors to rest— only then should we proceed with an election. As if summoned by her words, the awaited procession of priests arrived. All heads turned. Quiet fell. The Tyran High Lord Abbot, Feldenor Jem, entered first. A white sash cinched his deep blue robe, which featured a scale embroidered in gold on his chest. He wore a white linen glove on his left hand and a glove of black leather on his right. Elidrol knew the latter symbolized Tyr's missing right hand. Enter, High Lord Abbot Jem, Mirabetta said. Jem nodded and announced, The Justicar's eyes are upon this assembly. Let none speak falsely. Several members of the High Council raised their right hands and spoke the ritual answer. For truth is the tool of the just. Mirabetta's voice was loudest, her hand held highest. Elyral appreciated the irony. A group of six junior Tyrans followed the high priest into the chamber. They too wore the blue robes and black and white gloves of their faith, and a war hammer hung from each of their belts. They bore Kendrick's body atop a railed wooden platform. A blue shroud covered the corpse. Your timing is impeccable, Endrin said to Mirabetta, and suspicious. Mirabetta managed to look hurt rather than angry. I arranged for my cousin's body to be brought before this council, but that is a surprise to none. The High Speaker approved it. The truth must be known to all of us. Would you object to the questioning, Endrin Corinthal? Endrin frowned and sat down. Of course not. I presume none object, Mirabetta asked, and accepted the silence as acquiescence. Ascend the dais, please, High Lord Abbot. The Tyrans walked solemnly through the chamber. The members watched them pass. Mirabetta stepped off the speaker's dais and returned the baton to the High Speaker. The junior Tyran priests lowered the platform to the dais and stepped away. High Lord Abbot Jem ascended the dais and stood over the body. He offered a prayer and addressed the High Council. Speaking with the dead is rife with uncertainty. It is not the ghost of the dead who speaks, but a ghost of the ghost, the bit of memory that remains with the body while the soul goes to its reward or punishment. At times the answers given are unclear. 
Sometimes no answers are given, but when they are given, they are truth. He eyed each member of the ruling body in turn, then said, With that caution, I proceed. The members rose from their tables and crowded around the dais. Even the wallmen stepped forward, though custom forbade them from leaving their posts. Eliral saw Abelar watching the proceedings with care, his brow furrowed. He sensed her looking at him and met her eyes. She looked away. The High Lord Abbot peeled back the shroud on Kendrick's body. The Overmaster wore only a loincloth. The appearance of his pale body elicited an audible gasp from the council. Eliral grinned, but wiped the smile away when she noticed Abelar's eyes still upon her. The High Lord Abbot kneeled and put his hand on Kendrick's brow. Holding his holy symbol, a shield-shaped gold medallion embossed with tears' scales, he began to cast the spell. His voice boomed through the otherwise silent chamber. Power gathered with each word uttered by the priest. The Overmaster's flesh began to glow violet. The members of the High Council, all of them worldly and accustomed to magic, nevertheless stared wide-eyed at the spectacle. The rhythm of the abbot's cadence sharpened as the spell progressed. His voice grew louder, the violet glow around the body intensified, flared. The high lord abbot commanded the body to answer his questions. Everyone leaned forward, straining to see. The overmaster's eyelids opened to reveal orbs as black as squid ink. I hear the voice, but its words make no sense. What do you mean there is no here? That's nonsense. The voice says through the slit, There is no time for this. He does not have much time. He has already awakened it and is losing himself even now. You feel as if you need to do something, yes? The hairs on my neck rise. My heart beats so hard I can scarcely breathe. Who, who do you mean by he? You feel as if you must do something, do you not? Answer the question. I back away from the wall but cannot take my eyes from the slit. How can you know that? Who are you? What are you? I am another piece of the same core, the voice answers. That does not make sense to you, I know. I nod, but feel silly for doing so. The speaker cannot see me. Or can he? The voice goes on. We are personality shards. You and I are all he could spare. I shake my head in denial. I feel dizzy again. I cannot breathe. Who is he? I manage, and desperation seeps into my tone. Who is he? He is Magadan, the core, the whole. I am his courage, blended with some of his intellect. You are mostly his sense of duty. My legs give out under me, and I sag to the floor, shaking my head over and over again. This cannot be. That's not possible. That is not possible. The voice goes on, unrelenting. It is not only possible, it is, and it is the only thing that makes sense. You know that. Here's your charge. Go to the wall. Find the rest of us. Inexplicably, the words send a thrill through me. I know with certainty that going to the wall is exactly what I am supposed to do. You are trying to understand, the voice says. It's difficult, I know. Stop and evaluate your response to my request. I charged you to go to the wall, and you felt complete the moment I tasked you. Did you not? No. Yes. Yes, because you are his sense of duty. Fulfilling tasks is why you exist. Go to the wall and find the rest of us. That is your duty. My response bursts out before I can think. Where is the wall? Out there, beyond the door, the voice says. 
You must break through the wall. Part of us is behind it, untouched by the source, untouched by the magic of our captors. Make it contact Erevis or Riven. The names Erevis and Riven trigger a memory. I cannot remember details, but I know I have done my duty by them. I know just as certainly that they have done their duty by me. They are my friends, my comrades. And I know something else. The voice is telling me the truth. I stand, nervous, but resolved to fulfill my duty. How do I break through the wall? The voice is quiet for a moment, then says, I do not know. You must find a way. And what lies behind the wall is dangerous. But there is no choice. You must do it to save all of us. I say, Come with me. If it's dangerous, two will accomplish what one cannot. I cannot. Why? I told you. I am courage. I must stay with him. He needs me more. But why me? Courage says, Because you are the strongest of us. You always have been. The words fortify me. I am strong. You said there is no here. What did you mean? Where is this place? It is not a where, but a what. A thought bubble. A microcosm of his mindscape. Go to the wall. Get through it. Find that part of us that is on the other side and force it to call our friends. I nod, but I look uncertainly at my empty hands. I have no weapon. Yes, you do. You are a weapon. And you must hurry. We will all be lost in the source if you do not hurry. What is the source? Saying the word makes me uneasy. It echoes in my mind. The voice does not answer. Are you there? No response. I listen to the silence for a moment before I listen to myself. I know what I must do. I walk across the room and put my hand to the door handle of the cell. It turns silently, and I push it open. Chapter 6 10 Marpanoff, The Year of Lightning Storms The members of the High Council crowded in close, craning their necks to see. The dead black eyes of the Overmaster stared up at the Rotunda Dome. The High Lord Abbot began his questions. Are you Kendrick Selkirk, once Overmaster of Sambia? The body's mouth opened and said in a broken tone, Yes. Elyral smiled, knowing that Nightseer Rivelin had made a flesh puppet of the Overmaster's body. She did not know what shadow creature was speaking through his lips, but she knew it was not the spirit of Kendrick Selkirk. Were you murdered? Jem asked. Silence for a moment, then... Yes. The chamber erupted in conversation. The wallman started forward but stopped when the High Lord Abbot raised his hands. Silence fell anew. The tension in the room made Elyral giddy. Do you know who did this deed? Yes. Another rustle ran through the chamber. Nervous eyes glanced about. Hands went to blade hilts. Elyra licked her lips with anticipation. Mirabetta eyed the corpse the way she might a trove of gold. The High Lord Abbot looked out on the assembly. Perhaps this question would be better asked in the presence of Wraithspur and the city guard. Ask him. Mirabetta said hotly, waving him on. Do it now, High Lord Abbot. The council holds power in this city and this nation, not Wraithspur. The priest knew better than to challenge Mirabetta. She had too many political weapons with which she could destroy his church, from increased taxation to revocation of the Tyran's land charter. He swallowed and nodded. Who murdered you, Overmaster Kendrick? The corpse stiffly turned its head and fixed the council with its dark-eyed glare. The flaccid lips labored, but the words were clear enough. 
Agents of Endrin High Corinthal tainted my final meal with an untraceable magical poison. Endrin Corinthal murdered me. Eliral almost danced while the chamber exploded into shouted accusations and counter-accusations. Mirabetta could not stop smiling. The members of the council jostled, pushed, shouted into one another's faces. Endrin Korenthal screamed denials, his face red as an apple. A lie! That is a lie! Mirabetta swallowed her smile and took full advantage of her gift. You are a murderer, Endrin Korenthal, she shouted, standing behind the High Lord Abbot and pointing her finger at Endrin. Name those whom you employed to perform this dark deed. Elyral glanced at Abelar, who looked on with shock. A lie, Endrin answered. Arranged by you. A melee broke out among several members and knocked Zarin Turb to the floor. Without warning, Weirdin Kost drew his blade and charged Inman. Other members responded by drawing their own steel, and the chamber erupted into a chaos of screams, shouts, and swinging swords. The underpriests swarmed the dais to protect the body and their high priest. The wallmen drew weapons and rushed into the melee. Abelar ran headlong for his father into the confused combat of swinging fists and blades. Rising to his knees, an enraged Zarin Turb pulled a thin wand from his jacket and discharged a bolt of lightning that cut a swath through the chamber, knocking several members to the floor. A longsword severed Turb's wrist, and the wand skittered across the stones. Zarin screamed for aid, clutching the bleeding stump. Someone kicked him in the temple, and he toppled to the floor. Elyral sprinted to the nearest door and shouted down the hall, Guards! Guards to the council chamber! The high council is attacked! She did not wait to determine whether she had been heard. Instead, she whispered a hurried imprecation to Shar, charged her hands with dark, poisonous magic, and turned back to the combat to see a likely target. Abelar Cornthal stood before his father with his blade at the ready and the rosy glow of protective magics surrounding him. The pair was backing out of the chamber. Elyral guessed that Abelar was either a priest or Templar of the Morning Lord. Mirabetta lurked in safety beside High Lord Abbot Jem. Within a circle of the six junior Tyrans who ringed his dais, warhammer swinging. Both her aunt and Jem were shouting into the melee, but their words were drowned out by the combat. The high speaker futilely shouted for a return to order. Elyral spotted Zarin Turb on the floor. He lay senseless in a pool of his blood, and his wallman was not nearby. Elyral pushed through the chamber, avoiding the blades, and knelt at Turb's side. She made the motions of trying to stanch the blood from his severed wrist, but she actually discharged the magical poison of her spell into his veins. He died instantly, and his support for Endrin Korenthal died with him. Elyral watched his spirit exit the body and streak through the roof. She stood and backed away from Turb. She caught sight of Abelar pulling his protesting father toward an exit. She put her hand to her holy symbol, whispered an imprecation to Shar, and surreptitiously pointed a finger at the Corinthals. Instantly, a swirling, life-draining cloud of black mist took shape around them. Endrin Corinthal shouted and flailed against the darkness as it engulfed him and his son, drank their life forces. The rest of the High Council had little time to pay heed to the fate of the Corinthals. Steel was flying in the rotunda. Elyral smiled as she thought of the husks her spell would leave behind, but the mirth vanished when a rose-colored light flared and annihilated her cloud of darkness. The light emanated from a holy symbol in the hand of Abelar Corinthal. He held his weakened father with one arm and his holy symbol high with the other hand. His gaze fell on Elyral, and his eyes narrowed. Elyral saw in his face that he knew she had cast the spell. She smiled and paid him his overdue curtsy. He said something to his father, lowered him to the floor, and started across the rotunda for her, smashing with his sword hilt any who got in his way. A rosy glow surrounded him. 
Elyral put her hand to her invisible holy symbol and snarled. She welcomed the chance to... The sound of a horn interrupted Avalar's advance, and a score of city guards burst in from two of the entrances. They shouted for order and bashed indiscriminately with their shields. Avalar shot Elyral a final glare and retreated to his father's side. In moments, the guards had quieted the melee. The members and their wallmen stared at one another, gasping for breath. Weapons hung loosely in numb hands. Zarin Turb lay dead. Grafin Distief sat on the floor clutching his chest, but still alive. Inman Dosser's dead body lay blackened and smoking from Zarin's lightning bolt. Four wallmen lay dead. What have we done? asked Vens Durstel of Derlin. Blood stained his sword. Inmin drew first, exclaimed Weirden Cost. That is not true, said Abelar Corinthal from near the door, his voice preternaturally calm. You drew steel first, Weirden Cost. While Cost sputtered, High Speaker Lossett stepped atop the dais. Stopping beside Mirabetta, he dabbed at his bleeding nose. That is enough, he shouted, his voice muffled by a handkerchief bunched around his nose. This will be sorted in due time. He eyed the rotunda, the fallen council members. Gods, look at this! What will the people say? The people should never hear of it, Mirabetta said, pointing her finger at Endrin. You are responsible for this, Endrin Corinthal. Endrin shook his head, apparently too drained from Elyral's spell to speak for himself. A cut above his right eye would not stop bleeding. Abelar spoke a word and touched his fingertips to his father's face. Endrin's wound closed immediately, and the color returned to his face. Abelar looked across the chamber at Mirabetta. You are responsible for this, Countess. You and your foul niece. Elyral feigned a gasp. Abelar continued. Your niece summoned that dark cloud to try to kill my father, and you inflamed the High Council's passions with theatrics. The two of you arranged for this lie to be spoken. Mirabetta scowled. Your mind is addled, Abelar Cornthal. My niece is incapable of casting spells. And it was not I, but the Overmaster's corpse that named your father a murderer. You defame two members of my family in a single stroke while you cradled the head of a murderer. My father is not a murderer, Avalar insisted, anger in his eyes. It is a lie. Your lie. Some of those allied with Endrin murmured agreement. Hands tightened around hilts. The High Lord Abbot cast the spell himself, Mirabetta said. Will you gainsay the priests of the Justicar? Abelar stood and pointed his sword at Mirabetta. I would gainsay you, Countess. Who has more to gain from my father's fall than you? He looked to the other members of the High Council. There is dark magic afoot here. Yes, Mirabetta said. There is dark magic afoot, and with it, your father murdered my cousin. Do not believe her, Abelar said to the members. You know my father. He is an honorable man. He murdered no one. Mirabetta's face flushed when several of the members nodded. She turned to the priest. Hi, Lord Abbot. Can you use your spells to detect a lie? Jem nodded. Please do so, Mirabetta ordered, and ask whether I had anything to do with the Overmaster's death and whether I had anything to do with his naming of Endrin as his murderer. Jem looked at Endrin and Abelar, at Mirabetta, at the council members. The high speaker nodded. Jem grasped his holy symbol and intoned a prayer to Tear. When he finished... A nimbus of pale light extended outward from him. Mirabetta stood within its glow. None may lie within this light, Jem said. He looked Mirabetta in the face. Mirabetta Selkirk, did you murder over Master Kendrick Selkirk either directly or through an agent? Mirabetta let the question hang for a moment before answering. No, I had nothing to do with it nor with perpetrating a fraud in this chamber, as Abelar Corinthal contends. Jem nodded. She speaks truth. 
a susurrious rustle moved through the council and the assembled guards. What of her niece, Abelar said. Put the question to her. Eyes turned to look at El Iral. My niece is not involved in this, Mirabetta said. El Iral stood up straight and stepped forward. It is all right, aunt. I have nothing to hide. She picked her way through the crowd and stepped within the Tyran's light of truth. Jem said, Eliral Craven, did you murder Overmaster Kendrick Selkirk either directly or through an agent? Eliral shook her head. No, I was not involved. Jem nodded again. She too speaks truth. A rush of conversation filled the chamber. Eliral smiled at Abelar. Spells can be fooled, Abelar stated. And so can sons, Mirabetta said. Abelar stared cold rage at Mirabetta. I know what you are, Countess. You and your niece. You will not succeed with this. Mirabetta smiled politely. What we are, Abelar Corinthal, are servants of Sembia, both of us. But you, you are the son of a murderer and traitor. She gestured at the city guards. Take Lord Corinthal into custody. The assembly erupted into protests and calls of support. The guardsmen looked at one another nervously. Still weakened from Eliral's spell, Endrin pulled himself up with aid from his son and spoke on his own behalf. You do not speak for the High Council or the city, Mirabetta Selkirk. Mirabetta's smile never wavered, though her eyes hardened. Without taking her gaze from Endrin, she said to Lossett, High Speaker, I demand a voice vote on the election of an overmaster of Sembia. The chamber erupted. Blades came up anew. Guards rushed forward and disarmed the council members and their wallmen, all but Abelar, who refused to give up his blade, and none dared insist. Countess, I am not certain that— Lossett began. I second the demand— Graffin Distief said. Mirabetta raised her hands to calm the brewing tumult and said, The vote will be to appoint an overmaster for a limited term until representatives for the vacant seats, she glanced at the bodies of Zarin and Inman, can be filled. The appointment shall be valid for nine ten days. Then a new election will be held. The majority of the members murmured acceptance. Even Lossett said, a reasonable course, Countess. The high speaker called for a new nominee while the priests of Tyr healed the wounded. No one was nominated. Endrin refused to allow anyone to stand as his proxy, contending the vote was illegitimate. Mirabetta was left as the only candidate. Lossett called for a voice vote, and Mirabetta was elected temporary overmistress by a slim majority. Endrin and his two closest allies abstained. So noted, said the High Speaker. By action of the High Council, Mirabetta Selkirk is hereby temporarily appointed to the office of Overmistress of Sembia for the next nine ten days. The proclamation will go out this evening. Mirabetta eyed Endrin. The elder Cornthal must have known what was coming. He struck a dignified pose as Mirabetta spoke. Endrin Corinthal, you are hereby placed under arrest as a suspect in the murder of Kendrick Selkirk. No, Abelar said, brandishing his blade. Rosy light emanated from its edge. If Abelar Corinthal interferes, arrest him too, Mirabetta said. Five guardsmen hefted their maces and moved toward the Corinthals. Endrin put his hand on his son's shoulder and guided his weapon downward. No, Abelar, not this way. You are not a murderer, Abelar said, his eyes fixed on the advancing guardsmen. Endrin eyed Mirabetta. No, and I will be exonerated. Mirabetta only smirked. Abelar looked into his father's face. Endrin nodded, smiled, and Abelar sheathed his blade. Eliral clucked her tongue with disappointment. She had hoped to see Abelar bleed. Another supporter of Endrin, Herlin Sambruar of Erlumspear, said, 
There are over 200 citizens on the street outside who will not countenance this, Mirabetta. This is a transparent grab for power. Before Mirabetta could answer, Endrin shook his head. No, Herlin, we will not turn Ordulin into a battlefield. Unlike the Countess, I value our nation too highly as to so casually risk its good order. High Speaker, I demand that the High Council call a moot for the purpose of electing the next Overmaster at the end of Mirabetta's term. Eliral scowled. So did Mirabetta. A moot would turn the Council of Twenty into an assembly of seventy or more. Such a gathering would frustrate all of Mirabetta's plans. You are in a position to demand nothing, Endrin Corinthal, Mirabetta said. The High Council has not called a moot of the nobility in over three hundred years. The point of the representative body is to avoid the need for moots. Endrin stared at Mirabetta. And it has failed. Ordulin has become an insular hive of political backbiting, of grasping politicians who look to their own interests before those of the state. New blood and new perspectives are what the nation needs. I will accede to this arrest, to house arrest, at my tall house in Ordulin, if and only if my son is left free and the High Council issues a summons for a moot, the next permanent overmaster must be elected by the nobility at large, not by this council. Seconded, shouted Herlin. A voice vote on the question of a moot, High Speaker. Lossett, a compromising man by nature, called for the voice vote over Mirabetta's protest. Apparently ready to push the responsibility of electing the next overmaster upon all of Sembia's nobility, every member of the High Council voted for the moot. When Mirabetta saw this, she withdrew her protest and voted in favor of it. But Mirabetta still had the final word. By order of the overmistress, Mirabetta said to the guard and pointed at Endrin, take the murderer into custody. Endrin whispered urgent instructions to Abelar, who nodded while staring daggers at Mirabetta and Illyral. Kale dreamed of spirits writhing in pits of liquid fire. Horned devils covered in dark scales prowled the pits, flaying the damned at random with sharp knives, grinning as they did their bloody work. Fire rained out of a glowing red sky. Laughter, deep and ominous, boomed over the screaming. Kale found the laughter familiar, but he could not place it. Help me! a voice said. Cal could not tell if the request was a plea for rescue or an invitation to assist with punishing the damned. Help me, Erevis, said the voice. Cal recognized it then. Magadan? Before Magadan could answer, something dark and large and terrible entered the dreamscape. The glowing sky dimmed. Damned and devil alike cowered as a shadow fell over the land. Father, Magadan's mental voice said, and Kale felt the presence of an entity as ancient as the universe. The power of it stripped him to his core. He wanted to run, to hide, but there was nowhere for him to go. He knew the entity's name. It was none other than Mephistopheles, Magadan's father. He is mine the archdevil said, and his voice made Kale's ears bleed. Kale awoke to Vara shaking him. He opened his eyes to find shadows pouring from his flesh, swarming the bed. Vara was shrouded in darkness, screaming his name. Erevis! Erevis! Kale's heart pulsed in his ears. Sweat soaked him. His head was pounding far behind his eyes. He seized Vara by her wrists and willed the shadows to subside. I'm all right, Vara. It was a dream. A bad dream. But he was not sure that was all it was. Vara stared down at him, tears in her eyes, concern on her face. Gods, she said. I am all right, he assured her. She blew out a breath, stared at him a moment, and lowered her head onto his chest. He put his arms around her, hoping she would not hear the hammering of his heart. 
and he inhaled the smell of her hair. It calmed him. The cottage was dark. It was still night, perhaps a few hours after midnight. You were calling in your sleep, tossing about, she said. The room went black with shadows. I was frightened. I shook you and shook you, but you wouldn't awaken. Kale stroked her hair absently, his mind still on the dream. His sleep had been troubled for over a ten-day. Again and again he dreamed of suffering souls, but none of the previous dreams had approached the intensity of the last. Vara, I think one of my friends may be in trouble. Vara did not hear him, or did not acknowledge hearing him. She said, You kept saying the same things over and over again, shouting them. Kale tried not to ask, but could not help himself. What did I say? You shouted about a storm coming, about the hells, and you kept repeating, two and two are four, two and two are four. Does that mean something to you? Kale felt chill. Shadows played over his flesh. Yes. No. I mean, I am not certain. Your skin is goose flesh. She ran her hand across his chest. Shadows wove around her fingers. He stroked her hair. It is nothing, Vara, just a dream. She nodded and asked no more questions. Kale stared up at the ceiling beams and pondered the dream, the words he spoke in his sleep. The phrase, two and two are four, came from Sephiris Dwendin, the mad seer of Ogma. Sephiris meant by it that there was no escaping fate. Kale decided that he had to find Magadan, his friend was in trouble. The dreams were some kind of vision, some kind of plea. Magadan needed his help. His mind made up. Kale waited for Vara to fall back to sleep. When she did, he stole out of bed and silently gathered his clothing, his boots, and his blades, and Shadow stepped outside to the meadow. As he dressed, he pictured Star Mantle in his mind, the city Magadan called home. He imagined the row of temples that stared down on the dirty, vice-infested trading hub. He pictured the rickety wooden docks teeming with goods and workers, the streets thronged with wagons and carts. When he had a clear mental image, he surrounded himself in shadows and used them to leap across Faroon. He traveled leagues in the blink of an eye, leaving Vara and the cottage far behind. He appeared in a dark alley in Star Mantle his arrival unnoticed by any save a mangy dog. The scruffy pup growled at his sudden appearance and slinked off, tail between his legs. Kale wasted no time. He prowled the taverns, fest halls, inns, and docks. Sometimes he moved invisibly among the crowds and tables, listening. Sometimes he used coin to pry tongues loose. Other times he used threats to get what he wanted. All manner of beings filled the establishments in Star Mantle. The city aspired to become a great trading center, and so held its gates open to all. Kale questioned not only men, elves, and dwarves, but also towering gnolls, hairy bugbear mercenaries, tusked half-orcs, and squeaky-voiced goblin laborers. For the first time in months, he felt like himself, felt like he was doing what he was supposed to do. He met with no success the first night, but his dreams continued, so he returned to do the same night after night. He traveled the unnamed drinking holes that festered in the dark places along the docks, ventured into secret drug dens hidden in dank cellars near the city walls, visited the brothels where women and men went for coppers and all manner of tastes were indulged. And there, as he scraped the bottom of Star Mantle's underworld, he picked up Magadan's trail. He heard tell of Magadan as a drunk, a misthead, a babbling madman, or all three. Kale's worry for his friend grew. The Magadan that Kale had known had demonstrated no weakness for such vices. But that had been before Magadan had melded with the Source. Kale knew that Magadan's contact with the Source had changed the mind mage, but he'd had no inkling of how much. He followed Magadan's trail to Tizir, 
and there learned to his relief that his friend, apparently clear-headed, had taken work as a guide for the wagons of the three-diamond trading coster. Kale followed that trail from Tazir back to Starmantle. There he tracked down an overweight merchant named Grathen, the master of the caravan with which Magadan had taken employment. Kale arranged a meeting. They met across a cracked wooden table in the Buxom Mermaid, one of the few quality inns located in Starmantle's dock ward. Kale took the merchant's measure as he sat down. Grathen wore tailored breeches, a dyed shirt, a green jacket, and a threadbare overcloak that had seen much travel. The few pieces of jewelry he wore were of modest quality. Kale concluded that he was well off, but not rich. He wore a gentleman's rapier at his hip, but Kale doubted it saw much use. The man had no hardness in his eyes. Thank you for coming, Master Grathen, Kale said. With conscious effort, he kept shadow stuff from leaking from his flesh. What is this all about now? Grathen said. Are you interested in my goods? Kale casually surveyed the inn. He spotted the merchant's guards with little difficulty. Two burly cell swords in chainmail vests on opposite sides of the common room both trying too hard to avoid looking at Kale's table. No, Kale said, but I will compensate you for your time. You headed a three-diamond coster out of Tazir? Yes, Grathen said, nodding. I am looking for the guide you used. Unusual eyes? The moment Kale described Magadan, Grathen wilted and sank into himself. Kale saw the fear behind his puffy eyes. You know who I mean. Kale said softly. I can see it in your face. Where is he? Despite his efforts, shadows spiraled from Kale's flesh. Grathen saw the shadows and his eyes went wide. He scooted back his chair and started to stand. I have nothing more to say to you. Kale jumped up, grabbed him by the shirt, and pulled him bodily across the table. More shadows spun from him. Unhand me, sir! Kale nodded at Grathen's guards, who were starting toward the table, hands on daggers. Other patrons stared at Kale in alarm, though none rose to intervene. Call them off or I will kill you right now, Kale said, and left no doubt from his tone that he meant what he said. Darkness swirled around them both. No one can stop me, and I will be gone from here before you finish bleeding. Grathen awkwardly signaled his guards to hold their ground. They did, eyeing Kale coldly. I will ask only one more time. Where is my friend? The fear in Grathen's wide eyes turned to puzzlement. He looked into Kale's eyes as if looking for a lie. Apparently, seeing none, his body went slack. Friend? You say you are his friend? Kale nodded but did not let the merchant go, though he did loosen his grip a bit. Release me, Grathen said. Let me sit like a gentleman. I will tell you what I saw. Kale let him slip back into his chair, and Grathen waved off his bodyguards. The rest of the patrons went back to their own business. My apologies for the rough treatment, Kale said insincerely. He subdued his shadows once more. Grathen adjusted his jacket, examined it for tears. Accepted. A man looking after his friend, I can understand that. Where is he? Kale asked. I do not know. Something happened on the road. Kale waited for the merchant to continue. We made our camp one night as we always did. I'd gone to my wagon for sleep. I left your friend at the fire. I was awakened later by a noise. Describe it. Like a wind or some such. But there was no wind. I sensed something amiss and sneaked from my bed. That's when I saw it. Kale's fists clenched. Saw what? Something that happened to the rest of the men. Not one of them stirred. They slept right through the noise. A spell or some such, I presume. But this, he touched a silver clasp on his cloak, protects me from things of that sort. Else I probably would have slept through it too. Kale gestured impatiently for him to continue. Magadan was not affected either. 
He rose and shouted challenges into the night. I do not know to whom he was speaking. He could see something that I could not. He fired his bow into the darkness. The arrows glowed red, like they were dripping magic or some such. Finally, Grathen shook his head. It was like the night itself opened up to take him. There was a cloud of darkness above the camp. Magadan looked up at it and dropped his weapons. It descended on him, and when it lifted, he was gone. I told the men the next day that he had deserted us in the night. They remembered nothing, and I did not want to alarm them. Kale studied Grathen's face, saw no lie there. That is everything? Why did you lie to your men? Why didn't you report it to the watch? Grathen looked away in shame. I want you to know that I asked after Magadan, but quietly. I liked him, for the short time I knew him, but I did not want news of the attack to be widely known. Bad for morale, bad for trade. Trade is no excuse for cowardice, Kale said harshly. Grathen's face contorted with angry denial, but Kale's cold expression froze whatever words the fat merchant might have wanted to utter. Grathen looked away. Kale stood. He did not bother to control the darkness leaking from his skin or the contempt leaking from his tone. My gratitude for your time, merchant. He tossed two platinum suns on the table. Grathen ignored the coins, looked up at him, and said, I was afraid. So was Magadan. Any man would have been. But I hope you find him, and that he is all right. Kale heard sincerity in Grathen's voice. He nodded, turned, breezed past one of Grathen's bodyguards, and left the inn. When he found an isolated alley, he drew the shadows about him and rode them back to Vara and their cottage in Sembia, more worried than ever for his friend. I stand in the doorway, and a gentle wind carries the smell of pine to my nostrils. A stream babbles somewhere nearby. I step out of the cell and look about. I am standing on a hillside, overlooking an unsullied landscape. Conifers blanket the terrain. Ideas, dripping with promise, hang from the branches. A clear stream cascades down the hill into the wooded dale below. Thoughts swim in its current, silver and quick. I notice the sky and gasp. A translucent red dome roofs the world and defines its borders. Sharp edges and smooth, flat plains recall the surface of something crystalline. I stand inside a hemisphere, a thought bubble. I recall the words someone said to me once around a campfire. All men keep a coffer of secrets in their soul. I realize that I am standing in my coffer. Flashes of light intermittently flare within the crystal sky, bathing the whole landscape in red light. Whirls of orange and crimson slowly churn within the sky's depths. Dark, pulsing lines trace jagged paths across the glassy surface. They remind me of veins. I look away, my head swimming. In the distance, I notice the wall. On the far side of the hemisphere is a wall of black stone. It rises from the earth to the sky and curves from one side of the hemisphere to the other. The stream flows toward it. It is immense, and I am supposed to break through it. How can I? I turn, intending to go back into the cell and tell courage that I cannot do it. The cell is gone. So is courage. I am alone. Except for some thoughts. Except for some ideas. A breeze stirs the pines and carries malevolent laughter from somewhere in the distance. I reach for my blade and remember that I have no weapons. I scan the forest, see nothing. Who are you? I call. Show yourself. No response, but laughter. I have a long road to take to reach the wall. I know I need a weapon, something more useful than a club torn from a tree. 
I turn inward, searching my mind for any scrap of psychic power that I can use. I find none. I am only a piece of the whole, and the core has given me only what I need to exist separately. The laughter mocks me. I try to ignore it. Then I remember the words of courage. You are a weapon. I consider the words, and I think I understand. Reaching deep into my consciousness, I draw on my sense of purpose, the strongest part of me, ordinarily not a reserve of psychic power. But it is now, in this moment, in this place. Power sparks in my mind, sharp and bright. Not much, but enough. I pull it forth, hold out my hand, and focus my concentration. A globe of pale yellow light forms in my palm. I force my mind into the light, bend it to my will, form it to my purpose. I am a weapon. I am a weapon. A single ray of light shoots upward from the ball. I give it an edge with my mind, hone it on my will, and shape it into a blade. At the same time, I close my fist over the globe and squeeze until it is a hilt perfectly fitted to my grasp. Pleased, I smile and feel no fangs on my lips. I test the middle blade with a few practice cuts. It hums when I swing it, and it has little weight. The lack of heft will require compensation. I am accustomed to the weight of steel in my hand. I step to a nearby pine tree and swing the blade downward at a wrist-thick branch, severing it cleanly. I am ready. The laughter dies, and I take that as a good sign. I start down the hillside, following the stream. Before I have gone twenty paces, a crack sounds from above. So loud I instinctively duck and brandish my blade. I look up for the source of the sound. There is no missing it. A jagged crack mars the crystal sky. As I watch, it expands halfway across the world's ceiling. A mass of wriggling black shapes throngs the other side of the crack, trying in vain to ooze through. I do not know what they are, and I do not want to find out. I hurry down the hillside at a run, certain with every step that one of the black things would drop from the sky and fall upon me. I have a long way to go to reach the wall. As if sensing my burgeoning despair, the laughter returns, and a voice speaks. Hurry now, we are waiting for you. I stop, because I recognize the voice. It is my own. Chapter 7 28 Marpanoth, The Year of Lightning Storms Kendrick Selkirk was in the family tomb. Mirabetta was giddy with power, and Elyral stood alone on the third-story balcony that overlooked one of the stone gardens dotting the grounds of Ravenholm, her aunt's estate. Magical lighting of various hues illuminated unnatural arrangements of rocks and boulders, some of them imported from as far west as Baldur's Gate, as far east as Thay. A man-made rill cascaded through the rocks and collected in a small pool at the garden's far end. Selyun was new, banished from the night sky, a holy time for Shar's servants. Elyral often spent moonless evenings on the balcony staring up at the night, contemplating the majesty of the Lady of Loss, imagining the day when night would shroud Faroon forever. She reached into an inner pocket and retrieved the invisible disk that served as her holy symbol. Holding the symbol to her breast, she replayed the Lord Seagraph's words in her head. Follow the night seer until the sign is given and the book is made whole. As she had done so often since receiving the vision, she wondered, what sign, what book? She chided herself for such questions. Shar and the Lord Seagraph would reveal to her what she needed to know and keep the rest to themselves. 
Elirel took comfort in the belief that she would know the sign when she saw it, see the book when the time had come. Still, she wondered when the Lord Seagraph would contact her again and reveal more of Shar's plan. She resisted the temptation to commit the offense of hope, but recalled fondly Volumvax's touch, the smooth feel of his divine fingers. She felt herself flush. I will be the one to free you, she whispered into the sky. She also would be the one to sit at his hand. Together, they would rule in Shar's name. Elirel did not know how the Lord Seagraph had been bound to his realm, the adumbral calyx at the heart of the Plain of Shadow. Elirel did not pry into his secrets. She knew only that he could not leave it, not unless Elirel freed him. Until then, she would serve the Nightseer, as Volumvax had instructed her. She activated her sending ring. When she felt contact with Rivalin, she relayed her news. Nightseer, Mirabetta is installed as temporary overmistress. Endrin Korinthal is arrested and under guard. Well done, Dark Sister, Rivalin answered. Encourage your aunt to aspire to more. Elirel considered. Any grab at power by Mirabetta would trigger an uproar in Sembia's nobility. She said as much to Rivalin. Precisely. Rivelin answered. Elirel suddenly understood the Nightseer's purpose. Civil war, Nightseer? If the lady wills it, Rivelin answered. Find comfort in the night, Dark Sister. The night shroud you, Prince Rivelin. The sending ended. Elirel's heart raced. Civil war? Could that be the sign? If so, what of the book? She resolved to see it done. Her aunt's ambition could be steered, but Mirabetta was no fool. Elirel would need to be subtle. Elirel spent the hour before dinner in her chamber, inhaling mind dust and praying to Shar and Volumvax. Keffel warmed himself before the fire and watched her. The Nightseer wishes civil war in Sembia, she said to the dog. To what end? Keffel asked. His tail thumped the floor. Elirel shook her head. The night seer keeps his own counsel, but he serves Shar as I do. You serve the Divine One. Elirel cocked her head. The will of Shar and Volumvax is as one. Keffel yawned and rolled over on his side. Perhaps the night seer would not agree. Elirel glared at the old mastiff. The Night Seer will not have a chance to disagree because he will never know. Keffel closed his eyes. Of course, mistress. Are you threatening to reveal my secret to him, Keffel? Keffel did not look at her. He dared not. I serve only you, mistress. Elirel nodded. And I serve the Night Seer only until I receive the sign and the book is made whole. Shar has called me through the Divine One to a higher purpose. When Volumvax is freed, even the Nightseer will bend his knee to him. And to you, Keffel said. He licked his hindquarters. Unless you are mad, that is, and none of this is real. Elirel considered the dog's words for a moment, dismissed them as nonsense, and returned to her prayers. Later, when it was time to dine, she held her invisible holy symbol in her hand and whispered a spell that would make her words more persuasive. When the spell was complete, she went to the dining hall. There, she and her aunt enjoyed a meal of stuffed quail and roasted vegetables. Much of Sembia might suffer deprivation, but Mirabetta's fortune allowed for her and Elirel to dine well. The huntmaster took the quail yesterday. Mirabetta said, and the wine is Selgite, from the Eskevrin vineyards. Elirel nodded. Both bird and wine were quite good. This was fortunate, as the lingering effects of the mind dust made her taste buds more sensitive than usual. When she thought of Selgot, she thought of Zarin Turb, his fat body smoking on the floor of the council chamber. She giggled. 
her aunt looked on, bemused. The two mute serving girls, both the products of Mirabetta's breeding program, lingered at the walls to refill wine chalices and clear away dishes. They had polished the lacquered finish of the dining table to the gloss of a mirror. El Iroll smiled at the eyeless, deformed faces that lived in the table. They looked at her from under its surface. She alone could see them. Another boon from Shar. The nobility should be receiving notice of the moot, El Iroll said. Mirabetta nodded. Magical missives and official couriers traveling under seal would have dispatched the news to all of the major cities of the realm by the next morning. News of Endrin's arrest had no doubt also circulated quickly. Tension lay thick in the capital and would be spreading to the rest of the realm. Despite Endrin's claim that he would not turn Ordulin into a battleground, scattered street fights between forces loyal to Endrin and forces loyal to Mirabetta had left over three dozen dead. The capital borders on chaos, Mirabetta observed. Too many soldiers and not enough food. The populace is restless. Elyral sipped her wine, nodded. For years, Mirabetta had sounded out her political ideas with Elyral over a meal. The faces that lived in the table told Elyral how to answer her aunt. She looked to them for guidance, and they did not disappoint. If the safety of the capital is at stake... It is the overmistress's duty to end the threat. Wraithspur and the guard answer to you now, aunt. Mirabetta bit the meat off a quail bone. Arresting those loyal to Endrin could cause a riot. The faces mouthed a response for Elyral. Her spell made her words compelling to her aunt. Perhaps just a few of them, then. The key men, the leaders. Abelar Corinthal, for certain. Abelar has fled the city using magical means, Mirabetta said, making a dismissive gesture. He has probably already returned to Serb. Elyral vented her frustration only with a frown. She would have enjoyed arranging for Abelar to die while in custody. She hated the Lathendarian. Not Abelar, then, but the others. The guards could take them from their quarters late at night. You could also arrest a few unimportant men who are loyal to you. That way you would appear to the commoners to be even-handed. Mirabetta devoured her quail, nodded thoughtfully. The streets would be safer tomorrow if the order went out tonight. The citizens would thank you for returning the city to normalcy, Elyral said, while silently thanking Shar and the faces in the table. You could accompany the announcement of the arrests with the announcement of a new food distribution program. Extra grains could be purchased from abroad and ground in the city's mills. You could order the temples to require that their underpriests use spells to create food. The temples would never stand for such a step. They will make food for their loyal worshippers, but not for all. Elyral finished her wine. You are the overmistress, aunt, she said simply. If they refuse to comply, threaten to revoke their land charter or tax them until they accede. Mirabetta cocked her head. An interesting idea. One of the mute serving girls appeared at El Iral's side and refilled her wine chalice. The ceiling chandelier cast her silhouette on the table, and the faces sprouted fangs and tore it to pieces. The mute's shadow, silent no more, screamed as it died. Have you determined how best to control the moot? El Iral asked. Mirabetta's face tightened. There is no controlling it. I should not have agreed to it. There is no predicting the outcome of such a thing. Elyral shook her head somberly and played the fool niece. I do not understand why we have need of it. An overmistress has been selected. The moot creates uncertainty at a time when Sembia is most in need of stable leadership. Mirabetta set down her wine glass and nodded. Indeed. The faces fed Elyral her next words. I suppose there is little that could prevent the moot now. Mirabetta tore a wing from a second quail. Little. Elyral made a point of pondering. Aunt, may I be candid? Mirabetta regarded her over the rim of a wine chalice. She took a sip and placed the vessel on the table. Have you not been candid in the past? 
What I am about to say is of a different cast, Eliral said. Mirabetta studied her face and turned to the serving girls. Leave us, she commanded, and the mute girls scurried from the chamber, leaving behind the Escavrin wine. When they were alone, Eliral said, Aunt, you hold power, deservedly so. You cannot let it slip from your grasp because your election was held hostage to the threats of a murderer. The state will need you for more than nine ten days. Mirabetta nodded. Agreed. We are at a critical point in Sembia's history. My cousin and the rest of the High Council stood by in idleness while the elves returned to Cormanthir, while Cormir drifted into chaos, while the harvest failed, and while the dragons raged. They were and remain fools. Endrin did Sembia a service by killing Kendrick. Elira smiled at that. She enjoyed knowing the truth of the murder while her aunt did not. She said, And now you must do the state a service by holding power. Mirabetta nodded slowly and bit her lower lip. I confess to having similar thoughts. There are some among the nobility who would support me in such a move. There are others I could buy. I do control the treasury, but they are too few to ensure my election. Elira shook her head in sympathy. She looked up as if struck with an idea. Then why an election at all? Why not dissolve the High Council? Mirabetta scoffed. Because it will ensure a rebellion, foolish girl. Elira recognized the turned soil of the row and planted her seed. Has not a rebellion started already, aunt? A member of the High Council has murdered the Overmaster, and his men do battle in Ordulan streets. No doubt Abelar has returned to Seirb to raise an army to challenge you and free his father. It appears to me that sitting idly while such things progress is to play more the fool than Endrin or the Council ever did. Mirabetta frowned. But Elyral could tell from her tone that she was intrigued. You are venturing into deep waters, Elyral. But I learned to swim from you, aunt. Endrin's treachery provides the opportunity for a great woman to take power and make her nation great. The time for a council of so-called peers has passed. Mirabetta took another drink of wine. The High Council has ever been an ill instrument of state. Speak your mind fully, Elyral. You are holding back. Elyral rose, took the bottle of wine, and filled her aunt's goblet. She stood beside her and affected a hesitant tone. Aunt Mirabetta, imagine if some of those invited to the moot did not arrive safely because they were attacked by forces that appeared to be in service to Endrin's rebellion, now led by his son, they will be traveling the main roads of the realm. Only a modest guard will accompany them. Mirabetta stared straight ahead, and Elyral could not read her expression. The faces swarmed around her aunt's distorted reflection in the table. Elyral tried to make the course more palatable. I know that such a thing is hard to contemplate, but so too is Sembia with yet another weak leader. An attack by traitorous revolutionaries on the nobles traveling to the moot would precipitate an acute crisis. A strong leader could step to the fore, and Sembia would thank her. Mirabetta tapped her fingers on the table. The faces gnashed at her fingertips. Elyral took her seat and studied her aunt. She knew that what she proposed was feasible. Despite its size and wealth, Sembia maintained little in the way of a standing army. Small forces of Sembian soldiers, known as Helms, quartered in the realm's major cities. Their duties consisted largely of patrolling the roads around the cities and supplementing city guards as necessary. The garrisons were decentralized. Their commanders answered to the local nobility. To what end would forces loyal to Endrin attack? Mirabetta asked. Elyral waved her hand as if the answer mattered little. Perhaps they fear the outcome of the moot. Perhaps they are mad for power and are attacking those who would not join in their treason against Kendrick and now you. The minds of traitors can be fickle. Mirabetta shook her head. 
No one would believe Endrin or Abelar to be behind it. People will believe what you want them to believe, Elyral answered. The story need not be true, it need only be plausible. And it is that. Properly characterizing events is critical, but you can control that. Proclamations could go out mere hours after the attacks, blaming them on Abelar Corinthal and whichever other nobles suit your needs. Most of the rest of the nobility would rally to your cause. Given Sembia's current state, the idea of a war would terrify them. They would want it ended quickly and decisively. The High Council would beg for you to take power as a war regent. Mirabetta shook her head, took another drink of wine. Elyral could see her aunt warming to the subject. Mirabetta said, The High Council could be made irrelevant. We could hold a rump moot instead. They would elect me. Elyral finished her aunt's thought. The very existence of the nation would be at stake. Who in the rump moot other than traitors would risk opposing your election as war regent? Mirabetta looked thoughtful. None. She looked up at Elyral, her eyes gleaming. It could work. It will work, Elyral said. Sembia will prosper again when the reins of the realm are once more in firm hands. History will name you Sembia's first monarch. Your people will thank you. Mirabetta leaned back in her chair and stared thoughtfully at the ceiling. Elyral let the matter rest. Her aunt was taken with the idea, and Elyral had done as Rivelin had demanded. Sembia had been a tinderbox for over a year. Mirabetta would be the spark to set it aflame. The Nightseer would have his civil war. Another night arrived, and so did another dream of fire. Kale awoke, soaked in sweat and shadows, and slipped from the bed. He must not have been thrashing in his sleep because Vara still slept. He stepped through the shadows and into his sanctuary, the meadow outside the cottage in the dead of night. Stars shone out of a clear, moonless sky. "'Where are you, Mags?' he said, worried. Kale did not know what to do next. Or rather, he did know what to do next, but did not want to do it. He had scoured Starmantle and Tazir, but had learned nothing more than what Grathen had told him. With each night that passed, he felt more and more as if he were betraying Magadan by not turning to Mask for aid. Yet he felt that turning to Mask would betray Jack's memory, or worse, betray himself. Midnight approached, and with it came temptation. He could pray to Mask for a spell of divination, use it to locate Magadan. A simple prayer used one time and never again. He looked at his hands, at the ribbons of shadow that dangled from his fingertips. He fought the impulse. Magadan would not want him to do it. He whispered an expletive at Mask and sat in his familiar chair under the elm, surrounded by the night, one with the dark. Crickets chirped. The night jar cooed. A soft wind stirred the trees. He withdrew Jack's pipe, the pipe he had smoked at midnight for the last year or more, the pipe with which he defied Mask, holding it by the handle. He eyed it. For the first time, he put it aside unused, Midnight arrived, and Kale cursed Mask again but could not bring himself to smoke. He felt the pull of his god. He resisted, but not for long. He could not let Magadan suffer due to his own stubbornness. He snatched darkness from the air and carefully formed it with shaking fingers into a mask of shadow which he placed over his face. The shadows clung to his skin. He reached out to his god and prayed. He asked for only a single spell, something that would help him locate Magadan. Mask answered immediately, and Kale could not deny the rush he felt when he connected with his god. He felt a charge in his mind as the power to cast the spell embedded there. Mask tried to give him more power to draw Kale back fully, 
but Kale cut off the connection despite the comfort it brought him. He wanted no more than necessary from the Shadow Lord. Heart racing, breath coming fast, Kale whipped his palm through the air and smeared the darkness into a black rectangle that hovered before him. Ready, he murmured the words to the divination mask had provided. As the spell took effect, Kale pictured Magadan in his mind and spoke his name aloud. The magic went out in search of his friend. Swirls of pitch formed on the lens's surface. Kale powered the spell with his will and again pronounced Magadan's name. The lens remained dark. Kale tried again, and still the spell revealed nothing. He poured all of his desire into the magic, but still it showed nothing. Kale let the magic dissipate, disappointed and worried. Wherever Magadan was, Kale's scrying magic could not reach him. For the moment, there was nothing else to be done. He removed the mask of shadow from his face and dispersed it. Nothing has changed between us, he said to Mask, but he heard the lie in his words. Something had changed. Kale had opened a door he had closed over a year ago, and he liked what he found on the other side. Shutting it again would be difficult. For the next few hours he sat under the tree and watched the sky, trying to decide his next course. He watched stars rise and set, Hours passed, and still he came to no decision. Dawn was only a few hours away when a tickle started in his ears, then increased to a buzzing. Hope rose in him, and Kale rode it out of his chair and onto his feet. Magadin? Mags? The buzzing in his ears intensified, and Kale did not feel the telltale sensation of mental contact. Instead, he realized the tingle was the touch of an ordinary spell. His hope turned to alarm, and the names of several enemies he had left alive throughout the years ran through his brain. Darkness leaked defensively from his pores. He reached to his belt for weave shear, but realized he had left the weapon in its scabbard back in the cottage. He cursed. The buzzing grew louder, but it slowed. He recognized it as a voice speaking rapidly, ascending. The buzz continually slowed until it matched the speed of a normal voice. When Kale heard it, he had trouble breathing. He had not heard it in a long while. Mundane means of contacting you failed, said Tamlin Eskevrin, the son of his former lord. I need help. If you still love my mother, sister, the memory of my father, return to Stormweather immediately. Kale's surprise at hearing from Tamlin caused his thoughts to bounce around like crazed bees. A thousand questions coursed through his mind, a thousand memories, of Tazi, of Shamur, of Thamelin, and of Stormweather Towers. A surge of emotion ripped through him, a feeling like he'd known while searching the Dragon Coast for Magadan. He recognized it for what it was— the feeling that things were right. He started to reply to the spell, to ask for some time to consider, but realized that it was nothing more than a one-way sending that did not allow for a reply. For all he knew, Tamlin could have cast it a ten-day earlier. The magic could have been seeking Kale for days. Whatever crisis had caused Tamlin to seek him out may already have become more acute, or passed entirely. He had met his god and his past in the same night. Sephiroth Dwendin's words bounced around his brain. Two and two are four. He looked to the cottage where Vara was sleeping, and guilt squeezed his stomach. He chided himself for bringing her there. While he had never misled her with words, he knew his actions had given her a false impression. She assumed he would stay with her in the cottage, but he knew that he would not. A cottage in the forest was not where he belonged. Helping his friends, helping his family, that was where he belonged. Kale considered the implication of the sending. Tamlin had to be desperate to reach out to him. Kale and Tamlin had disagreed often, mostly over the young man's dissolute lifestyle. 
and when Kale had seen Tamlin change for the better in the months before Kale had left Stormweather Towers, their relationship had never been warm. Kale looked up at the sky and imagined how it would feel to see the Eskevrin again. He realized then that he had already made up his mind. At the moment, he could do nothing more to find Magadan, and Magadan would have told him to go help his family. He would leave at once, and after he had put matters with the Eskevrin to right, he would return to the search for Magadan. He looked back at the cottage and saw Vara at the open window. The sight of her made his heart race. She ducked out of sight, and soon a light flared in the cottage. She emerged carrying a small clay lamp. She wore only her nightdress, and the wind stirred her dark hair. The image reminded Kale eerily of the spirits that he, Jack, Magadan, and Riven had seen on the Plain of Shadow, moving through the ruins of Elgrin Faw, the Seekers of the Sun. Vara hurried over to the elm. He stood as she approached. Did I waken you? he asked. No, she said. Not you. Are you all right? He nodded, positioned the other wooden chair beside his. She sat, and so did he. He saw little good to come from equivocating. I received a message. She looked at him puzzled. A message? Tonight? How? He cleared his throat. A spell from the son of a very old friend. Vara looked only mildly surprised that Kale had received a magical sending in the dark of night. The friend you have been seeking? No, another. She stared into the woods. So did he. The distance between them was much greater than that between the chairs. What did it say, this message? she asked. It asked for my help, Kale answered. She nodded. Silence sat heavy between them. Kale wrestled with how to tell her he had to leave. Before he could say it, she asked, Why don't you share with me, Erevis? The question took him off guard. What do you mean? I mean... She trailed off, searching for words. Each night when you leave the meadow and do whatever you do, I lay awake, terrified that you won't come back. Did you know that? You have never told me where you go, what you do. Kale looked at his hands. I didn't... I thought you were sleeping, and you do not want to know. She looked at him. Yes, I do. I see the blood stains on your clothes. You try to wash them off in the brook, but I see them. I've asked no questions about it, about anything, but... She looked away. Kale said nothing merely stared at his hands as if they had an answer. Shadows slowly rose from his fingertips. He watched them drift off into the night like smoke and made up his mind to tell her the truth. He turned his chair to face her. Here it is, then. Sometimes when I leave here, I go to help some of the villages around us. She cocked her head. Those villages are days away, Erebus. Kale nodded. You know what I am, Vara. I can travel very fast through the darkness. She stared at him, eyes wide, and nodded at him to continue. While I'm away, I... He gazed into the night. Kill things. Creatures, mostly. Marauding monsters, trolls and the like. It's gotten worse of late. But sometimes people... It depends. That is the blood you have seen on my clothing. He saw the shock in her eyes, but pushed onward. They are evil things, Vara, evil men. She scooted back in her seat, as far from him as the chair allowed. He doubted she even realized it. He knew then that leaving was the right thing to do for her, too. Why do you do it? Kale swallowed. Because I promised a friend once that I would try to be a hero. It sounds absurd, I know, but I meant it. And when I do those things, I'm keeping the promise to save people. Vara stared into the woods. The world is too big to save everything, Erevis. 
He shook his head. She did not understand. I do not want to save everything. I just want to save something. I need to. The moment the words left his mouth, he regretted them. Vara's look was sharp enough to cut flesh. She studied his face. Is that why you brought me from Skullport? Because you needed to save me? Kale could not look her in the eyes. His silence answered her well enough. You don't love me? She asked softly, and her voice quavered. He did look into her eyes then. He leaned forward and took her hands in his. She was so warm. Vara, I care for you very much. I feel something between us, something wonderful. But there are things I must do, and those things stand between us like a wall. That's why I do not share myself with you. I cannot keep my promise here. It's not enough what I'm doing. I need to do more. He swallowed, then said, I felt like myself when I was looking for my friend, Vara. I was talking with people and standing in places that belonged on a street in Skullport, and I felt like myself. He felt embarrassed saying it, but there it was. She spoke in a small but resolute voice. You cannot be yourself here, with me? Kale spoke quietly. I am not a man made to be a husband, to live in a house, tend a garden. Vara, listen to me. I have fought demons, killed creatures from other planes with my hands, these hands. He held up his shadow-enshrouded hand, scarred and calloused. I watched a wizard dim the sun, then broke his body as mine broke. I am different from other men, more than in my skin. I've seen forty winters, and I will see hundreds more, thousands maybe. But who I am, what I am, was determined in a few key hours scattered over the course of my life up to now. I cannot change that. I do not want to change it. Vara shook her head. No, Erebus. Everything you do is who you are, not a few moments. You choose to focus on certain events and let those define you, but they needn't. You are more than that. Kale looked away. He could not expect her to understand. She did not know what he had seen, what he had done. She glanced up at the stars. We are finally talking to one another, but only to say goodbye. Goodbye sounded hard to Kale, but he nodded and said nothing. He could think of nothing else to say. She took a deep breath and laid her palm on his cheek. Do you remember what I said to you back in Skullport when we first met? Kale spoke nine languages, but Vara's words then, still stuck in his brain, had confounded him. Relain il nes bergis. It means, I know your soul, and I do, Erevis. I do not want you to leave, and I do not think you are as different from other men as you think. You would be a good husband, a good father. Your deeds are different, but not your heart. She smiled, and Kale thought her beautiful. You would stay if I asked you. I know you would, but you would resent me for it. I cannot live with that. Kale started to protest, but knew she spoke truth. They had never lied to each other. He would not start now. We are connected, Erevis. I don't know how or why, I just know that we are. Do what you must. Go help your friends. I'll remain here. Kale looked into her eyes. What will you do? She smiled and waved a hand at the cottage. I will keep up the house and tend my garden. I will draw water from the well and put food on the table. This is home for me now. It will not be the same without you, but... It will still be home. I am sorry, Vara, Kale said, and meant it. She smiled. Her tears glistened in the starlight. I know those are not idle words. That is why I love you. She touched his lips. 
He kissed her fingers. She closed her eyes and smiled. Without another word, she rose, pushed him back in the chair, and climbed atop him. Vara. She hushed him with a finger on his lips. He looked into her eyes and understood. They both knew this was farewell. He surrendered to the moment, wrapping his arms around her, kissing her neck. Her body radiated warmth. His radiated shadows. Her hands answered his, caressing his shoulders, his hair, the back of his neck. She kissed his ear, his lips. He slipped her nightdress over her head and ran his hands down the length of her nude body. She tugged at his nightshirt. He put everything out of his mind except her, her smell, her touch, her taste. He wanted to remember them always. She responded with the same urgency. Soon they were lost in each other, and his hands, the blood-stained hands that killed demons, slods, and dozens of men, were gentle for a time. Afterward, they walked naked to the cottage in silence, holding hands. When he entered, he took his gear from his old wooden chest and donned his enchanted leather armor, strapped on weave shear and his daggers, pulled on his boots. His gaze fell upon the book he had received from the guardian of the Fane of Shadows. He had not opened it in over a year. The last time he had opened it, he discovered that Mask had placed a black mask within it, a new holy symbol. He held the book in his hands, studying its face. He flipped open the cover. No mask. He smiled with relief and put the book in his satchel. Vara watched him throughout. Must you leave tonight? I think it is better this way, Vara. She nodded and said softly, I have something for you. She went to her night table and took something from the drawer. A piece of cloth. A black piece of cloth. A mask. Kale's holy symbol. Shadows swirled around him. I found it in the garden two days ago. The wind must have blown it there. I knew what it was, but I said nothing. I'm sorry, but I kept it for you. I've known since then that you would leave. She held it out for Kale. He hesitated, took it, and stuffed it in his pocket. It lay there like a lead weight. She looked up into his face. When I wake up, you will be gone? He nodded. I will wait until you fall asleep before I leave. I hope you will return. He said nothing, kissed her once, embraced her one last time, and she climbed into bed, into their bed. He sat with his hand on her hip while sobs shook her. He could not stop his own tears. Exhaustion eventually overcame her, and her breathing grew steady. He stood and took a long look around the cottage. He had called it home for over a year. It had been a good year. He looked down on Vara, committed her sleeping face to memory, pulled the shadows about him, and transported himself to Selgaunt back to the only family he'd ever had. Chapter 8 29 Marpanov, The Year of Lightning Storms Kale appeared where he had intended, in a narrow alley off Ronsel's Ride in Selgaunt's warehouse district. Crumbling mud-brick walls boxed him in. Barrels and crates lay haphazardly strewn through the alley. The smell of old vomit and stale piss hung in the air. Kale almost smiled at the familiarity of the odor. He glanced up and down the alley and saw no one. Hey oh, but you took time enough coming back, said a voice. Kale whirled around, jerking weave shear from its scabbard. Shadows swirled from steel and flesh. He spotted the speaker, a slim, dark-haired man with several days' growth of beard on his face. 
huddled prone against the alley wall. How had Kale missed him the first time? The man lifted himself on his elbow and peered up at Kale out of a mass of threadbare, filthy clothes and a misshapen, stained cap. Kale figured him a drunk. He saw no weapons. Kale lowered weave shear, took a few five stars from one of his belt pouches, and tossed them on the ground near the drunk. Mind your own affairs, friend. The drunk did not even glance at the coins. He had eyes only for Kale. Haven't I been doing that all this time? he asked. The man's knowing tone made Kale wary. Weave shear still in hand, Kale approached until he stood two paces from the stranger. Shadows oozed lazily from Kale's blade. How do you mean? Kale asked. The drunk chuckled and sat up with a grunt. Kale realized that the stench of vomit and piss came from the man's clothing, not the alley. Close proximity made the smell worse. Kale wrinkled his nose. Foul, eh? The man said and looked down at his clothing. Keeps the stray dogs from bothering me. The man seemed to notice the coins for the first time. Ah, he said, and all three vanished under a single deft pass of his hand. Kale could tell the man was not what he appeared. He was too clear-eyed, too precise in his movements, though Kale did not yet know whether he was dangerous. He had encountered shapeshifters before and decided to take no chances. He pointed Weave Shear's tip at the man's face. Who are you? The man seemed unbothered by the shadow bleeding blade pointed at his face. He reached up and put a fingertip on the edge. Shadows from the steel corkscrewed his finger. Nice weapon, the man said. He took his finger from the blade, produced one of Kale's five stars, and tossed it into the air. He caught it on his fingertip, balanced upright on one of its five corners. Kale kept the wonder from his face. He knocked the coin from its perch with weave shear, and it chinked on the stones of the alley. I will ask you only once more. Who are you? The man frowned at the fallen coin. He looked up and asked, Who do you think I am? Kale said nothing, though something about the man felt familiar. The man leaned over, picked up the five star, pocketed it, and stood. Why are you backing away? the man asked. Kale had not realized he was. The man smiled, nodded at the pocket in Kale's vest. Is that where you keep it? Kale's flesh goose pimpled. Keep what? the man said. The mask. Shadows swirled around Kale. How could the man have known of the mask? You have been scrying me, Kale said, and tightened his grip on Weaveshear. The man smiled and shook his head. No, I left it for you in the meadow, and you often keep it in that pocket. I do not need to scry you, Erevis. I know you better than anyone. An identity for the speaker registered, and Kale's heart thumped against his ribs. His breath came fast. Who could have known of the mask? Who could have left it for him in the shadow? You are backing away again, the man observed. Kale held his ground, his mind racing. The idea was absurd. He shook his head. He refused to believe it. The man examined his fingernails and said casually, We have not spoken much of late. Remind me again of the reason for that. Kale grasped at an explanation. Tamlin sent you to me, and you were scrying me, despite your denial. The man smiled. No, but you already know that. Kale was shaking his head. It was impossible. Impossible. Why do you not just ask me? The man said. Kale just stared, sweating. He dared not ask. He dared not. Go on pressed the man, and took a step toward him. Kale stood his ground, but only with difficulty. Ask, the man said. 
I know how you like to ask questions to which you already know the answer. Ask. Kale licked his lips, but his tongue was dry. His thoughts raced through his head so quickly they did not make sense. He felt dizzy. It cannot be, he mumbled. The man chuckled. <laughs> but it is. I am slumming, he said, as if that explained everything. Words crept up behind Kale's teeth, and he could not hold them in. He had to hear the man say it. The man smiled, waiting. Who are you? Kale asked. The man winked, and shadows engulfed him. When they parted, the filthy rags had disappeared, replaced by oiled black leathers, high boots, a gray cloak, and several slim blades at his wide belt. Kale took another step back, eyes wide. His legs gave way under him. He used weave shear to prop himself up. The stink vanished with the old clothing. The man's face went from plain and unshaven to sharp, clean, and handsome. He appeared years younger than Kale. Only his smile remained the same. Kale recognized the face. He had seen it before on a statue in the Fane of Shadows, on the statue of Mask the Shadow Lord. It cannot be, Kale said. The walls of the alley were falling in on him. I have always explained that it is possible, said the man, the god, as he dusted off his breeches. Filthy alley. He looked up and stared in accusation at Kale. I give you power to walk the shadows anywhere you like, and always you appear in alleys. Why not a bathhouse, or better still, a high-end brothel? Kale could only stare his mind racing, his heart pounding. To his surprise, the awe subsided, replaced by the seed of something else. He was looking at the god who had caused him to sacrifice his humanity, whose schemes had led to Jack's death. Anger rooted in Kale's soul chased away the fear, killed the reference. What is it? the man asked him, a puzzled look in his eye. Speak your name. Kale said, his tone hard. He wanted to hear the name aloud before he did what he had to do. Shadows haloed his body. Mask looked across the alley at Kale with a frown. You look upset. You are not still angry about Jack, are you? You know, you have never had a sense of humor. Even as a boy, you... Kale snapped like a bowstring, and once loose... His pent-up anger could not be reined. He roared, bounded forward with his shadow speed, and slashed with weave shear at Mask's throat. Rage fueled his strength. The blow could have decapitated an ogre. The god barely moved. He produced a slim black dagger from his belt and parried the larger blade with a casual air and an infuriating smirk. Now that is amusing, trying to kill your own god. Kale gritted his teeth and used his greater size to push Mask against the alley wall. Really? Mask asked. We are going to go through all this? I wasn't sure, but... Kale reached down to his belt, pulled a punch dagger, and drove it into the god's abdomen. The blade sank to the hilt. Kale stared Mask in the face. Rage made his voice growl, Never say his name. Never. Mask did not even wince. He glanced down with a surprised look at the dagger protruding from his gut. Kale twisted it. He had never in his life felt such satisfaction. Mask looked into Kale's face, and anger flashed in the god's eyes. That is overdoing it a bit, don't you think? The god covered Kale's dagger hand with his own. Kale felt the strength in Mask's grip. The god muscled the blade backwards, out of his flesh, and twisted Kale's hand with a jerk. Kale's wrist audibly snapped. Agony flared. Kale screamed. The dagger fell from his limp hand. His shadow-steeped flesh immediately set to repairing the break. Now, Mask began. Kale ate the pain, threw himself forward, and smashed his head into the bridge of the god's nose. He heard a satisfying crunch. Damn it! Mask snarled. 
he shoved Kale backward to arm's length and kicked him across the alley. The blow hit Kale in the center of his chest and cracked his sternum. The impact with the opposite wall broke several ribs and drove the breath from his lungs. Kale grimaced from the pain and slid to the ground among a pile of crates. Shadows roiled protectively around him. He breathed with difficulty through the shattered ribs. Head cocked, Mask stared at him across the alley. Surprise had replaced anger in the god's eyes. His nose was not bleeding and showed no sign that Kale's blow had broken it. Kale knew then that he could not harm Mask, not permanently, but he did not care. He lifted himself to his feet and brandished weave shear. Let's finish this, he said. Now, here. Mask studied him for a moment. He put two fingers to the bridge of his nose and tested the flesh. That was a good blow, he said, and chuckled. Kale's flesh had mended his broken wrist and partially repaired his ribs. He took a step forward, blade ready. I have another one for you. Mask shook his head and sighed. He sheathed his dagger and held up his hands in mock surrender. Very well. I will never say his name again. Well enough? Kale said nothing but stopped his advance, breathing heavily. Mask chuckled. Hey ho, but you are stubborn. You should have been Torm's chosen. A rush of emotion pulled words from Kale. I should not have been anyone's chosen. Mask scoffed, then sneered. The latter expression looked so like Rivens that Kale would have thought them brothers. Come now, the god said. You are what you are, Erevis. You chose me as I chose you. That is the way of the multiverse. How could it be otherwise? Kale recognized the truth in the words and hated it. He had chosen Mask. Again and again he'd had the opportunity to walk away. He never did. He never would. He'd left the Eskevrin to serve Mask. He'd left Vara to serve Mask. The anger went out of him. He had no one to blame but himself. Mask continued. Chin up now, priest. You have done very well for yourself and for me. And what were you before we met? An assassin dressed up as a butler, preoccupied with the petty goings-on of Sembian nobility. Now the fates of thousands turn on your actions, tens of thousands. Admit it. You would not have it otherwise. Kale did not bother to respond. Mask knew the truth of the words, the same as Kale. He could not imagine going back to his old life. He did not want to go back to it. Why are you here? he asked. You mean, why am I sullying my divine form on this drab plain in this revolting alley? In short, I was waiting for you to make up your mind. You can badger a decision as well as Tyr himself. Kale leaned on Weaveshear to steady himself. As usual, Kale said, that is no answer to my question. Mask smiled. True. Here is the answer, then. I came here because I wanted to give you something and to ask you for something. You can keep whatever you'd give me. I've had enough of what you offer. Mask said, Ah, but you have already accepted my offer. I gave you a place to put your anger. He looked down and poked a finger through the hole Kale had put in his leathers. I think that should do it. You feel better, no? Actually, Kale did, though he did not say so. Good. Now take the mask from your pocket and put it on. Cast a spell. Do what you were called to do. There is no time for your doubts. Kale thought of Jack, stood up straight, and sheathed weave shear. No. Mask looked surprised, then puzzled, then angry. No. In my own time, Kale said, if ever. You aren't the one to whom I answer. That halfling again, Mask said and shook his head. Time is running out, priest. 
your own, and that of everyone else. You will learn that soon. Kale held his ground. In my own time, I said. Mask glared at him. Who do you think you are? You are nothing more than my tool, my weapon. Kale answered the glare with one of his own, and dared speak his thoughts aloud. A bluff. You chose me, and I chose you. You said so yourself. I may be your tool, but you are also mine. I am your chosen, the first of five. I may need you, but you need me, too. Mask stared at him, clucked his tongue. Then he shrugged and tried to look casual. I will get another. The second will do. Mask's second was Drasic Riven, a one-time rival of Kale's, but now a friend. A lie, Kale said. Riven is as loyal to me as he is to you, and we are too far along for a change. As you said, time is running out. He let that sit. After a time, Mask nodded and his face softened to a smile. All right, true. I need you. But as you admitted, you need me, too. So we need each other well enough? Kale shrugged. Mask seemed to take it as agreement. Things will start happening soon, Mask said. When they do, you will be glad to be my chosen. Enough riddles, Kale said. What will start happening? Mask said, The cycle of shadows, and that is not as good as it sounds, I am sorry to say. Since this city is where you and I had our beginning, it seemed fitting that it also be where we begin the end. A pit formed in Kale's stomach. The end? The end of what? Mask made a gesture that indicated all of Selgaunt, or maybe all of Sembia. This? That? Many things. Kale shook his head. You are saying nothing. You make no more sense than Sephiris. Mask raised his eyebrows. Sephiris Dwendin made consummate sense. You know that. That is why you ponder his words so often. You know, I was much like you once, rebellious, thinking I had the right of everything. He rubbed his chin. I was more handsome, of course, and laughed more, and killed less, at least then. But otherwise, we would have been kith. The words surprised Kale. You were a man? Mask made an uncertain gesture with his hands. Maybe. More like a god who mistook himself for a man. Took me a while to see the truth. He looked at Kale and winked. That happens sometimes. Kale's breath caught. He did not know how to respond. Frightening, eh? Mask asked. Mask's meanings were impossible to follow. He could be saying one thing. He could be saying another. Kale had had enough. Ask me for what you want, Kale said. I have seen enough of you. I returned to see my family. You are seeing your family. Kale could not form words for a moment. At last he said, I mean the Eskevrin. Mask nodded. I know what you mean. Very well. Listen to me, priest. When the time comes, I want you to recover something for me. I want your word that you will do it. Kale said, Do it yourself. Mask shook his head. The rules do not allow for that, I fear. I am already breaking them, bending them, at least by talking to you in person. But things are changing, and who better to bend the rules than the god of thieves? No, you must do it for me. Your word. What is the item? Kale asked. I did not say it was an item. It is something someone stole from me long ago. You will know it when you see it, and when the time is right to take it. Kale could not help but chuckle. Someone stole something from the god of thieves? See? You do have a sense of humor. I knew it. Who took it? Kale asked, 
and thought immediately of the answer. Kessin Rell? Mask's smile disappeared, and he nodded. Kessin Rell, a most disappointing creature, most disappointing. Why should I do it? Kale asked. Do I have to say it? You will do it because you can do nothing else. Two and two are four and all that. Kale considered. Then you must do something for me. I have already granted you the satisfaction of wounding me. I want something more, Kale said. You have been too long among Sembians, Mask said. You haggle even with your god. Kale waited. Mask waved him on. Kale said, Tell me where Magadan is. Mask smiled, and Kale saw the maliciousness in it. If I tell you, you will not be able to save him, and others, many others, will suffer and die. Shall I tell you anyway? If I do not, I think you will learn it. He smiled. In your own time. But Magadan will suffer in the meanwhile. Kale stared into Mask's face. You are a bastard. Yes, Mask said, and bowed. Much more than you know, but not how you think. Shall I tell you where Magadin is? Kale considered, tempted, but shook his head. Magadin would not want others to suffer in his stead. No, he said. You still must give me your word, Mask said. You have it, Kale said absently. Mask nodded. Then I will give you this without additional charge. Magadin's fate is tied to Sembius. Go back to Stormweather and help the Eskevrin as you planned. It will all lead back to Magadin eventually, though you may not like where it ends up. Kale said nothing. Done, then, Mask said, his tone satisfied. Kale was struck by the fact that he had just bargained with a god as if he were a street vendor. Mask was not at all what he had expected. He seemed more man than god. He almost said as much, but thought better of it. Mask grinned and tapped his temple. I know what you are thinking, Erebus, but this is just flesh, just one of the masks I wear when I move among mortals. Here, have a look behind. Mask held his arms out wide, stripped away the flesh and unveiled his divinity. Kale stared into eternity. He saw, but did not comprehend a consciousness that extended back to the beginning of all. He lost himself in it. He could not breathe. His legs weakened. He was falling, falling. Mask redonned his flesh. Now you know. Kale struggled to draw breath. He forced himself to keep his feet, though the alley was spinning. The awe had returned, but Kale refused, refused to abandon himself before his god. Mask smiled. So stubborn and so prideful. That is why I chose you, you know. That and a few other reasons. Mask's voice sounded far away. Kale feared he was losing consciousness. Mask said, In a few hours, this will start to fade. You will tell yourself it was just a dream, or a trick, or a vision, and maybe it was. But your promise stands, and when events start to speed ahead, remember that I did not create any of this. Others are responsible for it. I am just fiddling around the edges, responding to the inevitable. You do not understand now, but you will, a long time from now. Kale vomited onto the alleyway and heaved until he had emptied his stomach. When he looked up, Mask was gone. He spit to clear his mouth and reached back for the wall to steady himself. He took some time to let his head and stomach settle. Something glinted on the ground. The five stars he had tossed to Mask. Hadn't Mask taken them? He needed time to think. His head felt muddled. 
He had just spoken with a god, looked into the unveiled face of the divine. Hadn't he? He stared at the coins, unsure. He left them where they lay and walked out of the alley onto the street. Shadows cloaked him, and Kale found comfort in their embrace. He walked the street in silence. The Shadow Lord's words remained in his memory, as light as the fragments of a dream, as heavy as an anchor. Kale sensed the same fatalism in Mask's words that he had heard in Sephiroth's prophecies, but refused to surrender to it. He might not be able to change what was coming, but he would fight his damnedest anyway. That was who he was. The resolution centered him. Charcoal street lamps dotted the wide, paved avenue, their fuel burning low. The flames danced in the salt-tanged late-autumn breeze that blew off the bay. Brick warehouses and wood-framed stone rooms lined the street, one on top of the other, doors closed, windows dark. Livestock lowed or snorted softly in the stockyards. A few abandoned pull carts and wagons dotted the pavement. The dung sweepers were running late. Usually they had already cleaned the city streets, but Kale smelled the day's waste lingering in the open gutters. He spotted transients sleeping in some of the alleys, more than he had remembered. He knew that his return to Stormweather Towers would have to wait until dawn. He could not knock on the doors of a noble household three hours before daybreak. He decided to spend the time reacquainting himself with the city he once called home. Stepping through the shadows, covering blocks at a stride, he headed south and east, toward the center of the city. He crossed the old crumbling stone wall that symbolically separated transients from residents and entered the foreign district. Inns, eateries, taverns, and equipment shops predominated. So many they made a rickety mob. Despite the late hour, a few merchants, teamsters, and caravaneers sat at tables inside the taverns. Smoke and hushed conversation leaked from the unshuttered windows. Here and there, Kale noted the usual thugs, whores, and thieves, but the late hour made even those ragged folk look tired. He kept to the dark places, and they did not notice him. As had been true in the warehouse district, a surprisingly large number of people slept in doorways or under the trees that dotted Selgaunt's roads. Some were the usual drunks, but many were not. Kale had never seen the city so crowded. Everywhere he went he saw huddled forms in the streets, heard throaty coughs, smelled the stink of filthy streets. He found the bazaar quiet, but for the snores of peddlers sleeping in their carts and vendors sleeping in their stalls, his keen ears picked up a few murmured conversations that carried through the night, but he ignored them. He left the foreign district and moved south to the area near Temple Avenue that housed Selgaunt's artists, scholars, and wealthy merchants. The roads narrowed and the inns grew fewer, replaced by well-tended two-story residences and shops. Fewer people slept on the streets, but some were evident. A pair of city guardsmen, Selgaunt's scepters, dressed in dark green weather cloaks and wrapped in mail, walked the streets with a lantern. They shone its light into alleys as they passed, shooed along any loiterers they found. Kale sank into the shadows as the scepters drew near. Even in the light of the lantern, the two men passed him by without noticing, though he could have reached out and touched them. In Ordulin, the shorter one said. The other shrugged. Andrin Corinthal? Well, who can say? Damned nobles. Their conversation drifted away as they continued their patrol. Kale walked through a plaza and got a clear view to the southeast, where the gray stone walls of the old Hewlorn's hunting garden dominated the skyline. Glow balls and magical violet fires limbed the walls. Peculiar statuary dotted the crenellations. The old Hewlorn's artistic tastes... He favored depictions of strange hybrid creatures such as manticores, chimera, and others, had long been a subject of conversation in the city. Mad Andith Ilchamar, he'd been called, and Kale thought the title fitting. 
Kale realized that he did not know who currently occupied Office of Hewlorn. The last he knew, the members of the old chancel had been squabbling over the prize. The Hewlorn's garden looked down on the spires of Temple Avenue. Kale saw the top of the bell tower of the House of Song and the narrow pennon-festooned spire of the Palace of Holy Festivals. Kale had no desire to see Temple Avenue. He'd had enough of gods for the night. Besides, Temple Avenue reminded him of Sephiroth. He imagined the mad prophet lying awake in his bed in the house of higher achievement, counting the number of cracks in the ceiling, the number of breaths he took in an hour, applying one of his obscure calculations in deriving the fate of Faroon. A few blocks over, the top of a tower rose above the rooftops. Kale recognized it. Decades before, it had been the tower home of a minor wizard, Delacour San. Subsequently, an eccentric artist, Kale had forgotten his name, had bought it and converted it into an art gallery and curio shop that catered to the city's wealthy. Kale gauged its height at a full six stories, a suitable perch for a view of most of Selgaunt. Eyeing the top of the tower, he pulled the shadows about him and stepped through them. He appeared on the tower's top. The wind hit him immediately. His cloak billowed out behind him. He crouched low and steadied himself on the tiles of the pitched roof. He looked out on the city. Street lamps lit the main thoroughfares. Ronsel's Ride, Sarn Street, La Rockin Lane, The Wide Way. The broad avenues wound their way through the city like glowing snakes. The Elzimmer River ran along part of its northern wall before emptying into Selgaunt Bay. Kale could see over the wall to the lamp-lit flotilla of fishing boats, cargo barges, and ferry boats that dotted the far side of the river. The waterway flowed in clean from the northwest, collected much of the city's filth as it passed by the northern wall, and dumped the dredge into the bay. Kale knew many men who had done exactly the same thing. Entered Selgaunt clean, gotten dirty while inside, and ended up in the bay. He looked to the west, to the noble district and the grand mansions of Selgaunt's ruling noble families, the old chancel. Even from a distance he could make out the squat turrets of storm-weather towers, its gated gardens and meticulously maintained grounds. He had spent many good days within its walls, with Thamelin, with Tazi, with Shamur. He had fought a shadow demon in Stormweather's Great Hall, then turned to mask soon afterward. He felt a pang of nervousness about seeing them again. They had not seen him since he had been transformed. With effort, he could disguise his appearance as a shade, but even under the best circumstances, he knew he looked different. He worried over how they would respond. Feeling uncertain, he reached into his pocket and took out the mask. He unfolded it, held it before his face, and looked through the eye holes. Shadows emerged from his fingers and twined themselves around and through the mask. The wind pulled at his cloak, at his hair, at his soul. He realized for the first time that unless he died in violence, the shadow stuff that made up his body would allow him to outlive everyone and everything he cared about. He would outlive elves. He could find common ground only with gods. He put his fingers through the eye holes, tempted, before shoving it back into his pocket. In my own time, he said. He turned around and looked out on Selgaunt Bay, glittering in the starlight. Countless piers, like the fingers of giants, jutted into the bay. A forest of masts rose into the night sky. Kale had last been at sea with Magadan and Jack aboard Demon Binder. They had discovered the source and its guardian, the Kraken. The beast was still out there, Kale knew. And so, too, was the Wayrock, the island home of the temple mask had stolen from Sirik. Drasic Riven... Mask's second was out there. Kale wondered if Mask had appeared to Riven, too. The majestic gongs of the House of Song sounded the fifth bell. Dawn was only another bell or so away. Kale decided to watch the sun rise over Selgaunt Bay. 
Rather than shadow step back to the street, Kale dangled himself over the edge of the tower's roof, sought a hold for his toe, and started down. He used the shadows to make himself invisible. He did not want a passerby or scepter mistaking him for a burglar, but he did all the climbing himself, the old way. The exertion did him good, reminded him of days when he had still been human. By the time he reached the street, he was soaked in sweat. Human sweat. He unwrapped himself from the night and set out for the bay. He kept to the shadows as he moved, out of professional habit, but he did not shadow step or use the darkness to conceal him magically. He moved like an ordinary man, a human man, a skilled thief and assassin. By the time he reached the docks, he was smiling. Glow balls and burning braziers lit the wharfs. Caravels and carracks dominated the piers, but Kale spotted several freight barges, a longship, and even a birem, probably from one of the southern realms. Sailors, dockmen, and teamsters were already at work loading and unloading crates, barrels, and sacks. The docks never slept in Selgaunt, though the activity was less than Kale expected. The workers shouted, grunted, cursed, laughed, and sang as they labored. From time to time, groups of two, three, or four wobbly-kneed crewmen wandered back to their ships from a night in the dockside taverns. A virtual armada of small fishing boats floated along the length of the bay. Like the sailors on the larger ships, Selgaunt's fishermen were already at work preparing their ship to set out. They would spend the morning at sea and return at midday to sell their catch in the dock market. Kale had shopped that market many afternoons with Fat Brilla, the Escavrin kitchen mistress, at his side. Kale moved away from the larger ships and walked down a small pier. A single-masted fishing boat was tied to its end. A wiry fisherman as thin as a whip blade sat in the boat, tending a net. A young man that Kale took to be his son examined the tiller, the mast, the sail. The youth saw Kale approaching. His eyes went to the weave shear, and he nudged his father. The fisherman turned around and took in Kale's appearance. A knife lay on the bench near him. Kale tried to look harmless, not an easy task. Do you mind if I sit? I want to watch the sunrise. The son could not take his eyes from Kale's blade. The elder fisherman shrugged. As you wish, he said, and went back to work on his net. When the boy continued to gawk at Kale, the fisherman said to him, Mind that tiller, boy. Kale's presence might have made trained killers nervous, but not a Sembian boatman. Selgaunt's fisherman had a well-deserved reputation for being unflappable. Kale smiled, sat, and let his legs dangle over the pier. The fisherman cast off before the sun rose. The elder nodded a farewell at Kale. The younger waved, and they released the lines. The sun oared them away from the pier. Kale watched them grow smaller and smaller as the eastern sky turned from black to gray. The sky brightened with every passing moment until the sun peaked over the horizon. Backlit by the dawn, the boat and the two fishermen looked like nothing more than shadows. Kale knew the feeling. The slate sea turned blue under the rising sun. The light crept across the water and stung Kale's flesh. The rays caused Kale's shadow hand, the hand with which he had driven a punch dagger into the gut of the god of thieves, to dissipate into nothingness. He had lost the original hand to a slod's jaws while doing Mask's will. His transformation into a shade had regenerated it, but only in darkness or shadow. It seemed to him fitting that it was the instrument through which he had wounded Mask. The fight in the alley already seemed like a dream, the recollection hazy and distant. He wondered if the whole exchange had happened only in his head. He had no wounds to show for it, but of course he would not. His flesh effaced wounds as effectively as the sun effaced his hand, he decided it had been real. 
It had felt too good to be otherwise. He had stabbed his own god, and the bastard had deserved to be stabbed. How many priests would have liked to have done the same? He smiled, then grinned, then chuckled. The chuckle gave way to laughter, which transformed into a full-on belly laugh. A passing sailor walking by eyed him as if he were mad, but Kale did not care. He could not remember the last time he had laughed so hard. By the time he finished, he felt better than he had in months. He waited for the sun to rise fully over the sea, then rose and followed the light west toward storm weather, toward his past, toward his future. He was still smiling. Chapter 9 29 Marpanoth, The Year of Lightning Storms Mirabetta and Eliral sat across the table from Malkur Forin. The rising sun cast blood-red light through the leaded glass windows of the small meeting chamber in Mirabetta's manse, Ravenholm. The mercenary's right eye drooped from an old wound, and pale scars crisscrossed his muscular arms. He looked uncomfortable in his attire, the high-collared shirt and vest of a Sembian gentleman. Eliral imagined he would have preferred his mail and helm. He wore his graying hair in a helm cut. A broadsword, rather than a gentleman's rapier, hung from a battered scabbard at his belt. "'You sent for me, overmistress,' Malkur said. Mirabetta had employed Malkur's mercenary company, the Blades, often over the years— sometimes as escorts for the caravans of the Six Coffers Market Priacos, a trade consortium in which Mirabetta held controlling interest. Sometimes she hired him for darker deeds. Malkor had proven his proficiency at bloodletting on several occasions. Eliral thought that he and Mirabetta possessed similar temperaments, ambition unrestrained by moral foibles. Eliral also knew that her aunt and Malkor had occasional sexual relations. She thought it strange, since they did not appear to like each other much. She suspected the coupling was performed without sentiment. The mental image amused her, and she had to swallow a smile. "'How many of the blades are available at this moment?' Mirabetta asked. Malkor rubbed his cheek with the back of his hand and pondered. Three score are away on jobs. I have about a hundred men to hand, and all are eager. Most have been idle for nearly a month. Eliral and Mirabetta shared a satisfied look. One hundred men would be enough. Eliral knew the Blades to be a diverse force. Most of them were former Sembian and Cormirian soldiers with a taste for violence, but Malkur also commanded a few wizards, a cadre of warrior priests in service to Talos, the Thunderer, and a handful of highly skilled men who could act as scouts or assassins for the larger force. Mirabetta said, Malkur, I have some delicate work that needs to be done. You have the stomach for it. Know that it is for the good of Sembia. Malkur snorted derisively. Zambia can sink into the inner sea for all I care, and I mean no offense, Countess. I am interested only in the payment. Mirabetta smiled tightly. I understand. Then have eighty of your men ride south along the Rothavir's road. Weirdin Cost has communicated with Lady Merilith already. The Serilunian delegation to the Moot is on its way north. They will skirt Selgaunt. I want your men to attack them. Malkord did not flinch from the politically sensitive nature of the targets. Elyral thought he would have made a fine Sharon. All of them should die? Mirabetta shook her head. No, attack them from the south, in the guise of Serbians and Selgontans as they move toward Ordulan. Through my house wizards I will provide you with magical sendings telling you the exact day. Kill some and let the rest escape northward to me. I want them to bring me news of the attack. Malkor stroked his whiskers, thoughtful. You have the uniforms of Sayerb and Selgaunt? Eliral shook her head. Uniforms are too obvious. Mirabetta nodded. 
Your men should attack in some way to convince the Sayer Lunians that their attackers are in service to Sayerb and Selgaunt. I am sure you will think of something. After the attack, the men should return in small groups to Ordulan. It goes unsaid that none of your men should know of the nature of the attack until it happens. It also goes unsaid that none of them should be taken prisoner or left dead on the field, Elyral added. Malkor looked at Elyral. My men have never lost a battle, mistress. Some nobles out of Seirloon and their ceremonial guard are not going to change that. He looked at Mirabetta and leaned forward in his chair. The proffered payment over, mistress? Mirabetta leaned back in her chair. I will pay your men twice their normal fee. And you, Malkur, have my promise that when the time comes, you will be reinstated into Sembia's army and named my commander general. Malkur tried to disguise it, but Elyral caught a flash of interest in his eyes. He had once been a general in Sembia's helms. But Kendrick Selkirk had dismissed him from his post for excessive brutality in policing the roadways. Malkor, pretending to ponder the offer, shrugged. Promises are hard to spend over, mistress. Triple the fee, Mirabetta said, and Malkor smiled. One of his front teeth was missing. Done, over, mistress, he said. I will muster the men and wait word from you. Mirabetta said, you cannot lead them, Malkur. I have a special task for you and a hand-picked group of your men to perform. Malkur's eyebrows rose in a question. The man fairly sweated greed. Oh? My informants have located Kendrick Selkirk's sons. They are in Scardale, preparing to journey to Ordulan. Her words hung in the air, fat with implication. Malkur's eyes narrowed, and he said, I would enjoy nothing more than seeing the sons of Kendrick Selkirk at the end of my blade. Here is your opportunity, Elyral said. Malkor nodded and looked to Mirabetta. Some of my blades are skilled at what you require, and I have a diviner who may be able to locate them on the road. But Miklos Selkirk will be accompanied by his silver ravens. You will have a large battle to explain. Elyral knew that Miklos commanded his own mercenary company called the Silver Ravens. They were less swords for hire than adventurers for hire. One of the Silver Ravens had been operating as a spy for Mirabetta for the better part of a year. He had informed them of Miklos and Kaven's whereabouts. No, Mirabetta said. He is traveling in disguise with only his brother. Few know he is coming. He hopes to arrive in Ordulin in secret and perform his own investigation of his father's death before revealing himself to the moot. Malkor leaned forward in his chair and put his elbows on the table. Miklos is well known over, mistress. If word got out, word should not get out, Mirabetta said. That would put us both in grave danger. This is why we can trust one another, Malkor. Malkor nodded. The Selkirk job will cost more. For the men and for me. Mirabetta smiled. I would expect nothing less, dear Malkur. Quadruple the fees, then. A deal? Malkur looked pleased. He pushed back his chair and stood. A deal, over mistress. I can muster the men immediately. Mirabetta stood and extended her hand to Malkur. He took it, kissed it, lingered over it. It is always a pleasure to be in your company he said suggestively. Mirabetta smiled, clucked her tongue, and waved Elyral from the chamber. Leave us, Elyral. We have more business to discuss. Elyral had no doubt, as she left her aunt and the mercenary leader to their lovemaking. She touched her invisible holy symbol and thanked Shar. The plan to employ the blades to attack the Serlunian delegation had been largely hers. With one stroke, they would invent a rebellion, make Ser Loon a staunch ally, and eliminate Miklo Selkirk, a man who would have stood firmly against Mirabetta's appointment as war regent. Sembia soon would explode as surely as a gonsman's firebomb. Elyral chuckled when she considered how easily Sembia would descend into civil war. The tools had been in place for years. They had wanted only someone to wield them.
daylight showed Selgaunt for the rouge-covered whore she had become. Kale was appalled by how much the city had changed over the last year. Groups of destitute refugees crept out of the alleys and dark places of the city and sat listlessly on the walkways or streets until shopkeepers or the scepters moved them along. Many begged alms, and almost all of them looked hungry. Surreptitiously, to avoid being mobbed, Kale slipped a few silver ravens into the palms of the women and children he passed. Selgaunt had been a wealthy city for so long that seeing so many poor on its streets shocked him. Kale guessed they must have come south from the upcountry, fleeing the drought, the rage, the rain of fire, and the daemon fay. He thought of Vara's words, The world is too big to save everything. Looking into the dull eyes of the hungry, he thought she had been as much a prophet as Sephiroth. The streets lacked the usual vendors hawking day-old bread and browned fruit. The typical smells of breakfast cooking did not fill the morning air. Instead, stick figures wandered the streets, and the air smelled of dumped night soil and despair. Shopkeepers tried to hold up the pretense that Selgaunt was still Selgaunt, sweeping their stoops, setting out their wares, but even they looked underfed. Selgaunt reminded him more of Skullport than anything else. He made his way as best he could through the deprivation. He knew that he could pray to Mask for the power to cast spells that created food. He knew the priests of other faiths could do the same, and wondered why they had not. At least two score priests lived in the city who were capable of casting the spell. Perhaps they were seeing only to the needs of the wealthy, or perhaps they were casting the spells for the needy and the magic was not enough. It occurred to Kale that the famine was not simply a problem of feeding the refugee villagers. The villagers had been the ones to feed the city with their crops and livestock. The recent disasters had forced the farmers into the city, and not only did they need food, they were no longer producing food for Selgaunt. The problem would only get worse with time. It would take a small army of priests to feed a city the size of Selgaunt. A disturbance in the street ahead drew his eye. A wave of people jumped to their feet and pushed toward the middle of the avenue, all racing away from Kale. Many shouted, raised their fists. Kale fought his way through the press to see. A caravan of mule-drawn wagons from the outlying farms rumbled down the center of the city. Turnips, leeks, and sacks of grain lay piled in the wagon beds. Armed scepters surrounded the caravan and held the press of people at bay with their shields. Two scepters rode in the wagon, straddling the food as if it were gold. This food is going to the market, one of the scepters shouted. Make your purchases there. Purchase? A man near Kale shouted. We cannot afford to pay. A bag of turnips costs a five star. We're hungry here, guardsmen. Many in the crowd shouted agreement and pressed closer. The scepters looked alarmed, as did the teamsters driving the wagons. Even the mules looked skittish. The scepters pushed the press of bodies backward with their shields and brandished their blades. The people fell back and the carts moved onward toward the market, leaving crying children and despondent parents in their wake. The crowd started to disperse, grumbling in their despair. Kale put a hand on the shoulder of the thin man who had shouted about the price of turnips. Did you say a five-star for turnips? The man turned and regarded Kale with hollow eyes. I, The price of food is left all but the rich scraping for dog scraps, unless you are willing to wait all day in a priest's food line and swear to the worship of his god. Where have you been living? Kale held his tongue and let the man go. A year ago, a sack of turnips would have cost a copper, maybe two, but a five-star. Half of Selgaunt would be unable to eat at those prices. There would be riots. Kale immediately decided that the new Hugh Lorne was incompetent. He picked up his pace. Perhaps Tamlin could get the old chancel to act. Halfway to the noble district, on the sharply angled shop-lined Adzer's Way, Kale caught sight of a mounted trio of helms patrolling the streets. They sat atop war horses, and each wore the customary round steel cap and blue tabard emblazed with Sembia's coat of arms, 
the raven and silver. Kale stared at them for a moment in disbelief. He had never before seen soldiers of the Sembian army patrolling city streets. Sembia's merchants had always shown a strong distaste for soldiers. The nation's army was small and decentralized, and kept deliberately so. Sembia was positioned to conquer through the force of its trade, not through force of arms. The helm's duties had always consisted of patrolling the trade roads and villages outside of Sembia's major cities. Kale decided that the new Hugh Lorne was not merely incompetent, he was an idiot. He had put soldiers on the street, not city guardsmen accustomed to peacefully resolving disputes among the citizens, but soldiers accustomed to answering problems with steel. Shaking his head, Kale steered wide of the helms and hurried on. He had been isolated in his cottage for too long. He had not known things had deteriorated so far so fast. He needed to see Tamlin. He needed to understand what had happened. The sounds on the street were strangely subdued, tired, pensive. Kale moved through the street traffic, dodging thin horses, men pulling empty carts, pedestrians trying to pretend that life was normal. He followed a line of people that snaked almost an entire block until he reached a warehouse with its wagon doors thrown open. Inside, priests of Lathander and Timora spooned porridge out of huge pots into whatever container the hungry carried. He imagined Temple Avenue must look much the same. When he reached the noble district, he found the streets dotted with armed men. Patrols of helms and scepters walked the streets. The gatehouses of the old chancel manses were manned, not by two or three armed house guards, but by five or six. Kale endured the suspicious gazes of the soldiers and headed south past the towering walls of the old chancel manses, toward Stormweather Towers. A group of mail-armored helms stood in the street before his old home, blocking the walkway that led to the gatehouse. Shields hung from their backs, crossbows dangled from shoulder slings. All bore broadswords at their belts. Kale gauged their number at about a score. The pedestrian traffic, there was little, steered clear of the soldiers, but not Kale. He walked toward them, keeping his hand clear of Weaveshear as he approached. With conscious effort, he kept shadows from sneaking free of his flesh. The helms saw him coming, and three of them detached from the rest and stepped forward to halt his advance. The Hugh Lorn holds audiences only on the tenth of each month, said the oldest of the three, a thick-set warrior with a square jaw and hard eyes. Leave your name with the clerk in the palace, and you will be seen in due time. At first, Kale could not make sense of the words. The Hugh Lorne? Why is the Hugh Lorne in storm weather? The man's eyes never left Kale's face. The eyes of his two comrades never left Kale's blade hand. Lord Eskeverin resides... Kale took a step back, incredulous. Tamlin Eskeverin is the Hugh Lorne? The helms looked agitated at his tone. Calm down, good sir. Of course Tamlin Escavrin is the Hugh Lorne. Has been these four months past. You are new to the city? Kale could not believe that Tamlin had been stupid enough to fill the streets with soldiers. He shook his head. No, but I have been away for a time. Too long, it appeared. He said, I have business with the Hugh Lorne. He is expecting me. The helm took in Kale's appearance and weapons and looked doubtful. He has not sent word that we should expect a visitor. If you leave your name with the clerk at the palace, I am leaving my name with you, Kale said, a bit more sternly than he'd intended. Please inform the Hugh Lorne that Erevis Kale is... Kale trailed off. Behind the helms, he saw a familiar face emerge from Stormweather's gatehouse. That tone will get you a day in the jail, the helm said. Kale ignored the helm and shouted past him, Wren! Wren! It's Mr. Kale! Kale raised a hand in greeting. Here! Kale had saved Wren's life a year ago, when Slods had used the young man as a hostage and taken three of his fingers. Wren, in the attire of an Escavrin houseguard, heard Kale shout and looked at him. 
He saw Kale waving and furrowed his brow. Wren, it's me, Erebus Kale. Move along, said the helm, and he put his hand on Kale's chest. Mr. Kale? Wren called. Shadows emerged from Kale's flesh and wrapped the helm's hand. The man exclaimed, recoiled in alarm, and drew his blade. The other helms did the same. Kale's hand went instinctively to weave shear, but he stopped himself before drawing. What in the nine hells are you? the helm said, pointing his blade at Kale. Kale ignored him and spoke to Wren. Yes, Wren, it's me. Wren wore the blue and gold Discoverin livery over his armor and shield. He hurried down the pathway and scowled at the helms. Scabbard that steel, he said to the helms. Now! To Kale's surprise, the helms obeyed, reluctantly, and eyeing Kale all the while. The leader of the helm said, This man was serving the Hugh Lorne when you were still chasing brigands down till Darren's road, Vol, Wren finished. Vol's lips pursed, but he nodded tightly and held back whatever he might have wanted to say. Wren regarded Kale, clasped his forearm. Gods, it is you, Mr. Kale. I did not recognize you with the hair. He cocked his head. And there is something else different, too. Dark sorcery muttered Vol, eyeing his hand where Kale's shadows had touched him. Kale ignored the helm. Wren did not. The house guard held up his hand to show his missing fingers. You are insulting the man who ensured that I lost only these rather than my life. Vol looked away. The other two helms eyed the road. Kale thumped Wren on the shoulder. He had left Wren an uncertain young man. Now he seemed a senior leader in the house guard. He had grown a neatly trimmed beard, and he'd put on some weight. It is good to see you, Kale said. And you, Wren said with a smile. My apologies, good sir, Vol said to Kale. Accepted, Kale answered immediately. Side by side, Kale and Wren walked up the paved walkway that led to the gatehouse. Four other members of the house guard stood at the gate, watching them approach. They were armed and armored like Wren. Wren said, The Hulorn informed the house guard that if you appeared, you were to be allowed entry at any hour. He neglected to inform the helms. Kale did not recognize any of the house guards stationed at the gatehouse. Wren ordered one of them to inform Earwill, Kale's replacement as Uskeverin steward, that Mr. Kale had arrived, and the young guard sped off. The other house guards eyed Kale with open admiration. Wren made introductions and led Kale through the gate and onto the grounds. The estate appeared as Kale remembered it. Topiary, fountains, statuary, and well-tended gardens dotted the swath. The stables, servants' quarters, and other buildings crouched along the surrounding walls. I told the other guards what happened at the Twisted Elm, Wren explained. Everyone here knows of it. Kale nodded, mildly embarrassed. Wren looked at him sidelong. I wondered what happened to you after we parted. Were you in Selgaunt all that time? No, Kale said, and left it at that. Kale could see Wren wanted to speak his thoughts. Speak plainly, Wren. Wren hesitated, but finally asked, Mr. Kale, what happened to the sons of whores that maimed me? I want them dead, or hurt, or something. Kale understood the feeling. He pulled Wren to a stop and looked the young man in the face. All but one is dead, and I made that one suffer before he escaped. Well enough? Wren smiled grimly and nodded. Well enough. Kale said to him, My advice? Leave it in the past. Wren looked Kale in the face and nodded. Good advice. They started walking. Wren asked, What happened to your hand, Mr. Kale? Surely not the same bastards. The same, Kale said, holding up the stump of his wrist. But the one that took my hand was not the one that escaped. Wren spat on the ground. Good news that. Who were they, Mr. Kale? Ask me again another time, Wren. That is a long tale. Wren nodded and changed the subject. Things look a bit different, don't they? Storm weather? It looks nearly the same. No, the city, I mean. 
Ah, Kale answered, nodding. Very different. Wren gestured northward as they walked. Upcountry was struck hard by the rage and the rain of fire. I heard that wildfires and dragon attacks destroyed entire villages. Some villages were abandoned out of fear. In others, the soil just went bad. The harvest suffered. The villagers headed for the cities in droves, but the cities had nothing to offer them. So here we all sit. He shook his head. I hear Selgot is worse than most. I do not know what will happen.